Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. The Great Resignation has disrupted the status quo of the job market. It's no longer employer-driven, but employee-driven. So with this shift, how can business owners attract quality workers? Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcine Media. Here's what employers can do to sweeten the deal. First of all, commit to employee growth. Employees want to work for the companies that help them to deliver their best and at the same time offer awards when they do their best job as well. In response, some businesses are going so far as to provide flexibility to their employees to step up and take more responsibility. Second, implement a hybrid work model. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Employees were forced to work remotely, and now many of them still want to continue remote working some of the days of the week. In fact, several media reports highlight that more than half of the survey respondents emphasized that they would look for work elsewhere if it meant they were required to return to the office for five days of the week. Third, address the well being of your employees. Employee care and well-being is a game changer for employees. Some reports highlight that during the COVID-19 pandemic, productivity levels were usually up while employees' well-being levels were usually down. Active concern for employee well-being begins with the ability to see every team member as an individual having a life outside work. Next, offer greater flexibility. A hybrid working model includes not only the location, but also flexible working hours. Remote working has offered employees a flexible scheduling and changed the hearts and minds of people. Experts say that a lack of flexibility and not feeling appreciated was the top drivers in the Great Resignation. Plus, some reports highlight that employees are searching for more compensation, flexibility and happiness. And lastly, make sure to have excellent incentive systems. Successful employers for employee retention need to provide appropriate incentives and other benefits. For example, some employers convince their people not just to stay in their work, but also encourage them to become brand ambassadors and contribute to the company's mission. Such employees can be given some special company rewards. These rewards don't have to be extravagant, they do have to be something that would be beneficial to that worker. The bottom line is that employees need to understand that the great resignation is not only a short-term concern, but possibly a long-term prospect to build a competitive benefit by obtaining and retaining the quality employees. The most successful businesses in terms of employee retention align themselves with the employee's development and offer suitable incentive schemes. Now that you're up to speed, let us know in the comments if any of these work for you. And if you like this info, please give us a like, share, and a subscribe as well while you're at it. This has been Holly Shields for Calcine Media.
Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. And thanks for tuning in to Calcane Media. I'm Holly and you're watching Calcane Wellness. I don't have to tell you that times we're in at the moment are not the smoothest at all. Not only people's mental health, but their personal relationships have been put to the test. So if you've been struggling to maintain those relationships, don't worry because many of us are in the same boat. So let's check out some key ways to mend a damaged relationship. First of all, learn to take responsibility when you know it's your fault. Trust me, the biggest mistake is running away from accepting our slip ups. The wall of ego that we build restricts us from apologizing and taking responsibility for our faults. But this is wrong. So try taking responsibility when you know you have caused the trouble and see the difference it makes. Secondly, allow people space and don't be too clingy. Of course, we love spending time with people we love, but giving them personal space is as essential as spending time with them. So give them their space, have your own space and endorse individuality as much as you can. Next, trust with a capital T. To foster any relationship, trust is the main ingredient. Until you trust the people you love, you can never build healthy relationships with them. Trust is the spine of a relationship. Next, talk it out and don't hold grudges. You know how much good talking can do to a damaged relationship? Unfortunately, we hide our emotions and we build layers and hold grudges which is the worst thing for a relationship, believe it or not. So never hold a grudge, if you can that is. Just speak it out and see where your emotions lead you. And last but not least, spark it up a bit. One of the characteristics of a dying relationship concerns the dead spark. Just like life, relationships also get monotonous. So to rebuild the lost interest, you need to ignite some spark again and see how beautifully your relationship can flourish. All relationships have their ups and downs, but mending those failing relationships is important. It's not impossible, it's just a little difficult. So remember to be open about your feelings and be honest with yourself and others. That's all from my end, but let us know in the comment section which of these tips worked for you. See you in the next edition of Calkine Wellness. This has been Holly Shields for Calcine Media. October is said to be a massive month for Netflix with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video, I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Calkine. Netflix Originals In terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on.
fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season one focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season two is set to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high-tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Man of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty Amongst Others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway, starring Tom Hanks, will have you calling out, WILSON! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times, truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. Surprise. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying, Serenity now! If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV.
Hello everyone, I'm Rachel Jones and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Mark Duter. Mark is the CEO of Aerometrics. Now Aerometrics is a geospatial tech company focusing on providing data-driven insights for a range of business applications. Here at Kalkheim, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Hello, Mark, and welcome to Kalkheim. Good morning, Rachel. How are you? Now, first up, Mark, please could you just explain a little bit more about what Aerometrix does? Yeah, sure. So, as you said, Aerometrix is a geospatial technology company. We started life as a, a mapping and aerial imagery company, but we've diversified into a whole range of geospatial technologies now, including the creation of digital twins, uh, which are like um, a virtual world, or I guess a 3D world in, in which uh, people are finding a lot of applications these days. We also do laser mapping from aeroplanes and the traditional range of uh, aerial mapping activities. Excellent. Now, I believe that you've signed a U.S. 3D, sorry, a U.S. 3D sale in the emerging metaverse market. What can you tell me about this? Yeah, sure. So it's uh, we, we've embarked on a program of uh, mapping the U.S. cities in 3D, and uh, we produced the city of San Francisco, the downtown areas, uh, and the major tourist precincts that are adjacent. And we're finding that that's generated a whole lot of interest for some of the largest corporations in the US, uh, as well as people that are, are smaller players that are, are creating uh, metaverses, which are uh, digital twins, uh, sort of like a virtual world, uh, a geospatial framework uh, in which people can interact uh, uh, visually in their environment. Now, do you believe the metaverse sector is a new and fast emerging market for 3D model data? It certainly seems to be that way. We've seen very large investments by some of the largest corporations in the States, and that includes the likes of Google and Facebook and Microsoft and so forth in 3D technology. Uh, they've spent billions of dollars in acquiring hardware and, and software. Uh, and what's interesting to us is that what seems to be lacking at the moment is 3D data content at the human scale, and that's what we're providing. So we're talking to some of the biggest corporations over in the States, and we see uh, a, a vast uh, amount of interest going on at the moment in, in Metaverse, uh, including uh, terrestrial software developments that we sold the San Francisco model to, a much smaller player, but uh, yeah, certainly right up there in the leading edge with some of the, the bigger players. Now, your Manhattan capture is underway. Please, can you give us some insights on the recent developments in that project? Yeah, sure. So um, this is building on work that we did as far back as 2019. We already mapped the uh, lower Manhattan district at a, a very high degree of resolution and accuracy. Um, and that uh, that is actually one of the most difficult places in the world to map just because of the height of the skyscrapers. We're actually mapping that with helicopters. And uh, as you can imagine, it's, uh, it's quite a challenging thing, taking lots and lots of photographs, 20,000 photographs or so from a helicopter uh, to, to map, say, five square kilometres of terrain. So um, we're working our way through the rest of Manhattan now. So, uh, yeah, building on that, uh, on that already excellent product that we, we have generated. And what can you tell me about the progress of photogrammetry and 3D modelling over the past few years? How have you seen it change and expand? The advent of digital technology and vast amounts of computing power have just released a whole lot of mapping technologies from the restraints of scale. It's, it's amazing now. We can go from a view of the world from outer space, you know, the globe, and zoom right down to a city, right down to a street, right down to a restaurant window, look inside the window and read a menu. It, it is phenomenal. Um, mapping up till now has always been very constrained by the idea of being able to portray a certain amount of information on a page or a printed map or whatever. Uh, but now it seems that there is no limit. We can just, uh, we can do amazing things with 3D digital technology and create an environment that is virtually the same as being there. Um, it's, we, um, 
we, you know, our San Francisco model, uh, you know, I've been to San Francisco several times and just walking around that digital model uh, generates floods of memories uh, of places that I've, I've been and things that I've seen, they're residing in the back of my mind, in the back of my brain, but it, it, uh, it's amazing how that actually being in that digital environment stimulates uh, that flow of consciousness again. And you have some major engineering firms working with Aerometrics. What are your plans for the future? There are two, uh, oh, many, I suppose, applications. I guess communication, visualization, but also measurement. And our engineering clients are finding that the uh, 3D models that we produce are providing them with exactly what they need to relate all their other data sets to. So it becomes the geospatial framework that they use to validate all their other data, make sure it's in the right place, prevent uh, accidents or, or um, you know, mistakes happening during the construction process. So uh, yeah, we see a, a very wide application for that. Already in Australia, we've seen a, a very enthusiastic uptake by the engineers here, early adopters of the technology. And uh, we expect to see that replicated worldwide. Well, it's been fabulous chatting with you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Rachel. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to meet you too. Thanks for the chat. It's fascinating. Now, with that, I will sign off for today, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Calcane TV. I'm Sage. And today's guests are the co-founders and co-CEOs of Fitify, Stephen Mansfield and Sem Morale. And Fitify is a community for active people to meet others who are also valuing their health and fitness. And they are changing the way active people view and use dating apps. And herein, healthy relationships can be found based on common interests, shared gold, goals and similar values, and hopefully some gold as well. And as you know, we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And bringing you live today on the show, we have Mr. Stephen Mansfield and Mr. Sem Morale, co-CEOs and co-founders of Fitify. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Sage. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Lovely. Well, with your experience in developing apps in this uh, digi digital world that we live in, we're keen to share your, um, your insights today. It is so significant to build relationships on the shared values of health and well-being and fitness. So what do you think is one of the most important things that people shouldn't ignore while using dating apps and websites? Um, we think it's about common values. Uh, one of the things that got us started in Fitify was really targeting the core values and the shared interests of people. So when you look at the, the market and the uh, dating apps that are currently out there, uh, they're quite superficial in nature and one of the key uh, pieces of feedback we had when we first started Fitify at the gym was uh, why doesn't a platform exist where you have shared values and interests with someone and for us that was fitness being involved in the fitness scene but also Steve and I having developed um, technology companies before so the premise of Fitify is really about um, the fitness and dietary interests of someone and matching with someone who is not just physically fit but mentally fit as well and that's, that's why we started Fitify. Um, it adds that different layer of connection to people. And we know based on longer term studies that having that common interest and shared value system with two people, the relationships tend to last longer and they're healthier in the long run as well.
for sure. Yeah, that's that's such a great mission that you're on. I mean, it's helping people to share their healthy habits and have a wholesome basis or foundation to their to their you know encounter or meeting and hopefully relationship. So this is fantastic. Um, COVID nineteen has made it difficult for people to meet like the old times and amid such challenging circumstances. How has the online dating apps market fostered in these times? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so. We launched properly, probably the start of this year um, during COVID and, and, and it's been pretty tough times. So I suppose with everyone being in lockdown for periods of time, um, it has seen a big uptake with people using their mobile devices more frequently and people have been going on to, to fit a fire a lot more. Our user engagement has been up five times than it was um, late last year. The, what we have seen as well is because the government's allowing people to go out and, and actively exercise for one hour of the day, depending on what state you're in, it's, it's Fitify is working really well where we have the option where people can actually filter down someone's profile if they want to meet someone who goes on running or hiking adventures or cyclists or things like that. And we're seeing a lot more activity around those types of specific filters than more, say, going and meeting someone who trains at the gym and does bodybuilding because unfortunately at the moment some parts of Australia gyms are closed but to, to finalize um, your question on the COVID we have seen a huge uptake um, in user growth because of that I believe. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and there's undoubtedly been a tech boom and I guess you saw the opening for uh, in the market for a niche app while everybody was on their apps during the lockdowns and looks are indeed superficial while fitness and other preferences matter the most in life and also finding an indoor climbing date can be quite difficult however on Fitify you might find someone who matches and would love to join you on that however some people might find themselves out of their comfort zone on a first date indoor climbing if they've never done it much before and most dating apps are based on photos alone so what suggestions would you like to give for people to escape the superficial layer of online dating. Yeah, at Pitify, you know, that is something that we're quite aware of, um, to be honest with you, the superficial nature of the current uh, applications that are out there. And one of the key pieces of user feedback that we had was around the security aspects. So as an example for you, a significant majority of male and female users, their biggest worries uh, on the security side and feeling safe when they actually go to meet someone for the first time. So that's something we take quite seriously. Um, but beyond that, I think it's about letting people get to know each other even before they've met. So a lot of the profiles and the way they're positioned at the moment, you get to know someone before you actually meet them. And the way we go about that is by the fitness and dietary interests that we've talked about. So you can understand whether you're going to align with someone's fitness, uh, fitness and dietary interests before you meet them. But also there's a couple of clever technologies in there. Uh, we have a plug-in to fitness applications. So for example, if you're using uh, Strava, for example, you can see how active someone is, um, how long they've exercised on a particular day. Um, but we even go further than that. You know, there's a bunch of fitness-oriented questions that people can answer on their profile where you get to know them before you even start speaking to them. So that's super important to us. You know, these are features that are generally available on the mainstream applications that are out there and it really harnesses that emotional connection before you even meet someone um, and I suppose one of the things that we've seen is people are uh, legitimately meeting other people romantically on Fitify and we even had a couple of uh, recent engagement stories um, and a lot of the people who use uh, the reason why use Fitify and the reason why they end up leaving Fitify is because they have met someone romantically uh, and as a worst case scenario, they've met someone uh, that they can train with, they end up becoming friends. Thank you so much for sharing that. And security is one of the trending factors, especially when it comes to online dating. So it's fantastic to hear that uh, your side is doing much about that. And uh, being fit is essential for a healthy life and having a good partner is crucial for a happy life. So how do you ensure that the best of two are combined to get the best results? Yeah, um, so when it comes to the matchmaking on Fitify, it's really based around the interests of someone. So you can filter down to what type of person you're looking for. Um, as an example for you, we've got a significant uh, use base where they are vegans, right? So what we're finding over time is uh, the people who have similar fitness and dietary interests tend to ma match with each other. 
and a key start there is 95% of uh, vegan users on Fitify are also looking for vegan users. Um, or it might be a case where there's a specific uh, sports interest that someone has, they tend to match with those as well. And really it's about that shared value that we mentioned at the start of the call. Um, it's really about finding someone who aligns with your values and they tend to be healthier and also longer lasting. And apparently after lockdown, people, a lot of people out there are worried about their social lives and if they will go back to how it was before the lockdowns and who their friends are and if they've fallen out with people because of the long time they've not seen them. So it's great to hear that there's these options available like Fitify where people can maybe expand their networks a little through their love for fitness and, and well-being. So it's a great, um, a great exercise that you're on there with Fitify's app and I hope it goes well for you. We have to start winding up the discussion now. Could you please tell us a little bit more about your upcoming innovation plans for Fitify? Yeah, definitely. So. Yeah, um, thanks again for having us today. But to finish off, so Fitify, we just expanded into the UK, Sage, and you're going to start seeing a lot more activations happening in Australia and the UK and then the US um, at the start of 2022. One thing that we're really going to emphasise on is creating community activations and really honing in on the fitness community and bringing people together where either they can meet and, and date and or even just become friends, but we create that safe environment where they can exercise, train, catch up, have a coffee with, and then see if it does lead to something um, like that. But we're going to start seeing a lot more of that taking place when COVID does open up and we have a little bit more freedom. Oh, sounds great. I'm excited for you. We'll be watching this space and looking forward to hearing more from Fitify. Thanks for making time for the show today, Stephen and Sam. We really do appreciate your insights and for those who have just joined us, we just had a very informative discussion with the co-founders and co-CEOs of Fitify, Stephen Mansfield and Sam Morrell and you can view the full recorded interview on YouTube at Calcine Media so please check it out. And also keep watching Calcine TV for more expert talks plus all the latest buzz in crypto, the economy and markets and as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calcine. Morning pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified of Calkine's latest videos. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Thanks for joining us on our trending topic. Asia Pacific has its rep in 100 billion US dollar rich club. India's Mukesh Ambani. India's richest man, Mukesh Ambani has made it to the elite 100 billion US dollar rich list and is the first person from the Asia Pacific region to do so. Mr Ambani is valued at a whopping 101 billion US dollars as his net worth has surged 31% or 23.8 billion US dollars in the current year. The surge in Mr Ambani's wealth is almost in line with the share price spike in India's most valuable company promoted by him, Reliance Industries Limited. And shares of RIL have surged 34.3% in 2021 year to date, primarily driven by the company's foray into newer segments like 5G and green energy.
And along with his family and the companies controlled by him, Mr. Ambani holds more than half of the stake in the company, 50.59%. And Mr. Ambani also happens to be the first person to enter the elite club outside of the US and France. Before Ambani, there are already 10 members in this elite club, including Elon Musk of Tesla, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, Bill Gates of Microsoft, and Warren Buffett of Berkshire Hathaway, among others. Prior to Ambani, only one non-American had made it to the list, Bernard Arnault of France. Interestingly, Mr. Arnaud happens to be one of the only two non-technology company founders who made it into the US $100 billion elite club, the other being Mr. Buffett. Of all 10 entrants into the club before Mr. Ambani, eight had interests in the technology sector, pointing at the factor that the tech sector has been the biggest wealth creator in the 21st century. And interestingly as well, Mr. Ambani's wealth also saw a boom only after RIL decided to venture into India's growing digital market through its subsidiary Geo Platforms Limited. Historically, RIL was primarily an oil to chemical company and before Mr. Ambani ventured into telecom in the second half of the last decade. And as on date, RIL is valued at Indian rupees $16.93 trillion or in US terms $225 billion, making it India's most valuable company. And if you do like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. You'll be notified of Kalkine's latest videos. But for more information and regular updates, do head to the website. It's kalkinemedia.com. Stay here for Kalkine Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Teas and fashion, a match made in heaven. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones. Thanks for tuning in to Calkine Media. Non-fungible tokens or NFTs have grown exponentially over the last few months. From sports to art to games, NFTs all have managed to enter major markets. Today, many stars, celebrities, artists and clubs are finding it as a unique platform to connect with fans and at the same time earn profits. With Bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies being fungible in nature, NFTs with its growing audience has captured the market in a meaningful manner. In a short duration, the NFT space has grown substantially and enjoys an enormous market cap. With new NFTs being launched, another area which has gained prominence in the NFT space is the fashion industry. In fact, the fashion world had its first graze with NFTs with Nike. They acquired a patent which allowed blockchain technology to attach cryptographically secured digital assets in the form of NFTs back in 2019. The fashion industry for a long time had been struggling following the e-commerce boom. Many retail giants have struggled with the pace at which the e-commerce operated. But 2019 was a game-changing year with NFTs making their debut in the fashion space. In May 2019, top luxury brand Louis Vuitton became the very first company to leverage blockchain-based tokens as a means of ensuring an item's authenticity. In 2021, Gucci had introduced its one-of-a-kind sneakers as an NFT. Various other luxury watch brands are promoting NFT auctions within the available platforms to promote on social media. While many luxury brands are still in the process of launching their own NFTs, smaller brands have been more successful. 
It won't be wrong to say that NFTs and the luxury fashion industry are made for each other. So today, with increased digitization, fashion being sold via NFT is fashion as art. Especially in the COVID-19 period, the growth of personalized digital avatars became an instant hit in the virtual world. RTFKT is a leading brand and one of the creators of virtual sneakers. They managed a whopping $3.1 million in just seven minutes. Each NFT-based virtual sneaker drop came with a physical pair of shoes, blurring the line between digital and physical fashion. Sports personality Naomi Osaka also launched her own set of collectibles, which included apparel and sneakers. Fashion is of a different league when it comes to the NFT space. With everyone drawn towards the major brands, it represents a great opportunity for fashion brands to hop onto the NFT Superjet. Rare fashion NFTs will always be on collector's radar, and luxury brands could also drive demand for the NFT space. The NFT platform is a unique way to connect with fans in a more meaningful manner, and it also provides a unique marketplace to maximize a brand's presence. That's all for now. I hope you found this video informative. Keep watching Kalkine Media for all such crypto market insights and latest trends. This is Rachel signing off for now. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it? how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. So let's take a look at some house builder stocks that could be a good buy for income investors. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and you're watching Kalkai Media. Today we're looking at three house builder stocks listed on the London Stock Exchange. House prices in the UK reached a record high in September 2021 due to the end of stamp duty holiday scheme. According to data by the Halifax House Price Index, housing prices in the country rose by 1.7% in the last month, driving up the year-on-year -year inflation in house prices to 7.4%. The average house price in the UK now stands at over over £267,000. The end of the stamp duty holiday in England and the rising inclination amongst home buyers to close deals are key factors contributing to rising sales. The pandemic has played a significant role in the house price surge. Currently, people prefer houses with larger outdoor areas and closer to green spaces compared to closed and compact apartments and flats. On that note, here are three LSE listed house building stocks that can be considered a good buy amidst the rising prices. First one on the list is Quest Nicholson Holdings, a FTSE 250 listed house building company based in Britain. Recently, Quest Nicholson launched the second phase of its Daventry development. Their revenues witnessed a rise in the second half of 2020 and home completions reached 1,017 up from last year's figure of 775. Cress Nicholson's board also declared an interim dividend of 4.1 pence per share. In the last year, the shares of Cress Nicholson Holdings gave the returns of around 64% to its shareholders. 
Second stock to look at is Redrow, a house building company that operates via a network of 14 operational divisions in the UK. Its total number of legal completions rose by 39% year on year. Red Row recorded revenue representing an increase of 45% year on year in 2020. Red Row also announced a final dividend of 18.5 pence per share for the year ending payable on the 17th of November this year. In the last year, shares of Red Row returned around 60% to shareholders. The last stock on our list is Galliford Tri Holdings, a leading construction and house building group in Britain. Recently, the company inked a £1.6 billion deal for the LHC Public Buildings Construction and Infrastructure Framework. Galliford Tri Holdings recorded a pre-tax profit for the year ending 30th of June compared to a pre-tax loss in the previous year. Galliford Tri also announced a final dividend payout of 3.5 pence per share for the year ending on the 30th of June. In the last year, the shares of Galliford Tri Holdings returned around 106% to shareholders. That's all for now. I hope you found this video informative. Keep watching Kalkine Media for all such stock tips. I'm Rachel, signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. The nominees for the Australian of the Year Awards have been announced. The names have been shortlisted from a diversity of backgrounds, including a war veteran, a vaccination researcher, and an Olympian. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcine Media. These awards provide recognition to some brilliant Aussies who've achieved an outstanding feat in their respective fields. For the year 2022, one of the nominees for this prestigious award is Philip DePinto, who is the co-founder of Living Without Limits Foundations. He's dedicated his life to the welfare of children with disabilities. His non-for-profit organization has raised more than a million dollars so far, which have also been dispersed to other child welfare organizations. Another nominee is Professor Helen Marshall, one of the country's most recognized vaccination researchers. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she offered advice to the South Australian Minister for Health and the Chief Public Health Officer. Surgeon, author and entrepreneur Dr. Samantha Piley and gender equality advocate Natasha Stott Disposure AO are two other names among the list of nominees. The awards have other popular categories as well. For Senior Australian of the Year, Peter Clark, a passionate wildlife conservationist and director of Montaro Safari Park are in the frame. Others include war veteran Bill Denny, foster carer Dawn Jennings, and educator counselor Mark Le Monsieur. In the Young Australian category, Olympic swimming champion Kyle Chalmers is one of the nominees. Chalmers won a gold medal in the man's 100 meters freestyle at the Rio Olympics back in 2016. Another nominee, Dr. Tony Lin, provides oral healthcare services to patients with disabilities and psychiatric illnesses. Other names on the list include Bianca Nissen, the founder of independent label Renegade Records, 
and Zoe Simpson, the founder of Mount Gambia, Hey Run, who helped farmers after a devastating bushfire in 2019. Below what you think of these nominees. And check out some of our other videos while you're at it, sub to our channel as well. This has been Holly Shields for Calcone Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. As long as there's money, there'll be people trying to steal it. The methods used to steal money vary greatly, but one common way in the cryptocurrency space is by way of a pump and dump scheme, otherwise known as a rug pull. And in this video, I'll take you through what a pump and dump scheme is within the crypto space and the things that you'll need to look out for to spot one. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Calkine. Pump and dumps are where a crypto's price is artificially boosted by an organized group who purchases a large volume of a particular coin and in turn pushes up the price. Once the coin's price reaches a previously agreed upon target, a signal is given for the manipulators to sell, thus selling it at a much higher price and raking in a sizable profit. These schemes usually involve influencers who are paid to tell people to buy a particular digital coin in order to raise its value. Then. Once the value goes up, the scammers and influencers sell their coins and pocket the profits, while everyone else sees their investments lose value. Now, The scariest part is that these schemes are carried out in broad daylight. These particular pump and dump schemes differ to other types of scams in that there's little to no trickery involved. Instead, retail traders willingly participate believing that they'll be able to beat the zero-sum game. In the stock market, Pump and dumps are illegal. One of the most well known examples of the pump and dump scam was conducted by Jordan Belford, also known as the Wolf of Wall Street, and his company on Wall Street throughout the 90s. While the Australian regulatory body, the Securities and Exchange Commission, or the SEC, has outlawed such activities in the stock market, it doesn't yet have similar rules for cryptocurrency. Part of the issue is that new cryptos pop up by the dozen weekly given that they can be fairly easy to create, provided that you know the necessary coding required. However, developers of pump and dump digital currencies are unlikely to build a whole blockchain. Therefore, be wary of any coin which doesn't have an accompanying blockchain like Bitcoin or Ethereum. So how can investors avoid pump and dump schemes? Fear of missing out or FOMO among traders can create anxiety, which often leads to a gambler's mentality. FOMO can be combated by conducting thorough research. If you see a coin doing the rounds on social media that's promising high returns, look into that coin's white paper and its developers. If the developers are anonymous, for example, that's typically a pretty big red flag. If the white paper is devoid of crucial details or absent altogether, then that's another major issue. Looking at the historical performance of a particular coin can also be extremely useful. Though of course, the issue with pump and dump schemes is that early data is easily corruptible. So here's the bottom line. The crypto space is moving at an alarming speed. This means that it will take time for regulators to catch up with this ever-growing technology. As such, investors must stay vigilant and be constantly learning and researching because sadly with human nature, if there's money to be made, people will look for avenues to easily procure it, even if that is at the expense of others. So above all, do your research, be smart and be vigilant and don't become a victim to a pump and dump scheme. 
If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel, leave us a comment about what other crypto information you'd like us to look at, and of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest from Calkine. For more info, just head across to the website, calkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV. Good morning and welcome to the Morning Outlook. I'm James Preston reporting live from Calkine TV's Sydney studios. And in this show, I'll provide you all the details you'll need for a successful day of trading, including the overnight US market performance, global markets, and all the information you'll need to know for ASX listed shares. Australian shares are expected to end the week on an upbeat note, likely helped by gains in domestic miners and energy stocks on the back of soaring commodity and oil prices. The domestic shares are also expected to track Wall Street, which ended higher overnight. The ASX 200 is expected to open the day 0.6% higher after climbing 0.5% to 7,311.7 points in the previous session. Harvey Norman, Harvey Norman Holdings, should I say, will trade X dividend for its fully franked 15 cents per share final dividend today. Eagers Automotive Limited and Hub24 are scheduled to pay their latest dividends later today as well. At close yesterday, the Australian share market recorded the first gain of the week, in the process almost recouping the losses from the three previous sessions. However, the market ran out of steam in the final 60 minutes of trading. The ASX 200 index closed 0.54% higher. Eight out of the 11 sectors recorded gains yesterday, with information technology shares standing out. The energy sector lost ground today, giving up some recent gains, as energy prices eased overnight and traders booked profits. Time now for a very short break. On the other side of these messages, we take a look at the top stories that have the potential to affect markets and also the latest market information from the US and across the globe. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Thanks for tuning in to Calkine TV. I'm James Preston and this is The Morning Outlook, the show that gives you all the latest market commentary and news that matters to prepare you for the day's trades. Now before we jump into the US, let's take a look at some of the day's top stories with the potential to impact markets. Regional travel in New South Wales has been pushed back to November 1st, despite surging vaccination rates that would see the state hit the 80% double jabbed mark well ahead of initial estimates. New South Wales Deputy Premier Paul Toole announced that the travel into regions for Greater Sydney residents will now not restart for another two weeks because of low vaccination rates in certain regional areas. The decision has been widely criticised on social media, with many accusing the government of continuously shifting the goalposts. And in a sign of the continued struggles of the aviation industry, Qantas has just confirmed binding agreements with a consortium led by Logos Property Group for the sale of a large parcel of land in Mascot near Sydney Airport. Most of the $802 million deal is expected to be settled before Christmas, with the funds to be used to, quote, reduce debt and accelerate the airline's recovery. 
The sale follows a review of the airline's property footprint initiated earlier this year, which indicated there was no long-term need for Qantas to develop the property. Some sections will continue to be leased, though, to assist in the transition of existing operations in and around the land parcel. Let's now turn our attention overseas, beginning with the United States. In US economic data, initial jobless claims fell by 36,000 last week. Producer prices rose by 0.5% in September, the smallest increase this year. Prices are up 8.6% on a year ago. Call prices lifted by 0.2% and call prices overall are 6.8% higher compared to 12 months ago. European share markets closed higher on Thursday. The pan-European stock 600 index rose by 1.2% with mining shares up by 3.3%. British e-commerce company THG was the strongest performer, with its shares rebounding 10.6% after a disappointing capital markets day earlier in the week. The German DAX index also lifted by 1.4% and the UK 5.9%. In London trade, shares in Rio Tinto and BHP were both up by 3.7%. U.S. share markets advanced on Thursday on upbeat third quarter corporate earnings results. Shares of Walgreens Boost Alliance rallied 7.4% after the drugstore chain beat earnings expectations. United Health Group shares also jumped by 4.2% after the insurer raised its full year profit forecast. Shares of Bank of America, Morgan Stanley and Citigroup all climbed after beating earnings expectations. However, Wells Fargo shares declined by 1.6%. The Dow Jones index fell by 1.6%. The S&P 500 index gained 1.7%, its biggest lift since March 5. And the Nasdaq added 1.7%, the most since May 20. U.S. Treasury yields fell on Thursday after data on the U.S. labor market and producer inflation eased worries that the U.S. Federal Reserve may need to take action earlier than expected to combat rising prices. U.S. 10-year yields fell by 3 points to near 1.52% and U.S. 2-year yields were down by 0.36%. Major currencies were mixed against the U.S. dollar in European and U.S. trade. The euro was near 1.159 U.S. dollars, while the Aussie dollar was at 74.15 cents and the Japanese yen eased to near 113.7 at the U.S. close. Global oil prices rose by 1% on Thursday after Saudi Arabia dismissed calls for additional OPEC Plus supplies. The IEA increased its global oil demand growth forecast in 2022 by 210,000 barrels per day. But US crude stocks rose by a surprising 6 million barrels in the past week. The Brent crude price lifted by 1% to 84 US dollars a barrel and the US NYMEX crude price added 1.1% to trade at 81 US dollars and 31 cents a barrel. Base metal prices climbed on Thursday, led by zinc's surge to its highest price since 2007 as European smelters cut the output. Copper traded over the US $10,000 a ton mark and aluminium touched the highest price seen since 2008. The gold futures price rose by 0.2% and spot gold was trading near 1,796 US dollars an ounce at the US close. Iron ore also lifted 1.9% to hit 126 US dollars a tonne. Well, that's all for the Morning Outlook report here on Kalkine TV. Have a great day trading and stay tuned for more live market updates and economic news throughout the day. I'm James Preston, signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV.
Good morning and thanks for joining us. Holly Shields here for Calkine TV, welcoming you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. The show where we bring to you industry leaders, successful business owners and market experts all under one roof to help you discover the latest business insights. Today we're exploring one company that's challenging the status quo of the rental property market. Rent Better, a revolutionary platform that helps property owners find and manage tenants without using an agent. Here to discuss it is Mr. Jeremy Goldschmidt, founder and CEO. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. It's great to have you on. Now, we know that when it comes to leasing a property, a lot of people would like to cut out the middle now, middleman. Sorry. What are the benefits to that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, when we look at it, uh, a lot of our customers are really looking to achieve two things. Uh, the first and primary thing is often looking for a way to save money and therefore drive up the return on their investment property. But secondly, and I think this is sort of probably a deep-seated uh, feeling that a lot of us want, especially these days, is to have more control over their investment and what actually happens. So uh, when when people who are self-managing their property use the Rent Better platform, they'll uh, basically be able to save money and take control of their property, which, which seems to hit the mark for a lot of people. Right, and um, that's obviously I can imagine money savings is a big factor there. How much money would you say that they do save? Well, if you look at the sort of averages, and it's always dangerous to play in averages, but if you look at an average rental of around $500 a week, and again, depending on where you are in the country, they'll sort of, uh, you know, average management fees might be somewhere between 5 and 10%. Uh, it sort of comes out to a saving of about $2,000 a year per property. Uh, obviously, there are people out there who have multiple properties. So when you add that up over the lifetime of an investment, the actual number ends up being a pretty big one. So um, I guess from from our perspective, a platform where the technology does a lot of the heavy lifting and can save you money, it's a pretty good proposition for, for, for self-managing landlords. Right, and there's uh, certainly a substantial figure there, especially because a lot of these properties are owned in the long term, as you mentioned, over a lifetime that can really add up. So in your expert opinion, how can owners deal with their properties like a pro without the involvement of brokers? Well, I think when it comes to property management, um, there's a lot of process driven activity. And that's really what we as a platform have tried to automate and bring to a sort of sensible place where as a platform or a technology driven platform, landlords have access to the right tools and services at a much lower price because the technology is doing a lot of the hard work. So if you're looking to find a tenant, you can actually create your ads, publish it to the major property sites, handle inquiries, applications, there's tenant checks through the major credit bureau, you can um, create lease agreements, condition reports, there's electronic signatures. So it really puts you in a position where you're able to find a tenant and drive through a lot of the processes that would be required in a fairly automated and standardised way. When it comes to actually managing the property, that's really where um, the hard work begins, so to speak, because you're obviously going to try and collect your rent. You want to track it. You want to be able to receipt it. If something goes wrong or payments are missed, you want a very, very clean and simple way to communicate that to your prospective or to your actual tenant. Um, so it's really important to have all of those items documented. When it comes to, again, expenses, maintenance, um, being able to report for, for tax time at end of the year. Again, you want all of that tracked and in the one place so that you can always go back and reference where things are at, what's going on, what you need to know. Um, so we find that our customers are thrilled by the ability to access everything in one place and not have it all over the place. I can imagine so. It sounds like they can really overlook the whole process itself. Yeah, absolutely. It gives you a lot of control over what's going on and because there's notifications and alerts built into the system, uh, everything's quite transparent. And I think um, maybe uh, for a range of reasons, a lot of landlords may have felt that they don't always know what's going on, they don't always have control, they don't always have trust over the people who are perhaps overseeing their property. Um, and so this really gives you the ability to have everything at your fingertips, whether it's through you know a computer or through your uh, mobile device. Uh, you can always see what's going on and you'll always know where you stand. Definitely, and that is super handy as well. Now with that said though, how can property owners make the switch from using agents to the self-managing of their property? 
Well, that's, that's an even better question. We've got a couple of tools that will help people go through that process. If you were to go to the website, which is rentbetter.com.au, you'll see we've actually got a kit that goes through as a guide, uh, the, the, I guess the sort of process for notifying and for terminating current agreements, all the things that one would need in order to um, actually sort of cleanly transition over. Um, and then at the same time, um, we think, you know, there's obviously uh, a number of artifacts that one uh, needs to have in place when they do make that transition. So there's certainly guidance around that. Uh, and we actually run a whole series of webinars and workshops that are really educationally driven so that people can be more well informed at the time that they do that. Uh, I think, you know, we always get this comment from our customers that it's certainly not rocket science and it's something that they can take on. Like anything, the first time you do something, sometimes it can feel a little bit awkward, but uh, we're fairly confident that it doesn't take people long to get the hang of it and they can really jump into it and sort of take control and start saving money. And that's really good to hear and in particular the fact that you invest heavily in the education, obviously, of uh, your clients as well. And as well, ensuring a smooth transition is obviously a very crucial and um, now dealing with tax, this is also a tricky task for landlords, as we know. So do you have any tax tips for them? Yeah, look, absolutely. I mean, I think there's, there's always this concept of, um, I guess, uh, trying to keep it clean and simple for your accountant. If you, if you speak to any accountant, they'll always tell you that when you um, see, see your client at the end of the year, they show up with a shoebox full of receipts. Um, and so we think for a lot of people what happens is they'll either drop things because throughout the year they haven't sort of kept records of it or they haven't always um, kept account of it. So having it through a platform and a system that you can neatly bring it to your accountant at the end of the year, number one, gives you confidence that you've got everything. And number two, it actually gives you the ability to say, well, what else should I have included that I haven't? So uh, number one is keeping all the records in one place so that it's easy to access. Uh, number two, look, I think there's there's obviously a range of different ways of looking at it. We, we find a lot of people may not be aware of tax depreciation schedules, particularly if you've got an investment property. So so it's worth just sort of doing a quick search on, on how to obtain one of those and making sure that it's incorporated into your um, uh, end of year tax with your accountant. All right, those are some really good points as well there. Now, just before we wrap up, do you see, sorry, what do you see on the horizon for the Australian property market this year? Yeah, look, it's tricky. I think everybody wishes that they had a little bit of a crystal ball and you can see sort of the trends uh, with, with interest rates remaining fairly low. Uh, obviously, prices have gone up quite high and it's a question as to whether that's, um, you know, relative, re uh, related to the supply levels or just a little bit of uncertainty. Um, I guess when we look at, at rental prices, um, you know, there's obviously been over the last 12 to 18 months a little bit of a, uh, a drop in actual prices. But as you see the actual sales prices pick up, uh, we think, um, you know, the rental prices will catch up to that. And as investors return to the market, it will sort of drive things uh, back up to, I guess, what we would have called normal pre-COVID. Um, and certainly as we see the borders open up again, um, the expectation obviously is that the sort of 200,000 or so immigrants who typically come to this country each year and are largely renters will, will just drive up that level of demand and that will start pushing prices up higher again. So um, for those investors who've hung in there, which obviously there's a pretty large number in this country, um, we, we think you know that the sort of uh, return to normality will start to bring a bit more certainty around um, rental prices and certainly a, a, a sort of bigger level of demand in the market. Really interesting predictions there and um, yeah we might see that ripple down into the rental property market as you mentioned so we'll have to keep an eye on that and see how things unfold. On that note we're just about out of time but I've got to say thanks so much for joining us today it's been great to hear your insights. Thanks very much for having me. Pleasure to have you on. Viewers, if you've just joined us, we've just had a stellar discussion with Mr. Jeremy Goldschmidt of Rent Better. You can catch this edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks on the Calkine channel later today. But for now, thanks for your time and stay tuned to Calkine TV for more live updates. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. 
Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, Join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calkine TV. The Dogecoin killer, the Shiba Inu, has returned. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and you're watching Calcine Media. The meme currency, the Shiba Inu, has been on a three-day winning streak, surging over 350% in the last week. The Shiba Inu cryptocurrency, popularly known as the Dogecoin killer, has been making a comeback with enormous recovery. It's a decentralized crypto and it was introduced in August 2020 by a mysterious founder known as Ryoshi. So what is behind the recent enormous surge of the Shiba Inu? Well, over the past few days, the altcoin has seen enormous growth, bringing it back into the crypto spotlight. Thanks to Elon Musk's latest tweet about his puppy and an unidentified purchaser's coin shopping spree. Shiba Inu has more than tripled in value and is currently the world's 20th largest by market value. An anonymous purchaser decided to embark on a Shiba coin purchasing binge. And in just two days, he bought almost 6.3 trillion coins. The next day, the whale continued his buying spree and bought additional coins. As a result, the whale acquired 116 billion coins, followed by 159 billion coins and 1 billion coins in two more purchases. They acquired 276 billion at ship coins on the 2nd of October. It's not the first time a whale has influenced the meme coin's fate. Shiba was formed in August to reap the benefits of Dogecoin's growing popularity, which triggered a rush of investors into the cryptocurrency sector. Shiba Inu, on the other hand, leveled up faster than Dogecoin. In addition, Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, or the Doge father himself, shared an adorable photo of his own Shiba Inu puppy called Flocky Frunk Puppy on Sunday night causing Shiba prices to rise. Elon Musk is a driving force behind the digital asset boom of 2021. Even his minor attention results in significant changes in the crypto space. So can Shiba Inu eventually overtake Dogecoin? Well, it has witnessed massive growth recently. Roshi has advocated for the coin's nickname, the Dogecoin Killer, arguing that Shiba's technology is much more community-driven than its competitor. The total value locked of Shiba Inu soared to close to $2 billion in the month of June and July, indicating that investors were highly interested. Whale interest has strengthened Shiba Inu's market position in recent months. Shiba's value has skyrocketed in such a short period. Therefore, SHIB has shown the potential to surpass the market cap of other leading cryptos. However, even if the Shiba community is enthusiastic and working hard to put the coin at the top, it will not be a trivial task because the close rival Doge has a much larger market value. Though if Shiba continues to rise at its current growth rate, a significant breakthrough could be possible. Shiba Inu's market position has been bolstered by a surge in popularity on social media with nearly a million followers on Twitter. And all of this indicates that Shiba has the potential to surpass other cryptos in the market, and that includes Dogecoin. That's if it continues to grow at this current rate. That's all for now. We hope you found this video informative. Keep watching Calkine Media. I'm Rachel Jones, signing off for Calkine Media.
October is set to be a massive month for Netflix, with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released, and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video, I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals in terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season 2 is said to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Man of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action, and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty Amongst Others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway starring Tom Hanks will have you calling out, WILSON! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell, and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend, even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times, truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying serenity now! If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. 
I'm James Preston, reporting for CowGuy. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Kalkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Kalkine. Good morning and a warm welcome. Sage here for Calkine TV, reporting to you live from Sydney and you're watching the Global Markets Roundup. Let's dive into some of the key highlights and happenings from yesterday and starting with the US market. And the US shares rallied on Thursday as strong bank earnings reports fired up investors' risk appetites, while the dollar and the benchmark treasury yields both paused their recent ascent to pull back from the multi-month highs. MSCI's gauge of stocks across the globe gained 1.34% and the benchmark US indices closed higher on Thursday, October 14th, boosted by strong quarterly results of major banks and upbeat economic data that helped alleviate the investors' concerns. The S&P 500 was up 1.71% and the Dow Jones rose 1.56% while the Nasdaq Composite rose 1.73% and the small cap Russell 2000 climbed 1.44%. The US stock market has been volatile in recent weeks over concerns about inflation, rising energy costs and economic slowdown. And money managers interviewed by Wall Street Journal have downplayed Thursday's rally, stressing that markets could expect more bumpy roads ahead. On Thursday, the Labor Department said that the US jobless claims fell to 293,000 in the week ended 9th October from 329,000 in the previous week. Basic materials and technology stocks were the top gainers on the S&P 500. All of the 11 stock segments of the index rose on Thursday. Industrials, financials, healthcare and real estate stocks were among the top movers, while consumer, non-cyclicals, energy and utilities were the bottom movers. Investors were motivated by the strong quarterly results of the major banks reported Thursday. And moving on now to the futures and commodities. Gold futures were up 0.15% and silver was up 1.71%, while copper rose 2.08%. And Brent oil futures increased by 1.25% and WTI crude was up 1.28%. Looking at the bond market now, and the 30-year Treasury bond yields fell 1.05%, while the 10-year bond yields declined 2.25%. And the US dollar futures index decreased by 0.10%. And now, it's time for a small break, but stay tuned as I'll be back with the Asian and Australian market updates. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all in our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Welcome back, Sage here. You're watching the Global Markets Roundup show by Calkine TV. And the European stocks rose on Thursday, hitting the highest in more than two weeks as investors bet a steady economic recovery from the pandemic-induced slump will support the corporate earnings despite signs of elevated inflation. And mining shares jumped 3.3%, their biggest daily gain in three months. Technology stocks rallied again and the pan-European stock 600 index Stocks rose 1.2%. UK stock markets traded higher after yesterday's flat closing tracking. The Asian markets closed in positive territory. 
However, the energy crisis in the UK has exasperated further and the pure plant and Colorado energy are the latest energy suppliers in the UK to collapse due to the higher gas prices. The UK energy regulator would appoint another energy supplier to serve the customers from the collapsed companies. And German bond yields were set for their biggest two-day fall in months on Thursday as the government debt markets continued to reverse a recent spike in borrowing costs. On Thursday in the euro area, Germany's 10-year yield the benchmark for the bloc fell to a one-week low of 0.192%, and that was current at 3.32 GMT in the afternoon. It was down 5.6 basis points at 0.185%, way below Wednesday's near five-month high of 0.088%. Japanese shares ended higher on Thursday, led by heavyweight tech stocks that tracked the gains on the Nasdaq, with chip equipment maker Tokyo Electron providing the biggest boost for the Nikkei. And the Nikkei share average closed 1.46%, following two sessions of declines, while the broader topics rose 0.67%. In China, stocks ended lower on Thursday's record high factory gate inflation data amid weak demands in September stoked worries over the trajectory of the monetary policy support. And the Shanghai Composite Index closed 0.1% lower, while the blue chip CSI 300 index fell 0.54%. South Korean shares ended at a two-week high on Thursday as strong gains in the tech heavyweights outweighed the worries about rising inflation in the United States and China. The yuan strengthened while the benchmark bond yield fell. The KOSPI closed up 1.50%, the highest close since October 1st. It gained 0.96% on Wednesday. And the Australian shares are expected to end the week on an upbeat note, likely helped by gains in the domestic miners and energy stocks on the back of soaring commodity and oil prices. The domestic shares are also expected to track Wall Street, which ended higher overnight. And the ASX 200 climbed 0.5% in the previous session on Thursday. Harvey Norman will trade ex-dividend for its fully franked 15 cents per share final dividend on Friday. Eagers Automotive and Hub24 are scheduled to pay their latest dividends later on Friday as well. Gold prices rose driven by easing bond yields and the spot gold rose 0.3% and US gold futures climbed 0.26%. Meanwhile, Bitcoin fell 0.34% to 57,180 US dollars 34 cents, pulling back from a five-month high. And thanks for joining us in the report. That's all for now. And keep watching Calcine TV for more market updates. Sage signing off. Hi there, James Preston for Calcine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Mike Vazabeda. Mike is the director of Moby Diction. They are a new age innovation consultancy platform. Here at Calcheim, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. A very warm welcome to you today, Mike. Hey, good to meet you. Now, first up, Mike, could you start by explaining what Moby Diction does? Yeah, look, Moby Diction is uh, an Australian-based technology company. We started about 10 years ago, and 
we started off with the mobile, the humble smartphone as a device where we started to explore applications, but we've now grown into a, a digital experience, come customer experience, sort of, you know, digitally uh, uh, aware company. So, Mike, what do you think the Australian digital industry's weak and strong points are currently? Right, okay, very interesting. Um, let, let's, let's start with the positive. I think in terms of the Australian sort of companies taking on digital as a channel, uh, from my experience, you know, frankly, I think I've seen digital adoption is huge. So when companies come to adopting digital technologies, uh, you know, looking at how the global industries are, I think Australian companies are really good at adoption. And, you know, if you look at the shortfalls, I think we've got a little gap in terms of the Australian digital industry. You look at close to 8% of our GDP, for example, whereas you measure that with counterparts in the US or EU, for example, we're talking about a huge difference there. We're talking about 25%, right? So we've got a gap to fill in terms of how Australia continues to evolve and, and move forward. Um, just another sort of shortfall also is the way Australian sort of enterprises invest in technology. So the government is actually doing a lot across all states. So you've got innovation hubs, you've got enterprise programs fostering innovation. But I think, I think getting to market in terms of global reach, uh, how Australian companies can actually scale up their enterprise or startup, for example, it's going to be quite challenging because that needs a different dynamic and we don't have the scale of people uh, at the moment in Australia. So, so I think that there's some, there's some work to do there. Yes, absolutely. And Mike, what do you believe is the most significant advancement you see in the industry this year? Well, look, again, and I'm trying to be very positive about this. From my experience, again, if I look at the way companies have suddenly evolved and erupted in terms of adopting to digital technologies due to COVID-19, the pandemic, right? Now, there is an inherent need for companies to suddenly take on new channels of engagement, right? Now, previously, a lot of companies were looking at creating digital solutions if there was a problem that cropped up. But now, it's, it's the other way. You've got to be at the forefront of technology. You've got to be, be where your customer is, right? And at the moment, I think the biggest trend is how uh, companies are actually looking at partnering with other people, the work from home sort of mentality and how the, the, that culture has sort of grown. Uh, you look at the SME market, uh, SME sort of in the whole segment in Australia, we're talking about, I think I, I was reading a report somewhere and said, close to 90% of SMEs in Australia are tech focused. Now, that, that, that's a huge sort of you know, area where there's gonna be a lot of new developments happening, but kudos to the companies who actually adopted digital and taken it on their stride, especially during this pandemic. And what is the most significant, and on that note, when you're looking at key factors, what do you keep in mind significantly while building digital solutions that are suited for various different types of businesses. Yeah, look, I think I think the premise of digital is not is not how you code or how you apply a uh, you know uh, an application to a problem. I think companies need to look back always at a customer first. What is the problem you're trying to solve, or what is the what is the need in the market that you're trying to resolve, right? And I think if you work backwards, and I, I, I see that a lot in terms of companies where companies too often go into sort of you know uh, into a mode where they're actually trying to build solutions already without understanding what is the problem they're trying to solve, what channels are these customers interacting. So, so having a core focus on your customer, I think is, is very important. And that's, that's what we do at Moby Diction as well. Absolutely. And so in your opinion there, what do you think makes Moby Diction unique to the market? 
Look, I think I think there's uh, there's a lot of companies out there, obviously fostering innovation and trying to sort of you know upscale when it comes to your your team members and all that. But but I think one of the philosophies that I always you know let my let my people let the partners that we work with always work on is is a continuous improvement model. Now you've got to look at the, the I, I talk about it as the three pillars. I talk about it as A, I, and M. And the A being for continuously being able to analyze whatever you're building, whether it's digital products or services for your customers or users. You're talking about uh, an improvement process. So you're always looking at you know ways to improve that. And that is done by measurement. So it's it's your analyze, improve, and measure. It's a it's a it's a continuous cycle, right? And you have been assisting Australian businesses to transform and innovate. How do you envision the future of AI-powered tech here in the Australian economy? Right, okay. Look, that, that, that's a huge area of growth, right? We know, uh, you know, topics of uh, AI, you know, the areas of machine learning, you know, whether it's, you know, object recognition or NLP processes or all that. I think what's going to be really important is smart things are going to get much more smarter anyway, right? Those things are going to keep growing. So Australian companies will have to keep adopting to newer ways of engaging. Uh, the growth of uh, predictability of your customer or whether it's, you know, uh, disease management, for example, object rec recognition, all of that. It, it's just going to keep growing. So. I think technology is just going to keep evolving and becoming smarter by the day. So companies will have to have their ears really close to the ground when it comes to these kind of technologies, right? And just lastly, Mike, how do you feel that COVID has impacted the digital industry? Has it pushed it forward faster than maybe if we hadn't seen a COVID pandemic? Look, I, I think absolutely. Whilst there's been cases of a lot of businesses, you know, uh, suffering and, you know, uh, because of COVID, there's been a lot of case studies where people uh, and businesses have had to adapt to new ways of interacting with customers. They've had to quickly scale up their production services, their partner management programs, all of that, right? Um, I was reading somewhere a while ago that in February 2020, when you know the first COVID-19, you know, sort of, you know, uh, started to impact the world, it took less than a week for the top 10 keywords on Amazon to become COVID-19 related, right? And that's the significant impact that COVID-19 has had, and 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 I see a lot of businesses actually adopting to technology really quick. Um, again, I think I think overseas we're talking about the rapid pace of innovation and going to market has increased by three years on an average apparently. So we're talking about bringing forth innovation really quick. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating chatting with you today, Mike. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Thank you all. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for today. But watch the space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space. From updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV.
Bitcoin bulls have been validated in the past week as Bitcoin surged past $50,000 and reached $55,000 US. The latest rise from Bitcoin is the largest and steepest since its ascent to the record high of $64,000 in April this year. If you've ever wondered what people mean when they describe digital currencies as volatile, you only need to look at Bitcoin's price graph for this year. If we take the year-to-date growth, Bitcoin has enjoyed almost a 90% return in 2021. But the journey it has taken to get to that point tells a less enjoyable story. The first 10 days of the year saw a $10,000 rise, a pattern which repeated itself a few times throughout the first half of the year. Bitcoin's latest surge is approximately the same pattern. So throughout 2021, the $10K jump has immediately been followed by a drop equal to its rise. Now, how big will the next correction be? This is the question Bitcoin investors should be asking themselves because, as we have seen, it's not a question of if, it's a matter of when and by how much. The latest surge, which began seven days ago, is part of a larger bull run that began on July 20. This furthermore means it is the second largest bull run in Bitcoin's history, the biggest being from January 1st, from just below $30,000 up until April 14, when Bitcoin hit the record high of 64,000 US. Although it is impossible to pinpoint the reasons for Bitcoin's massive drop earlier this year, there are a couple of events which, coincidentally or not, immediately preceded it. One of those events was the Chinese government's attempt in April to tighten the reins on digital currency in China. Since then, China's resolve to stamp out cryptocurrency has only become stronger and more definitive. The other major event that preceded Bitcoin's severe mid-year dive was concerns over Bitcoin mining and its increasingly harmful impact on the environment. This was brought to the forefront by Tesla founder Elon Musk when he announced that Tesla had cut ties with Bitcoin and it was no longer accepting the digital currency as payment for their vehicles. Not much has changed since in regards to Bitcoin mining, except for the fact that the public now knows things such as the electricity Bitcoin miners use on an annual basis is equal to that of Egypt and is also 0.5% of the world's annual electricity usage. While it is debatable that these two things were the major contributors to Bitcoin's mid-year meltdown, it can be argued that a mass sell-offs began creating a domino effect which eventually saw Bitcoin lose half of its value. This happens all the time in the crypto market, albeit usually on a much smaller and less devastating scale. So what's different this time around? What the aftermath of Bitcoin's media crisis did do was it fueled discussion. After a crushing blow like that, an asset can either crumble or rebuild. Bitcoin has done the latter. Last Friday, US Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell made a startlingly bold declaration telling Congress that the central bank had no intention of following in China's footsteps by banning cryptocurrencies. These words were reinforced on Tuesday when US Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman Gary Gensler reiterated this in a financial hearing, saying that he has no plans to outlaw digital currencies. It's things like this that cement Bitcoin as a legitimate form of asset. But every time a major figure publicly supports Bitcoin, or every time a country decides to adopt it as legal tender, these actions help to promote the currency even more. The difference between today and April this year, when Bitcoin lost half of its value, is that Bitcoin is now stronger and closer to legitimacy and being considered a part of the mainstream financial system. Although it is never easy to predict what is around the corner in the crypto space, these appear to be good days for Bitcoin. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. 
we will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Australians, particularly those in New South Wales and Queensland, are currently living with a severe reduction of freedoms enforced by the government. At a time when Australians are distracted by the pandemic, distracted by debates around mandatory vaccinations and everyday stresses inflicted by several controversial policies and rising tensions with police, the federal government has used the crisis status of the country as an opportunity to pass through some extremely concerning legislation. The most terrifying of these is the Surveillance Legislation Amendment Bill 2021, referred to as the Identify and Disrupt Bill. And make no mistake, it is a terrifying invasion of your privacy. To investigate this bill further, I'm joined by human rights lawyer, author and Amit University lecturer, Greg Barnes. Greg, thanks for joining me today. Thanks very much for having me, James. Well, Greg, first and foremost, this bill gives what many are calling unchecked powers to the AFP. What exactly do those powers entail? Well, the, these towers, these powers, I should say, entail uh, the capacity of the AFP to essentially take over your computer, to alter or delete data uh, or put data onto your computer. Uh, they can do so really uh, for very, very uh, minor reasons. Uh, there's a reference to criminal offences, but uh, no greater detail. Uh, they only have to have a reasonable suspicion. They can get a warrant from the Administrative Appeals Tribunal or a magistrate in most cases. And uh, what they can do is, uh, as I say, effectively um, become your online presence. Uh, and that's what's so dangerous about it with, with really no protection. Well, look, they're all very concerning details. From what you're saying there, it doesn't sound like there is a limiting principle. And from what I've seen, the threshold also seems to be exceptionally low, which is a reasonable threat. Is that accurate? Yeah, look, the, the, the threshold is reasonable. Uh, sorry, the threshold is very low. Uh, you know, reasonable suspicion, those sort, reasonable belief, those sorts of phrases uh, are often used in legislation for police to be able to get warrants. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, they do get warrants. There are very few warrants that are knocked back. These, you know, warrants to go into your house is one thing because you go into your house, the police take what they, what they think they can get under the warrant and they leave. This is invading your laptop, uh, your home computer, uh, your phone. Um, and in, in, there is capacity under this legislation to be able to do it without having to put affidavit material together, in other words, to justify it to uh, the AAT or a magistrate. Uh, if the uh, police say this is urgent enough, they don't have to provide that information for three days. Really scary stuff. Now, the kind of language we're talking about there is things like offences and suspicion and threats. It's, it's not really language that I would imagine is focusing on serious crimes, at least by the letter of the law it's written, such as terrorism. I mean, offences is now a term that is pretty much associated with public health orders, for example. So should we be concerned about how those terms can be applied? Does that not open a huge can of worms? Oh, you, you should be concerned, and I saw a comment from a colleague, I think at one of the universities, making a similar point this week, and she's right. Um, I think the other point, of course, is that we know from COVID that police do abuse their powers when it comes to surveillance. They have abused the COVID app, which people use. Uh, and we know, for example, that in relation to existing legislation, they have, for example, raided journalists uh, and, and uh, taken materials uh, as they sought to find out the sources in relation to particular stories. Uh, you could just imagine them using it for that very purpose here. But also it's that issue where you might, for example, uh, have a friend who, uh, unbeknownst to you, is associated with some sort of uh, group or that the AFP is interested in, and you suddenly find your computer being altered and, delete and, and material deleted, or alternatively, you know, a surveillance uh, operation of your online presence. 
Uh, I mean, it's just Orwellian stuff. There are very few protections in Australia. We don't have a Human Rights Act, so there are very mm. few protections against police abuse of this power. Well, Greg, perhaps the biggest area of concern, in addition to the ones we've already raised, is that in order to get this one through, 10 other acts were altered. Now, you've spoken about some of those alterations in the piece that you've written for Michael West Media, which, if, for example, we did have a human rights charter, this bill would be in contravention of it. Can you go through a little bit about those 10 other acts that have been altered to, to get this one over the line? So there's a range of um, legislation that's been altered. Uh, for example, privacy legislation, uh, uh, the AFP legislation itself, uh, the criminal code, a range of pieces of legislation have been altered in order to be able to ensure that uh, this power is replicated uh, or evidence can be used uh, when this power is exercised. I, I think the other point is that this went through the federal parliament in effectively two days. It mm. did go to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Security Issues, which has been next to useless in recent years, with the exception of Andrew Wilkie. Uh, and it then sailed through with support of the Labor Party. Um, and in fact, uh, it, it's one of the most remarkable pieces of legislation to hit our parliaments in recent times. And there have been many in relation to this area, uh, but got so little press, which is just quite extraordinary. No, you're 100% right. I mean, I've had to find out this information, for example, from what many would consider alternative sources or fringe sources, so to speak, but it's, it's there. This is not a conspiracy theory. This has been passed through the parliament. This is legislation now in our laws. Can, can we go through a little bit about the history of the bill? Because it's taken a little bit of time to get it actually over the line. So when did this first come about? And you mentioned there that it passed with pretty much unison support. Was there anyone that actually opposed it when it was in front of parliament? Well, certainly the Greens opposed it, as I understand it, and I think Andrew Wilkie opposed it too. And in fact, he gave a speech recently uh, talking about the surveillance state. But the major political parties and the Conservatives in the Senate uh, allowed this bill to go through. I would have thought that the media would have been more on top of this issue, given that they campaigned very, very vigorously when they were raided, for example, News Limited, ABC, and rightly mm. so. Uh, and they should be very concerned about this legislation because their own journalists could find themselves on the end of a warrant here uh, where uh, the, the police decide that they're going to start altering and deleting data. Now, people say, oh, that's far-fetched. None of this is far-fetched. We've seen, and it's ironic we're on the almost anniversary of 9-11, what we've seen since 9-11 is the increasing authoritarianism of our state, the, the rise of the surveillance state, and very few checks and balances. And in fact, if anything, the checks and balances have been eroded. Well, not only that, but I mean, you also look at the current issues, for example, with Jordan Shanks and John Barillaro. Now, simply wanting to do his job, he's been under intense scrutiny from parliaments, from police, uh, raiding all of his files, for example. So we're already at a heightened state here, and now this is just going through, and as you mentioned, there's no one really reporting on it. Let, let's have a look at what the future implications of the bill are. There has been some discussion circulating that it potentially opens the door for something like the creation of a social credit system. Is, is there any truth to that concept given the level of surveillance it allows? Well, look, I think that, you know, that of course is, a, I think, a Chinese uh, approach to these issues, has been said to be a Chinese approach to these issues. Uh, I don't think you should have any doubt, and, and we're seeing it now in the discussion about vaccine passports, if you like, that the, the online presence that people have is going to be taken into account uh, when it comes to their citizenry and uh, uh, where they sit as a citizen and going to be used against them. Uh, I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And that, again, that's not being, that's not fear mongering. That's just the way we're heading. And, and what is extraordinary, as I say, is that there is no pushback on this. Uh, remarkably quiet uh, on the part of the media. Um, and that's what's dangerous because once this legislation and this sort of legislation has become normal of course we've seen it with the post 9 11 anti-terror laws we saw it with legislation which allowed uh, asio to declare operations uh, special operations and therefore commit a f what would otherwise be offenses and and civil wrongs you know we've become bom we've been bombarded with this sort of legislation every government uh, every any time they get a request from the afp or asio or ASIS, give them whatever they want. They've got carte blanche. Mm. And um, uh, both sides of politics have been equally guilty. Well, you mentioned that there hasn't been a great deal of coverage in the media itself. There has been a, a bit of pushback, though, from, I think, uh, citizens who have been made aware of what's going on. There's a few petitions circulating at the moment, but 
I suppose first and foremost, are they actually going to have any impact and can this bill actually be repealed? Well, I think the problem uh, now, James, is that the, 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 the horse has bolted. Um, this legislation has gone through the parliament. Uh, it would take a courageous government and neither side of politics has any courage when it comes to these sorts of fundamental rule of law and liberal principles anymore. Um, but, you know, it would take a, a committed government to say we're going to repeal this legislation. Um, uh, but again, it will be up to the courts, I think, to push back. And, you know, if there's one thing we have learnt in the last 20 years is that particularly the federal court has been prepared to uh, try and trim the wings of, an, of a rampant executive and, and the AFP abusing its powers, and it will be left up to the courts. But of course, sadly, the courts can only work with the legislation that they're given. They can't invent the law. Uh, but that's where uh, one hopes there'll be some curtailing of this legislation and at least some form of check on the powers that the AFP will no doubt seek to use. Well, Greg, just before we wrap up, obviously if it's not repealed, there's got to be some sort of thing that Aussies can do to protect themselves for this invasion of privacy. Is there a way to do that? Would, for example, a VPN help to do such a thing? I'm not an expert in technology, but you know certainly I, I don't blame people for taking the steps that they take uh, using a VPN, for example. I, I had an email the other day from uh, someone, um, and uh, no doubt now the police will be able to issue a warrant and check my emails, but <laughs> I did have an email from someone indicating that uh, they uh, were very concerned about this legislation and they were talking to friends about this legislation and, and how to protect their privacy. And I don't blame them because there are very few rights to privacy enshrined in law in Australia, uh, and the police know that. And we certainly don't have a human right to privacy like you have, for example, in the UK or in Canada and uh, other jurisdictions. So uh, people have a tendency to push back, and, and rightly so. Look, it's all really quite scary stuff. As you mentioned, Orwellian is probably the word for it, and we're seeing more and more of that. So with any luck, there will be a bit of a pushback. With any luck, we can get people on board with that petition. But, Greg, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Let's hope we can either get it repealed or further amendments are made to protect the privacy of citizens. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you bringing up the issue. Well, that's Greg Barnes, human rights lawyer, author and Amit University lecturer, discussing the Identify and Disrupt Bill exclusively on the Tech Beat. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. If you're up for an adventure, there's hardly a better destination for it than right here in Australia and nearby New Zealand. Although interstate travel is still up in the air, as restrictions ease, no doubt you want to hit the road and explore the great outdoors. So here's our top adventure activities to stretch those post-lockdown muscles. First up, scuba diving. Mingalu Reef and the Great Barrier Reef. Fancy a swim with the whale sharks? Each year between April and July, you can witness a migration of whale sharks to Ningalu Reef. Don't worry though, because these sharks are docile and harmless and they only eat plankton, they're not aggressive. A more obvious underwater hotspot, the Great Barrier Reef is another thing scuba diving enthusiasts don't want to miss. It's the largest reef around the world. Over 2,300 kilometers hide the incredibly vivid creatures. Think dugons, seals, mesmerizing tropical fish, dozens of different corals, sponges and starfish, even dolphins and whales. There are daily trips organized from Port Douglas and Cairns so the experts can show you the best spots. 
And if you want a real adrenaline rush, make sure to head to South Australia and hop in a cage to dive with the great white sharks. It's in Port Lincoln, which is one of the best places to visit in the state. Next up, golfing, beachfront in Sydney. Going on an active holiday is becoming more and more popular as people love devoting their vacation days to learning a new skill while having fun. You can sign up for golf courses in Sydney and enjoy the most breathtaking place to make a hole in one. The beachfront in Sydney is specifically designed as a giant golf court with a club and a cafe you can unwind in. And while you're in the city, don't miss out on climbing the Sydney Harbour Bridge for an amazing panoramic view and photo opportunities. A similar hard pumping experience can be found at Gold Coast Skypoint Climb, where you get the climb, highest 270 metres external building in the country. Next, bungee jumping, Queenstown in New Zealand. Queenstown is the perfect place for adrenaline junkies and it's a natural place to stop for those New Zealand road trips. There are several spots for a bungee jump, but Kawaru Bridge may be the best one. It's actually a place where bungee jumping was born. The surreal turquoise river beneath, amazing surrounding nature and scenery will make your 43 meter high jump worthwhile. Another great option to try is the world's biggest swing just above the Nevis River, where you'll experience a height of 300 meters. Enjoy a guided hike, jet boating or parasailing and consider visiting the Queenstown Adventure Group to explore other often activities. Cycling. Soak in Australia on two wheels. If you have the mindset of an independent traveller and you want to explore off the grid paths, cycling is the best way to do it. Australia has an awesome outback just waiting for you. And if you're wondering what area to explore, well it might be best to consider the weather conditions first. The northern area has a high humidity, both wet and dry seasons. The central part isn't suitable for cycling because it's the heart of the desert basically. But a moderate climate is typical for the southern part. Which is why Tasmania is a truly great place and it became a renowned area for cycling from Cradle Mountain to Bruni Island. There's a lot to see. Don't miss out on Freysenet National Park either, where you may get the opportunity to pat a few kangaroos. Explore other trails as well. There are many beautiful spots you can find on two wheels. And lastly, surfing. They don't call the Gold Coast a surfer's paradise for nothing. Exquisite beaches with the urban side back offer you a chance to enjoy amazing waves. Whether you choose to ride some waves at the Snapper Rocks Surfer Bank or Palm Beach, Nobby Beach or Broad Beach, you can have the opportunity to soak up the sun and raise your adrenaline levels. If you prefer a more natural surrounding, choose Noosa. You can also attend surfing lessons. The Gold Coast is packed with surfing schools and academies. Coaches usually work with a group of up to six people, but there's also an option for private lessons. Other great surfing spots include Victoria, New South Wales and Western Australia. So keep this in mind when you choose adventure hotspots for the coming season. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Calkine.
Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Ali Hilmer. Ali is the founder and CEO of Zippy Crowd, a free platform helping people in small businesses get new customers through personal recommendations. Here at Kalkheim, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Now, a very warm welcome to you, Ali. Uh, thank you for having me, Rachel. Uh, good to be here. Good to speak to you today. Now, your business sounds absolutely fascinating. Can you tell me more about how it works? So, Zippy Crowd is an early stage startup, Australian based, and it is a social proof and recommendations platform for small business owners, freelancers, and l literally anybody in small business space. We um, are launching a product that digitizes word of mouth and helps small business owners aggregate recommendations, endorsements, testimonials. Uh, to optimize their online presence and to build their business on the strengths of their reputation, not on the size of their marketing budget. So it's a very impactful product and really needed uh, these days. Excellent. There's a great explanation there. Thanks, Ali. Now, trust building is one of the most significant elements to grow any business. Can you tell me about the key trust building mantras you implement for your client's business growth? Uh, our whole platform is built uh, on embedded trust into every feature. We believe that people love working with people they trust, people choose people they trust. And in today's digital economy, uh, trust is a rare commodity because the online space is driven by ads and uh, uh, a high marketing budget. So we um, uh, promote uh, recommendations uh, from people you know to people you, uh, sorry, from people you uh, trust uh, to people you trust. It's a two-way sort of trust relationship building. Uh, we um, uh, recommend to our customers that they build small, strong niche communities of people who have their back, uh, people who trust their work and love working with them. And recommendations come only from those kind of people. So there are no reviews, no negative ratings. It makes uh, organic reach based on embedded trust much easier for everybody. Now, more and more small businesses are entering the digital world. In your opinion, what should these businesses do to sustain and grow and how important is their reputation? It's a very good question because uh, today uh, in the digital economy, uh, everybody basically gives uh, a stack of the same recipes to small business owners, grow followers, invest in digital ads, build your uh, website, uh, be present everywhere. But when we're talking about next door hairdresser or mechanic, you know, the small people uh, with literally um, no employees, it's incredibly difficult for them. So our recommendation is invest in every cu customer because that's your brand building and spend more time doing what you love instead of promoting what you love. It's uh, people will talk about you. So of course, uh, be present on the platforms where you uh, where it makes sense for your business, but you don't need to chase followers. You better invest in your customers. That's great advice. And Ali, could you give us some tricks and tips for businesses to optimize digital marketing in today's world? Um, the best way to do that is uh, to work out um, uh, some sort of uh, loyalty uh, incentive programs that you will equip your customers with. That, in my opinion, that's the strongest conver conversion sort of tool. And how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected online startups? Have there been any benefits? Um, quite a few startups have been uh, impacted negatively because startup ge startups generally are much more fragile than any other businesses because of the lack of funding and lack of resources, etc. At the same time, uh, uh, 
COVID amplified need to be online uh, sort of uh, boosted um, radical innovations in in the areas of telehealth in the areas of hospitality sort of online delivery of services not every service can be delivered online but the startups that manage to radically innovate um, uh, to pivot and radically innovate their products to do that, they definitely uh, started um, experiencing significant growth. And what do you see for the future of the Australian online economy and the substantial benefits it can incur for the overall econ economy of Australia? Online economy is going to definitely grow. Um, as far as I know from all the research that, that small businesses already are investing um, additional 6% into their online presence. But with that, there will be significant um, uh, increase in competition and uh, uh, there will be weak parties in that because online real estate space is limited and um, it is driven by high budgets and algorithms. So uh, I think that online economy will need to get reorganized and more uh, players like Zipicrat will need to come into uh, uh, the online space to provide uh, better opportunities for those who don't have uh, the money and the resources to manage it. Absolutely. Well, it's fabulous work that you're doing there, Ali. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for now. Watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Japan has recently appointed a new Prime Minister, Fumio Kishida, who took office on the 4th of October. He in turn has now called the national parliamentary elections to be held on October 31st. And in this video, I'll take you through those elections and what the appointment of Kishida means for Japanese and Australian relations. But first, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to keep across the latest videos from Kalkine. Fumio Kishida has become the 100th Prime Minister of Japan, replacing Yoshihide Suga after he tendered his resignation following growing public outrage relating to his handling of the COVID pandemic. Soon after taking charge as the new Prime Minister, Kishida announced that the national parliamentary elections will indeed be conducted on October 31st as the ongoing parliament session will be dissolved on the 21st of October. The newly elected Prime Minister only has a few weeks time now to lead the Liberal Democratic Party through the crucial parliamentary polls. Among the various challenges that lie before him, Japan's economic recovery is the most pressing issue. The outbreak of COVID-19 and the pandemic-induced long national emergency has severely damaged the world's third largest economy. To win people's votes, he would need to pay heed to the crisis and bring into play effective programs, policies and measures to restore and achieve the pre-COVID economy levels. That's Japan itself, but how do these recent developments affect the relationship between Australia and Japan? 
Japan and Australia share a relationship built over the strategic and economic interest of both of the countries. Japan is the second largest export market of Australia, its second largest trading partner and the third largest source of foreign direct investments. Also, the defence relationship between the two countries has significantly evolved over the past two decades. Japan and Australia are members of the historic quadrilateral security dialogue that involves the United States and also India. The two countries engage in joint defence exercises and hold regular discussions on regional security matters, including nuclear tests and ballistic missile launches undertaken by North Korea and other nations. Any change in Japan's national leadership or in its political arena is bound to cause ripples in the alliance. With Kishida taking charge as the new Prime Minister of Japan, the coming few months could provide an interesting turn of events. But with that said, given there's been multiple decades of trust that has been fostered between the two nations in trade and defence, it's unlikely that any significant changes could occur. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, comment, share and subscribe. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Kalkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. New South Wales is planning to fast track international travel to kick off from as soon as the home quarantine program is in place. How soon is that? Well, by the end of October, if we play our cards right. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Carcine Media. After discussions with State Premier Dominic Perrottet, PM Scott Morrison has backed New South Wales' strategy following its emergence from a grueling 106 day lockdown. According to the government, hotel quarantine is fast becoming redundant as a costly and inconvenient measure for many travellers. Previously, Morrison had set the international travel ban lift for mid-November, once 80% of the population had been vaccinated. But according to the payer, the middle of next month is not soon enough because Australia can't live as a hermit kingdom on the other side of the world. On top of that, Health Minister Greg Hunt has confirmed that the international arrivals cap will be scrapped when Australia opens its borders for travel. Now you might be thinking, that's all well and good, but where can I actually go? Good question. The direct routes open between Australia and overseas destinations is not a long list. So far, Aussies are looking at being able to travel to Auckland, Christchurch, Wellington, London, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Dubai, Doha and Qatar, Singapore, Hong Kong, Bangkok, Tokyo, Nadi in Fiji and Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea. Naturally, these routes are susceptible to last minute changes and actual flights will be few and far in between. But nevertheless, that list will lengthen as the rest of the world gradually opens up for travel. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and while you're at it, sub to our channel to stay up to date. This has been Holly Shields for Kalkai Media.
Are you a millennial with parents who can't stop criticizing your spending habits? Sick of politicians telling you to lay off the avocado? Well, in this video, I'll take you through some of the key habits emerging for millennials that are helping them to obtain financial security. And don't worry, you can still have all the avo your heart desires. But first, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Cowkine. Millennials in general are known for spending more on convenience, online shopping, debt payments, food away from home, travel, and a variety of digital services such as Netflix. They're practices that are typically criticized by older generations. But of course, many of these criticisms fail to take in the key differences in errors from older generations to those now coming through, including wage growth being almost non-existent, the cost of living rising, and a serious housing crisis. Pure and simple, it's harder now to get a foothold than it once was. But here are three key tips to help build financial security. Maintain a tighter budget. It's always good to plan your month according to a budget. This way, you can save more money for your rainy days. In addition, a budget helps to track spending. In case you already have a budget and you're still unable to save, then you might need to tighten up your purse strings. Secondly, if you have loans or debts, make sure to pay them on time. It's important to pay your credit card loan, car payments or healthcare bills timely in order to get your finances in order. Many of these fees have interest attached to them, and the longer that plays out, the more interest that you'll have to pay, which of course equates to more money overall. Where possible, avoid taking out loans and instead pay using your own savings. Building a nest egg. Experts also talk about monthly automatic deductions to save for your future. The saved money can then be put in a mutual fund to earn more returns or it could be invested in stocks. Building a diversified portfolio can help set you on the path to creating a large wealth pool down the track. Learning about the tax system is also crucial. Calculating how much money you will earn post-tax is incredibly important to assist in your overall budgeting, and it can also help you to gain thousands of extra dollars every year through deductions and tax breaks. And finally, there's the concept of no spend days. Now, if you've already been implementing a number of these tips, then you may have to take some slightly more drastic measures, namely the concept of a no spend day. As the name implies, you're going to try and not spend a single cent or as close to that as possible. This could mean not eating a bought lunch at work, taking a bus instead of a taxi or driving, and of course, avoiding the likes of online shopping. More generally, it's a great strategy of finding out exactly where your money is going. If you enjoyed this video, then please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston for Calcon. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Good morning and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calkine TV, welcoming you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. The show where we bring to industry leaders, successful business owners and market experts all under one roof to help you discover the latest insights. Today we're fortunate enough to be joined by Mr. Prashant Gami, CEO and founder of X Enabler, an ideal digital transformational partner. Welcome to the show Prashant, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. It's great to have you on. Now, first of all, let's talk investment. What are some of the emerging investment trends you've noticed in tech companies? 
So in tech companies, as you can see, climate tech is really picking up after the latest climate report that got published. So a lot of sustainability and uh, climate tech companies are uh, coming forward in how to go uh, carbon neutral, everything. Uh, FinTech is also a big player uh, with um, pay now, uh, sorry, buy now, pay later and micro investment platforms that is also picking up and with Australian workforce, um, at like you know struggling to get workforce in the health tech the health tech sector is probably the largest sector that will be emerging in australia right it's really interesting predictions there and it's interesting as well that you mentioned climate tech which is something that i'm sure many people won't be familiar with just at the moment yeah. are there any companies you can think that are sort of exemplary of climate tech in your opinion uh, climate tech is quite new and there are a lot of companies that are uh, trying to get into it um, mostly like earning money on your carbon neutral uh, projects so things like if you have solar panel or battery or electric vehicles or anything uh, you can uh, there are companies emerging who can basically give you credit based on that uh, and those trends are coming up there are few startups uh, across uh, mike uh, from uh, mike is leading few of them phil morley uh, from pollenizer is leading few of them as well uh, and the number of uh, other players uh, from atlassian founders they are also uh, involved in a couple of those startups yes that's really interesting to hear a lot of activity obviously going on in the startup space and hopefully that climate tech sector is one that emerges as well. Now, what do you mm -hmm. consider the indications of growth in the tech space? So currently, uh, climate tech and um, those companies are long term um, if you are looking for long term investment. But if you are in a short term uh, investment over the next three years because of um, COVID and the change in the workplaces, uh, anything that do is with the data or virtualization are probably the stocks to look after. Um, so indications would be if the company is doing Zoom is a classic example that went skyrocketed because of the COVID and all need of the virtual platforms. Uh, and there are similar platforms who are delivering services virtually are coming very strong uh, this year and it will continue over the next year. Right. And is that sort of in line with the greater trend of digitization, do you think? It is. So uh, as Forbes mentioned recently in their article as well, that digitization, datafication and virtualization are probably the immediate uh, trend that will uh, that will drive the tech sector growth. Right. Absolutely fascinating to hear about those those trends in the sector. And in your opinion, which transformative tech solutions are helping businesses in the recouping phase of the ongoing pandemic? Um, uh, so digitization and real-time data is probably one of the um, critical changes that happened because of COVID and will continue to happen. Uh, I don't think we were paying attention to real-time data like, you know, the COVID cases in your area or the restrictions. And that was as prominent as before uh, the pandemic era. And it will continue to uh, see the local news and local up-to-date uh, real-time information. And for that, the real-time data is very important factor aggregating all the data across the sources and making them available to the user in a useful manner uh, those are a very good indicator um, that will help like you know getting through the pandemic period virtualization as i mentioned uh, all the services we are seeing like many of our clients they are trying to create the virtual um, virtual peer of their services so even the networking and virtual events are big uh, there are a lot of uh, startups that came in and started that um, that kind of uh, initiatives and they're going big as well absolutely and it seems like as a matter of fact consumers have actually come to expect being able to use real-time data integrated into these services yes. would you agree Yes, totally. And social selling is also becoming a big thing. So uh, because of the restrictions, we are uh, buying online more and more. And that whole experience of like, you know, how to make it social, how to make it uh, like you are going to the mall in a virtual way or the virtual fitting rooms, etc. Uh, the technologies that are helping you find the right fit or technologies that are helping you to like you know buy from the influencers or from your friend circle that 
those are reliable sources facebook as you can see is uh, transforming the way uh, businesses are connecting and promoting their brands so those trends are really picking up due to this pandemic and whole uh, change terrain as well yeah i completely agree and it's obviously under the umbrella there of the boom in e-commerce which we've been yes seeing definitely a lot during the pandemic yeah, true. That's true. And um, as you can see, even though we are open now in Sydney, particularly, and people are going back face to face a little bit, and we are obviously looking to networking events, but I'm pretty sure they will be very different to what they used to be before. And it will remain like that over the next year. So virtualization will be a big part of our life. I can imagine so. That'll be the case for a good few years to come at least. Now, just to touch mm -hmm. on X Enabler again, which industry would you say the majority of your clients belong to and why is this the case? So along with the trends, uh, FinTech and HealthTech are our biggest uh, clients because uh, A, with the FinTech, the millennial needs of like, you know, um, platforms like Afterpay and um, Buy Now, Pay Later, uh, they're becoming large boom also to solve the supply chain problem where you can secure the money at the sale time and then uh, take care of all the finance later on. Uh, that is also becoming uh, big. So uh, solutions like BizPay, Afterpay, the number of solutions coming in that space, digital wallet, cryptocurrencies, uh, they're transforming the market like anything. So that is one of the biggest sectors that we are seeing in our client base. And the other one is health tech where the need of um, sensors and IoT devices and how health tech can be provided remotely and also more effectively with uh, less uh, human involvement because of our uh, skill shortage in the sector and growing older population in Australia is very important. So those two sectors are leading the way at the moment in our client sector and I think in the industries as well. I completely agree there. And both those sectors that you mentioned, health tech and fintech are uh, growing at rapid rates as well and um, heading towards digitization much faster than other sectors. Yes, that's true. Definitely, and continue. Yeah, sorry. No, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, again, the uh, I think because of the pandemic, the digital transformation has accelerated. So the companies are turning more to the technology to solve their day-to-day -day business problem. And it is accelerated at a quite fast rate, which we are seeing in the skill shortage as well. Like currently, if you are trying to secure a tech talent, it's a very big struggle in the market. And uh, that that is actually going global in a true sense. Absolutely. I think the Correlation of the job market is something that can't be ignored and it's something that digitization is definitely um, aiding in some respects. Although just before we wrap up now, I understand you've delivered a phenomenal 200 plus projects in the last decade. Which proven yes. process and innovative strategy has worked in your favor? Um, thank you for that, by the way. And um, like largely we deal with innovation space and inherently that that field is risky. So risk is a very uh, deep ingredient of the process. And that means the honesty, transparency, and collaboration are very key important fact because more than often things go wrong or they don't work out. And if everybody is across, the, across it in the early stage, it makes it more manageable and successful in the end. Uh, and that has worked for us and I'm sure for most of the companies that are out there. Very well said there and a great way to sum up. On that note, it's just about all we have time for at the moment, but I've got to say thanks so much for joining us today. It's been great to hear insights. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure to have you on. And viewers, if you've just joined us, we've had a stellar discussion with Mr. Prashant Garmi of X Enabler. You can catch this edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks on the Calkine channel later today. But for now, thanks for your time and stay tuned to Calkine TV for more live updates. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV.
Well, everyone, good morning. It's Sage here. Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Calkine TV. This morning we have Mr. Stuart Pollington, the Managing Director at Smart Traffic. And today's expert will share insights on running a leading global digital agency that helps thousands of businesses grow their online presence with the expert SEO specialists, online advertising professionals, editors and content writers from Smart Traffic assisting them. So we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market. So today we're very lucky to share some space with Mr. Stuart Pollington, Managing Director of Smart Traffic. Welcome to the show, Stuart. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to meet you. And with your expertise in digital <laughs> marketing, we're pleased to have you share your insights on the show today. So let's get started. How do you think the digital marketing helps people build up a strong backbone amidst the current unprecedented times and assist with business survival, please? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think I thank you again for, for being here. It's great to be here. Um, I think uh, digital marketing is definitely more important than ever. And I think the businesses around the world are starting to realize that if their customers cannot come to them, then they need to make sure they are where they are, which is online, whether that's uh, someone looking in Google, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram or even on LinkedIn. Um, there are so many ways that you can utilize digital marketing to achieve your business goals. Uh, the most important thing is that, is that you have a plan and that you, you, you work on that plan and you know where you want to get to and how you're going to get there. Exactly, and, and I believe that demographic and, and identifying your audience would be particularly important when you're doing digital marketing, and I'm sure you've got a lot of experience in that area. Established in 2006, Smart mm -hmm. Traffic has seen the industry evolve and grow. How does Smart Traffic uniquely assist clients in building up their online business and entrepreneurship, please? Okay, so we, we started back when we started back in 2006, we were very, very much focused on Google and helping sites rank organically so that when someone searches for um, a keyword for your product or service that you do, we help sites appear number one in Google so they can get that traffic. Um, we're a full service digital marketing agency now, so we've developed over time, we go, you know, we help businesses build websites we help them get traffic through facebook or linkedin and we help them as well as we said with the seo now we're in a very unique position in that we have been in this industry for a long time and we also have um, a, another business called evo digital which is white label so we don't only just help businesses directly we also help other agencies around their work around the world as their kind of back-end seo team in the background so because of that we're not just seeing what, how, how our clients perform, we see how other agencies around the world approach digital marketing, which allows us to tweak how we deliver our services and get results for our clients. Oh, fantastic. It's quite an exciting domain, really, and sounds like you have a great uh, pool of um, artists and, and agency experts <laughs> there to, to draw from. Um, so in your opinion, how can businesses optimize their SEO usage to upscale their reach, please? Um, well, the first thing would be to have a plan. And as you mentioned earlier, would be to find out first where your customers are. So, you know, who, who, are, who is your perfect customer? Who is your ideal customer? And then try and think about where does that person hang out? You know, where might they be? Will they, is it someone who is, you know, your product or service? Is that something where people are going to be searching online for it? Or is it somewhat something that you kind of need to use Facebook or Instagram and actually get an ad in, in, in front of them? So you need to understand who, who it is that you're trying to target first. Um, once you understand that and you get into the mind of that person, you can start having a think about, well, how would this person look for my product or service? So within your business, there'll be industry terms that you use, but are they the terms that your customers use to find you? So you, you kind of get into the mind of your customer. And once you understand that, you can then start researching into the sorts of keywords that people will use to type into Google. And once you've done that, you can then start optimizing your website for those keywords and you can start creating content, whether that's blog posts or videos or infographics around the topics and, and the questions that your customers have. Once you create that, it's then having a plan ongoing to keep that going. It's very important organically with SEO and Google that 
you have a plan and that you continuously are, are working on that because the, your competitors are not going to stand still. So even if you think you're doing well now, you still need to keep pushing and pushing with your marketing to make sure that you either stay where you are or, or improve even more. Exactly. It's such a fast moving industry that mm. it must be um, quite a challenge to keep up with the, the trends. So how has the recent pandemic changed the work culture across the globe? Uh, what would you say um, is a key to survival in the present world? OK, so, I mean, I, we can look at this uh, 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 maybe two ways. I mean, us as a business, we're very lucky. We're, we're a digital business. So you know we managed to survive with our staff and our, and our teams working from home and we've managed to maintain the results and the services for our clients but we're in a unique position because what we do is digital a lot of our customers are maybe brick and mortar um so i think businesses now are understanding that if if, if your customers can't come to you then you need to make sure you are where your customers are and then on top of that i think we're seeing businesses are more open to remote workers, to outsourcing than they were before. So if we rewind uh, two years before uh, the pandemic, um, a lot of businesses maybe would try and do things in-house. Maybe they'd hire a marketer who would be expected to manage everything. So, you know, one marketer would be in charge of their website, their email marketing, their Facebook, their graphic design, as well as, um, you know, optimizing their website and it's, it's very difficult to be good at all of that it's, it's that you know that that um jack of all trades master of none it's very very difficult so I, we're now seeing that more businesses are open to working with people outsourcing and bringing them in it's like a remote team it's a lot easier to do that now through zoom you have upwork you have fiverr you have um you know different bits of software that can help you manage your team and I think that's what businesses are now starting to realize, that it's difficult to have one person who can maybe cover everything. You need to be able to dip into experts in different fields. And, and, and that, I think, is, 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 is what businesses are understanding now. You know, it doesn't matter. You don't have to physically be in the office or even in the same country to be good at what you do and get results. Exactly. Um, thank you so much for sharing your insights, by the way. It's uh, definitely uh, inspiring because uh, we're all immersed in the space in one way or another. A lot of people are doing social media and building up their own profiles that way. Mm. So thank you so much for sharing your insights. And we're reaching the end of our discussion now. If someone <laughs> is looking forward to digital marketing services, what are the fundamentals they should look upon before commencing with the digitization, please? Um, so digital marketing is very all-encompassing. It, it, it covers so much, um, so many different areas. You know, we've got you've got the website, you've got your email marketing, you've got your Facebook, you've got your paid ads, you've got your organic. I think the main thing, the most important thing you can do is understand where your customers are first. And I, I've said this a few times now, but once you understand where your customers are, you can start tailoring your message to your customer, to your ideal customer. And then you can go out and start getting your product or service in front of them, whether that's trying to get you to rank organically in Google, whether that's using Facebook for ads or, or Instagram or even um, LinkedIn. Uh, the main, main thing is understand who your customers are and where they are. Uh, don't assume that they won't be online. I mean, nearly everyone has a Facebook account. So at some point, people will be online or on Facebook. Um, and then have a plan. So you, you understand your customer, you put together a plan, but, but be mindful that you need to be flexible because things change. So don't stick to a plan rigidly, but have it more of a guideline. We want to be here within 12 months or 18 months. These are the strategies that we're going to uh, uh, implement and attempt to get there, but be flexible enough to say, look, this isn't working, so we're going to try this more, or this, this campaign seems to be working better than this campaign. Let's switch this off and let's move budget over here you just um just be mindful and, and and use the data and the the analytics to tailor your campaign and make it a success exactly uh, what you said there at the end about the analytics and the data it's so important to be able to read that um but not all businesses or business leaders have the time to immerse themselves into that data. So mm. finding a, a professional technological partner or digital partner like Smart Traffic can offer many benefits, I'd imagine. Um, thanks so much for joining oh, yeah, us definitely. today.
Mm. Would you yeah, like I to mean, share I just, any... just, just, oh, sorry, go on. <laughs> just going to ask if you'd like to share any comments before we close up the discussion. <laughs> Yeah, I just just on the the the, the point you made uh, just then um, about working with professionals. So there's there's a wealth of information online. Um, it's great now. I mean, you know, back um, you know when I was at school, we didn't have the technology that we have now. We couldn't have all this information at our fingertips. It's great, but it's also a little bit can be a bit dangerous. So it's good to have a basic understanding of marketing. But as you said, I think it's important to work with a professional. Who, who knows what they're doing and, and has been in the industry. You know, if you if you had to hire a lawyer, you would hire a lawyer. You would not try and do it yourself. If you wanted to build a house, you would hire someone, who a contractor, who can build that house for you. I'm sure that if you tried hard enough, you could dig a hole and, 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 and lay some bricks. But if you want it done professionally, you work with a professional. And I think that's the same for digital marketing. Be prepared to learn. It's good to have a basic knowledge so you have an idea of what's happening but trust your team, whether that's in-house or, or, or outsourced. Have a plan, trust your team. What a positive note to finish up on there. Thank you so much, Stuart, for your valuable insights on the show today. Fantastic. Thank you very much for having me. And viewers, if you've just joined us, we just had a very inspiring discussion with Mr. Stuart Pollington, the Managing Director at Smart Traffic. And you can view the full interview at Kalkine Media's YouTube channel later today. Please stay watching Kalkine TV for live market updates and more expert talks. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Good morning, Sage here, live from Kalkine Studio in Sydney, and you're watching The Early Trades, a show where we share a glimpse of the Australian share market's opening trading scenario, along with the global and domestic drivers triggering the market's momentum. So let's get started. And the S&P ASX 200 is up 0.8% in the early trade, with the materials sector being up 1.3%, and the tech sector up 1.2%. Mining giant Rio Tinto has given back 0.6% after cutting its financial year 2022 iron ore production guidance, while another mining giant, BHP, is up 2.3%. In the financial sector, investment company Pendle is down 7.8% after a disappointing September quarter, with platinum being down 5% on news of a big block trade sale. Another investment firm, Macquarie, is up 2.5% after broker Morgan Stanley hiked its price target 37% and said the bank deserved a green premium. Retailer Harvey Norman will trade X dividend for its fully franked 15 cents per share final dividend on Friday. Auto retailer Eagers Automotive and Hub24 are scheduled to pay their latest dividends later on Friday. Travel stocks are enjoying a good day after the New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet said it'll open its international borders to Australians and overseas citizens from November 1st on certain conditions. And travel agency Flight Centre is up 3.1% to $22.43. Airline Qantas is up 2.6% to $5.72. And the other travel agency's Webjet is up 2.4% and Hello World is also up 4.4%. And New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet said if the state is the only one open to the rest of the world, it will be a boom time. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones was up 1.4% and the S&P 500 ended 1.6% higher, while the Nasdaq finished up as well 1.65%. The U.S. stock market has been volatile in recent weeks amid concerns of inflation, rising energy costs and economic slowdown. Money managers interviewed by Wall Street's Journal have 
downplayed Thursday's rally, stressing that markets could expect a bumpier road ahead. On Thursday, the Labor Department said the U.S. jobless claims fell to 293,000 in the week ended 9th October from 329,000 in the previous week. Investment company Pendle's September quarter deal to acquire Thompson, Siegel and Wormsley has helped it hike funds under management from $106.7 billion to $139.2 billion. And Pendle's chief executive Nick Good said that for shareholders this is proving to be a value accretive acquisition. There was significant volatility in client sentiment leading to rebalancing of portfolios and profit taking, giving rise to outflows in a range of channels and strategies. Pendle shares are up 17.7% over the past year. Australian carrier Qantas says it has entered into binding agreements to sell surplus land in South Sydney's mascot to Logos Property Group for 802 million Australian dollars. And Qantas will lease back some of the land while arrangements are made to relocate some of the functions that the land is currently used for. Qantas Chief Executive Alan Joyce said they'll use these funds to help pay off debt built up during the pandemic. And the strength of this sale and its impact on the balance sheet means they can get back to investing in core parts of the business sooner. And Alan said the extended lockdowns and border closures of the past few months have been extremely tough, but this transaction adds to the growing momentum around its recovery. The Australian Securities and Investment Commission is suing insurance company IAG for misleading and deceptive conduct after offering around 600,000 customers discounts that were based on inflated premiums. The Australian Securities and Investments Commission alleges IAG subsidiary IAL used an algorithm to hike the gross insurance premiums of products to ensure the discounts would not fall below a certain level. And documents filed in the New South Wales Federal Court reveal the practice known as cupping led to around 60 million Australian dollars in discounts not being passed on. Iron ore miner Rio Tinto has blamed tough operating conditions for a difficult September quarter in cut financial year 2022's iron ore production guidance to between 320 to 325 million tonnes versus prior guidance between 325 to 340 million tonnes. And total Pilbara iron ore shipments in the September quarter was up 9% on the prior quarter. Copper production finished down 3% on the prior corresponding quarter. And Rio's chief executive Jacques Stossholm said it's been another difficult quarter and despite improvements, they recognise the opportunity to raise performance. And lastly, mining giant BHP's boss Mike Henry has backed its resolution copper partner Rio Tinto to reach an accord with Indigenous peoples in Arizona USA saying his company's move to hold separate talks with the local tribes was not a challenge to Rio's project leadership. Mr Henry told media that Rio Tinto is front and centre as manager of the project and BHP support their efforts. Henry also said that BHP believes it's appropriate to have some direct interaction but this shouldn't be read as BHP leading the charge. And thank you for joining us. But that's all for now in the early morning trade. Stay tuned to Calkine TV as we have many more shows lined up for you for sharing live updates across the economy, markets and sectors. Sage signing off. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. do you know about dark pools? Let's take a deep dive. Hey and thanks for tuning in, Holly Shields here for Calkine Media. Dark pools are private networks or private platforms that allow professional investors to trade stock on a large scale basis without revealing too many details. Because of this, a dark pool is often regarded as a dark pool liquidity or dark liquidity. Dark pools are precisely opposite to public financial markets as they are private platforms without any attention from the media. 
Dog pools keep the data about stocks private until the trade is executed. This is a favorable medium for investors like hedge funds and activist investors during situations when they do not want to reveal their strategy and the position they are taking. When the Securities and Exchange Commission or SEC allowed brokers to trade big blocks of shares in the 1980s, dark pools arose. Electronic trading and a 2007 SEC regulation aimed at increasing competition and lowering transaction costs have sparked an increase in the number of dark pools. Because dark pools are generally hosted within a huge corporation, they can demand cheaper fees than exchanges. Let's have a look at the types of dark pools. First of all, you've got broker-dealer-owned dark pools, which are the dark pools developed by broker-dealers for their clients and some of their proprietary traders. Some of the popular broker-dealer-owned dark pools include Crossfinder by Credit Suzy, SigmaX by Goldman Sachs, MS Pool by Morgan Stanley, and CityMatch by Citibank. The unique feature of broker-dealer-owned dark pools is that they derive their prices from the trade flow. As a result, they offer the feature of price discovery to their clients. Then you've also got the agency broker or the exchange-owned dark pool. The agency broker or exchange-owned dark pools act as agencies rather than the principal. Some of the famous agency brokers or exchange-owned dark pools include Instanet Liquidnet and IGT Posit. There is a price discovery for clients available in this type of dark pool. However, the prices are still derived from the flow of trades. For instance, the midpoint of national best bid and offer. And lastly, you've got electronic market makers dark pool. Independent operators like Getco and Knight mainly develop electronic market makers like dark pools. This type of dark pool operates as an independent platform with its own set of rules and guidelines. So how about the advantages of a dark pool? Firstly, private trading facilities. The privacy policy of dark pools enables the investors to keep their strategies secret that won't come out to the outer world, especially to its competitors. For example, in the public market, prices might cause an impact on people, whereas in a dark pool, it can easily be prevented due to its privacy policies. Secondly, avoiding price devaluation. Dark pools enable their investors to break down a huge stock into a smaller portion and sell this portion before their prices get devalued. Plus, increased market efficiency and liquidity. The high frequency trade and other algorithmic trade happening in the dark pools have proven to increase market efficiency and liquidity. Thus, unlike the public market, where liquidity can dry up very quickly, in the dark pool, HFT method has shown to increase both the market efficiency and liquidity. Now, there are also unfair advantages. That's right, dark pools are viewed as a medium where some investors receive an unfair leg up. Especially in high frequency trade, many investors gain an unfair advantage that others do not get. Unfair and unethical trade practices on the dark pool are also kept hidden. As for the limitations of dark pools, well, it comes down to mainly a lack of transparency. As dark pools are private platforms for stock sales, the details of the stocks are kept confidential until the execution of the sale happens. Dark pools operate their trading with very little or negligible insights as compared to public markets. It's often viewed as a limitation of the dark pool by the investors who buy those stocks. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to boost your financial IQ. If you like this info, please give us a like, share and a comment, and while you're at it, why not sub to our channel? This has been Holly Shields for Calcoin Media. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or 
treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Please subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified of Calkine's latest videos. Today's trending topic covers Mara and Riot, two crypto mining stocks catching the attention. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. In this video, we capture the reasons behind two crypto mining stocks catching the attention, Marathon Digital Holdings Inc. and Riot. Blockchain Inc. Marathon Digital Holdings Inc. Listed on the NASDAQ as Mara. Stock was up 10.03% and Riot Blockchain Inc. Listed on NASDAQ as Riot. Stock jumped 8.40% in the intraday trading on Monday. And Mara traded at US $43.45 and Riot was priced at $28 US at around 2.55 p.m. Eastern Time. Mara Digital Holdings Inc. Mara stock was up on Monday for no apparent reason and Marathon produced around 2,098 newly minted Bitcoins in the past 12 months to October 1st, 2021 and 1,252.4 new minted Bitcoins in the third quarter of 21. Mara's current Bitcoin holdings are approximately 7,035 Bitcoin. Beginning this month, the company also received a 100 million US dollar revolving line of credit from Silvergate Bank. Its cash and Bitcoin holdings were approximately worth 369.1 million US dollars and cash on hand position was 32.9 million US dollars. For the three months ended June 30th, 2021, the company earned revenue of 29.3 million US dollars compared to just 0.286 million US dollars in the same quarter in 2020. And the net loss was 109 million US dollars or $1.09 per diluted share, compared to a net loss of 2.16 million US dollars or 13 cents US per share diluted in the June quarter of 2020. The Las Vegas, Nevada headquartered company is involved in digital mining assets and Mara owns mining machines and a data center for crypto mining, including cryptocurrency. In addition, it operates blockchain segments in the digital asset space. And started in 2010, the company has a current market capitalization of US $4.37 billion. Riot Blockchain Inc. The Riot stock rallied on Monday as well and also for no apparent reason. And the Bitcoin mining and hosting company produced 406 Bitcoin in September, compared to 91 Bitcoin in September 2020. It produced 2,457 Bitcoins in the first nine months of this year. And for the June quarter 2021, Riot's revenue was 34.35 million US dollars compared to 1.94 million US dollars for the same period a year ago. The net income improved to 19.34 million US dollars against a net loss of 10.59 million US dollars in the June quarter of 2020. The net income per share diluted was 22 cents US compared to a net loss of 31 cents US per share diluted in the same quarter of 2020. This Castle Rock, Colorado based company builds and operates blockchain technologies. Its distributed blockchain technology or decentralized ledger provides a secure, efficient and permanent way of maintaining records. And founded in 2000, its current market cap is US $2.68 billion. Concluding this video now with these last points. With the increasing popularity of cryptocurrency, many crypto mining companies are popping up in the market. And likewise, Mara and Riot stocks also saw significant attention and remarkable growth 
this year. However, investors should evaluate the companies carefully before investing in the stocks. And if you like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below. We'd love to hear how your trading's going. If you've tried Mara and Riot, what are your thoughts? Please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to be notified of Calkine's latest videos. But for more information and regular updates, we do have a website. Check it out. It's calkinemedia.com. And my name is Sage for Calkine Media. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals in terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season 2 is set to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high-tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Man of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty Amongst Others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway, starring Tom Hanks, will have you calling out WILSON! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, 
last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. Surprise. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying, Serenity now! If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. If you're up for an adventure, there's hardly a better destination for it than right here in Australia and nearby New Zealand. Although interstate travel is still up in the air, as restrictions ease, no doubt you want to hit the road and explore the great outdoors. So here's our top adventure activities to stretch those post-lockdown muscles. First up, scuba diving. Ningalu Reef and the Great Barrier Reef. Fancy a swim with the whale sharks? Each year between April and July, you can witness a migration of whale sharks to Ningalu Reef. Don't worry though, because these sharks are docile and harmless and they only eat plankton, they're not aggressive. A more obvious underwater hotspot, the Great Barrier Reef is another thing scuba diving enthusiasts don't want to miss. It's the largest reef around the world. Over 2,300 kilometers hide the incredibly vivid creatures. Think dugons, seals, mesmerizing tropical fish, dozens of different corals, sponges and starfish, even dolphins and whales. There are daily trips organized from Port Douglas and Cairns so the experts can show you the best spots. And if you want a real adrenaline rush, make sure to head to South Australia and hop in a cage to dive with the great white sharks. It's in Port Lincoln, which is one of the best places to visit in the state. Next up, golfing, beachfront in Sydney. Going on an active holiday is becoming more and more popular as people love devoting their vacation days to learning a new skill while having fun. You can sign up for golf courses in Sydney and enjoy the most breathtaking place to make a hole in one. 
The beachfront in Sydney is specifically designed as a giant golf court with a club and a cafe you can unwind in. And while you're in the city, don't miss out on climbing the Sydney Harbour Bridge for an amazing panoramic view and photo opportunities. A similar hard pumping experience can be found at Gold Coast Skypoint Climb, where you get the climb, highest 270 metres external building in the country. Next, bungee jumping, Queenstown in New Zealand. Queenstown is the perfect place for adrenaline junkies and it's a natural place to stop for those New Zealand road trips. There are several spots for a bungee jump, but Kawaru Bridge may be the best one. It's actually a place where bungee jumping was born. The surreal turquoise river beneath, amazing surrounding nature and scenery will make your 43 meter high jump worthwhile. Another great option to try is the world's biggest swing just above the Nevis River, where you'll experience a height of 300 meters. Enjoy a guided hike, jet boating or parasailing and consider visiting the Queenstown Adventure Group to explore other often activities. Cycling. Soak in Australia on two wheels. If you have the mindset of an independent traveller and you want to explore off the grid paths, cycling is the best way to do it. Australia has an awesome outback just waiting for you. And if you're wondering what area to explore, well, it might be best to consider the weather conditions first. The northern area has a high humidity, both wet and dry seasons. The central part isn't suitable for cycling because it's the heart of the desert, basically. But a moderate climate is typical for the southern part, which is why Tasmania is a truly great place and it became a renowned area for cycling from Cradle Mountain to Bruni Island. There's a lot to see. Don't miss out on Freysenet National Park either, where you may get the opportunity to pat a few kangaroos. Explore other trails as well. There are many beautiful spots you can find on two wheels. And lastly, surfing. They don't call the Gold Coast a surfer's paradise for nothing. Exquisite beaches with the urban side back offer you a chance to enjoy amazing waves. Whether you choose to ride some waves at the Snapper Rocks Surfer Bank or Palm Beach, Nobby Beach or Broad Beach, you can have the opportunity to soak up the sun and raise your adrenaline levels. If you prefer a more natural surrounding, choose Noosa. You can also attend surfing lessons. The Gold Coast is packed with surfing schools and academies. Coaches usually work with a group of up to six people, but there's also an option for private lessons. Other great surfing spots include Victoria, New South Wales and Western Australia. So keep this in mind when you choose adventure hotspots for the coming season. Hello everyone, great to have your company on Calkine TV. I'm Sage and you're watching The Buzzing Trends. And today's topic is SafePal Crypto and its price prediction. The crypto has been making large strides in the market and has enjoyed a bull run off late. And ever since it announced to work with DreamQuest for its Dream Airdrop, the market has been abuzz with activities. And the SafePal crypto has slowly but surely consolidated after seeing a low of 82 cents US on September 28th. The news of it working with DreamQuest on October 12th led the coin to climb over 140%, catching the eye of the investors. And SafePal, launched in 2018, helps the users grow the digital assets and provides security to ensure the safety of the funds. Backed by Binance, the SafePal crypto operates on the Binance Smart Chain protocol and was introduced to offer users a full end-to-end -end crypto wallet experience. Besides Binance Smart Chain, the SafePal wallet supports other blockchain assets such as Ethereum, Tron and others. The users can use the wallet services to trade, store and grow their portfolio without compromising on security. But what makes SafePal Crypto unique? Founded by Veronica Wong, the SafePal Crypto comes across as an affordable hardware wallet along with the software wallet and the users can trade in multiple cryptocurrencies such as bitcoins, ethereum, bnb and more. The users can take advantage of the SafePal crypto to avail discounts and can also enjoy extra yields on various SafePal earn and lending programs. The SafePal crypto also offers the holders incentives such as token airdrops from ecological partners and staking rewards to its users. The token can also be exchanged with other assets and can be utilised as a mode of payment and gives voting rights to the users. 
So now, let us take a look at how SafePal is faring in the markets. And SafePal is ranked 246 on coin market cap, and it was trading at US $2.43 with a 24-hour trading volume of around 737 million. Now, the SafePal crypto has enjoyed a bullish run of late. The investors would do well to cash in on the wave at the moment. And provided the bull run lasts, it could well reach its all-time high mark of US $4.39 by the end of the year. And the market experts are predicting that the rally will continue even in the next year as well. So overall, the market sentiment indicates a positive wave for SafePal. And as the wallet offers multiple cryptos to trade, it gives the users wide options to choose from and supports other blockchain networks. This could be a viable investment option, considering its growth and investors would do well to make the most of it in the wave at the moment. Thank you for joining us, and that's all for now. We will be back soon with our Buzzing Trends show to share the latest market insights with you, and we hope you got more insights about SafePal Crypto after that report. Until then, stay tuned with CalKind for more stock, business, and economy-related hot trends. Sage signing off. Hi there, James Preston for CalKind TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. CalKind's TechBeat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The TechBeat, exclusive to CalKind TV. Please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos. Today's trending topic covers saddled by credit card debt. These are three tips to help you deal with it. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Want to know how to deal with credit card debt? Watch this video with us as we provide three tips to help you deal with your credit card debt. Life is uncertain and it might throw your way unexpected circumstances. There might come a time when you run short of cash to meet your basic needs, such as food and utilities, and such a situation generally arises due to job loss or pay cuts during economic recessions. And in such situations, a credit card can come to your rescue. And as a result of the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, many people have found themselves caught in the credit card debt trap in the recent past. And many have not been able to fully return to work. In addition, rising inflation has further hit the economy. In case you are currently sitting on a credit card debt pile, here are three ways you can employ to get rid of it by as soon as the end of the year. Time to tighten the purse strings and follow a strict budget. Experts always advise to follow a monthly budget to avoid falling in the debt trap. But if you have already landed in debt, then you need to tighten the purse strings as soon as possible. And this way you are less likely to overspend and also save money to repay your loans in a timely manner. It's also high time to find room to cut back on your spending, such as doing away with your monthly club membership and many other expenses that could be slashed in that particular situation. Heard of the money envelope system? Well, money envelope system is an age-old strategy to allocate physical cash to each of your monthly budget items. It helps individuals who lack discipline to limit themselves inside the stipulated budget. And the idea includes preparing envelopes with each of your expenses at the start of the month and judiciously using the allocated money towards specific requirements. And once the money is spent, it's gone forever. Thus, 
you will always have to think before spending the funds allocated to one envelope for a different expense. Extra monthly payment. Borrowers are generally in the habit of monthly billing cycles. However, there is no such requirement to wait to pay until payment due dates. In addition, you aren't restricted to make just one payment every month. Credit card interest is compounded daily. The finance charges accrued are based on the account's average daily balance. So you can make two payments a month in case you are paid every two weeks or bi-monthly if you're paid more often. You can do the same more regularly. And if you do like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. You'll be notified of Kalkine's latest videos. But for more information and regular updates, we do have a website. It's kalkinemedia.com. And this is Sage for Kalkine Media. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Hello and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks on Kalkine TV. I'm James Preston and in this edition we're taking an in-depth look at the world of sports commentary. Commentary has been a staple of sports broadcasting for 100 years since the first live commentary on radio in 1921. An award-winning sports presenter and commentator Michael Chiavello has recently released a book called The Commentators, which takes a look at the profession and how it has forever changed the way we consume sport. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to now welcome Michael to the show. Michael, hello. James, thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. Michael, great to have you here with us. Without giving too much away, obviously the commentators is about the, the art of sport commentary, but how do you approach that in the book? Is it a case of a historical timeline view, or do you break it down via specific commentators? It's actually a little bit of both. I, I look at the history of sports commentary, which, as you mentioned, started on April 11, 1921, when a man named Florent Gibson, who was a, uh, a, a journalist, a newspaper journalist in Philadelphia, attended a boxing event and called the first live radio commentary of this boxing event. And ever since then, of course, commentary has been the, the, the soundtrack of our lives for so many of us. And in the book, I look at the history, but also I break down over 60 of the greatest sports events throughout history and the commentators who made those events all the more exciting and emphatic and iconic that have left an indelible imprint in our minds. So, you know, you, you think of great World Cups and Rugby World Cups and cricket and Super Bowls and Stanley Cups and the NBA, and it's all in the book, breaking them down and the commentators associated with them. Well, Michael, we'll get your take on the best piece of sports commentary a little later in the interview itself, because I know there are so many fantastic ones to choose from, which, as you mentioned there, they elevate the entire occasion. So it's always a fantastic treat when we get a particularly brilliant piece of commentary. But how did the idea come about for the book itself? I've been a sports commentator, James, for 30 years. And besides loving my job as a commentator, I'm broadcast to over 154 countries. I just love the art of commentary. I love good commentary. Sometimes I'll watch a sport I'm not even interested in just to listen to the commentators and see how they do their jobs. And I'm blown away by, you know, guys like Bruce McAvaney and the late George Gould Usage and Dennis Kometi and, you know, the late Richie Benno, Bill Laurie, so many great Australian commentators in particular that we've had over the years. And when I was researching uh, this book, 
I stumbled on that date that it was actually this year was celebrating the 100th anniversary. I thought, wow, what better time to do a book about the profession of sports commentary than celebrating the 100 years? So, uh, you know, it, it took me about uh, nine months to write. Uh, the team at Wilkinson Publishing, who do some fantastic books, got right behind the idea. And uh, we released only uh, uh, yesterday and already going uh, uh, guns blazing. And I'm really proud with it because I think this is a, a lasting tribute to so many great commentators, both male and female from all over the world who have given myself, yourself and all your viewers so many great memorable moments. Yeah, spot on the money there. Now, let's talk about your commentary experience yourself. You mentioned 30 years there. Well, within that space of time, you've won the equivalent of an Emmy in the Asian Television Awards for your commentary. So let's break it down a little bit. What sports do you commentate and what, in your opinion, makes for a great commentator? Well, I commentate mostly fight sports. My career began with uh, track and field and then moved into football or commentary, uh, commentary of soccer, football, and then moved into fight sports, something I fell into and I've been in ever since. So at the moment, I broadcast for Asia's largest sports media property called One Championship, uh, where Nielsen rated amongst the four most watched sports on the planet. I think wow. we're only behind, uh, I think it's EPL, IPL, NBA, and then it's us. Uh, so the ratings are massive, uh, broadcast to 154 countries on terrestrial TV worldwide. And, um, you know, I love it. We're doing shows every couple of weeks at the moment out of Singapore. I'm off again to Singapore in a couple of weeks' time. And I always try and do my best. And what I think, to answer your other question, makes a good sports commentary is you've got to be researched. You've got to know about what you're talking about, what sport you're doing, what athletes you're covering. You've got to know how to be a storyteller. It's very important to tell a story in any sort of media, but particularly as a sports commentator. But most of all, James, and I think this applies to any profession, especially the media profession, you need to have passion, you need to have enthusiasm, and you need to deliver with confidence. I always tell young up and coming sports commentators, you've got to own Everything you say on radio, on television, on a podcast, whatever your platform may be, you've got to own it, be confident, be enthusiastic and make it yours. And I think they are the best attributes of a, a sports commentator. I ask this question in the book to the experts, guys like Vin Scully and Tim Neverett and BBC's John Murray and the great Peter Drury. And a lot of people think, well, you need a good voice first and foremost to be a commentator, but you really don't. And most of the experts agreed with me that passion and enthusiasm are the two main attributes to be good at pretty much anything in life, but especially at sports commentary. So this is brilliant. Not only are we getting an insight on how to conduct proper sports commentary, this is basically like life lessons. It's like listening to Jordan Peterson at the moment. Clean your room. Make sure that you're getting everything right in your own life before you can progress. So I love it, mate. There's plenty of passion in what you're talking about. That is for sure. Now, another thing that I've noticed, certainly, and I think a lot of people would too, if they just you know peel the curtain back a little bit and look at how commentary is done. In the last decade or so, we've seen some huge technological advancements on, on how it is actually conducted. Now, for those who aren't aware, could you go through some of the changes whether it be commentating from a remote location or any other technological developments that have occurred in the space? Well, it's really interesting the developments that have happened over the last 18 months since the onset of COVID because the whole sports commentary world, like the rest of the world, was just thrown into to panic, to pandemonium. And we had to come to terms with how do we broadcast sport when we can no longer have full arenas? Uh, we at One Championship were actually the first sports organisation in February last year to do a closed door event. We were the litmus test for so many other sports organizations around the world. We did a closed door event at the Singapore Indoor Stadium that usually holds 16, 17,000 people. And once we did it successfully, the likes of WWE, NBA, NFL, EPL, IPL, all came on board and started doing closed door events. But the challenges are with uh, commentators being in separate bubbles. I am isolated at these events from my co-commentator. So <laughs> he's gonna sit at a different part of the arena to me. He's using a remote camera in front of him. I'm using a remote camera in front of me. So there's no physical cameraman or camera person in front of us. The remote is being uh, operated from a separate facility and it tracks us, which is what you're seeing on the television when we're hosting the event to you. Uh, you know, just a lot of complications we've never had to deal with. And of course, when you're commentating with no live audience and as commentators, mm. James, we're used to feeding off the energy of the live audience yep. without that there. When you could hear a pin drop, 
you've got to bring yourself still to the occasion. You can't do the proverbial, you know, golf commentary where it's very silent, especially if you're doing an exciting sport like fighting or wrestling or, you know, football or soccer. You've got to bring yourself to the occasion. So there were a lot of battles for commentators to overcome and for producers and directors to overcome who were forced to have their commentators work remotely. I've done commentary at home. The great Peter Drury, who commentated the UEFA Euro Championships last month, who did all the EPL last year, the Champions League last year. Well, he says in the book that he was commentating most of it from his bedroom at home with his family in the next room. I mean, this is broadcast <laughs> to millions worldwide. The greatest sports commentator on the planet, Peter Drury in soccer, was commentating in his bedroom. So these are the sorts of issues we, we've had to overcome. Yeah, pretty crazy stuff. I mean, we often talk about, you know, in radio shows, if there's a breakfast program, for example, and, you know, maybe Kyle and Jack Yo, he heads off to Queensland, then they do it remotely via tie line. So the chemistry can sometimes be quite difficult in that sense. But it's a whole new kettle of fish, really, because you're talking there about the lack of an audience, which gives so much the overall sound output and the audio quality and the commentary itself. What, one thing we have seen, for example, is, especially in the NRL, they've been bringing in, for example, crowd sound effects on Fox Sports. Do you, do you like that development, or for you, is it more a case you of know, should we leave it as it is? You know what? We never used it at one championship, and it's a shame we, we haven't, because I do quite like it depending on the sport. I like it for football, for soccer. I think it's worked very well for soccer. Uh, because you're used to the, the the sound the sound of a crowd in an indoor stadium is different to the sound of a crowd in a soccer outdoor stadium where you've got 50 60 thousand people at a premier league game uh they used it for the major league baseball last year of course and one of the contributors to the book is tim neverett now tim was the announcer of the la dodgers who won the world series in 2020 and he talks at depth in the book about the problems here to overcome as a World Series winning announcer commentating the LA Dodgers and getting used to the piped sound they'd use at Dodgers Stadium, getting used to the piped sound that he'd be brought in over his headphones from other stadiums around America when he was, he was commentating remotely, and also getting used to seeing fake cutout audiences mm. in the crowd at Dodgers Stadium, which he wasn't used to. And of course, you know, problems with tracking the ball when you're not in the stadium, you can't see the ball and it goes off shot, off camera, and the director's not quick enough to catch it. I mean, there were so many difficulties, but someone like Tim Neverett, someone like Peter Drury, John Murray uh, are all just such professionals. They, they overcame it, but it's definitely been a challenge. Now, Michael, for me, my favourite piece of commentary comes from a classic NRL match between South and the Roosters where Warren Smith describes a match-winning try with, you can take me now, I've seen it all. Now, <laughs> what for you is the single best piece of commentary that's ever been delivered? It is such a hard question uh, to answer, James, because there are so many. The one for me, there's only one piece of commentary in the book that I say is the perfect commentary in history. It's by a guy named Vin Scully. Vin Scully had a 67-year career calling baseball for the LA Dodgers, who before them were the Brooklyn Dodgers. But in 1965, he called Sandy Koufax's perfect game. And it's on YouTube. Check it out. It goes for 8 minutes 45. It's 1,064 words of sheer perfection from Vin Scully. This guy is such a legend that President Obama awarded him the highest award for an American citizen, that being Presidential Medal of Freedom. He's got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Dodger Stadium in LA is located on Vin Scully Avenue. <laughs> and the character Dana Scully on The X-Files was actually named by Chris Carter as Dana Scully because of Vin Scully, and I'm so happy that Vin Scully, and I'm not being biased here, but he is also a contributor to the book. He's now 94 years old, and he is voted by the American Sportscasters Association as the greatest commentator of all time. So go to YouTube, check it out. It's, it's there, Sandy Koufax's perfect game, 1965, Cubs versus Dodgers, and it's, it's sheer commentary perfection. Well, Michael, I'll absolutely be checking that out. And just before I let you go, how can we check out the book? Where can we get the commentators? Please do check it out, guys. You are going to love it no matter what sport you like. It's available through all good booksellers right now. Go to Booktopia, Book Depository, Amazon, WilkinsonPublishing.com.au. Wherever good books are found or sold, you'll find the commentators. And I really do hope you enjoy it because commentary really has been the soundtrack of our lives. Absolutely. Michael, been great to have a chat with you, and I understand you do have some uh, duties with Singapore, so we'll have to let you go so you can get through all the testing there for yet another remote broadcast. But hopefully that all goes well, and hopefully we can also have another chat quite soon. 
James, thank you, mate. It'll be my pleasure, and thank you so much for having me on Calcon TV. That's Michael Chavello, an award-winning sports presenter and author of The Commentators. And if you missed any part of that interview or you'd like to browse our extensive catalogue of expert talks, simply head across to the YouTube channel Kalkine Media. I'm James Preston, signing off for Kalkine. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm your host, Sage, and today we have with us Mr. Paul Greenberg, the chairperson of My Deal. And today's expert will share insights on helming the ship for the Australian retail platform, connecting millions of consumers with thousands of Australian retailers, and they are dedicated to providing customers with the best prices and the biggest range of products. They've been at the heart of the Australian lives since 2011. So as you know, we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And today we're very lucky to share some space with Mr. Paul Greenberg, chairperson at My Deal. Welcome, Paul. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to meet you. And with your experience, I'm glad we've got some time to share your insights on the show today. And I'm pleased to share with the audience that My Deal has increased its revenue by 150% in financial year 21. This represents a significant moment in My Deal's history. So, Paul, what were the key strategies that helped My Deal reach this milestone, please? Yeah, thank you. It's been a very, very solid year for us. Well, one of the first catalysts was our, our listing on the Australian Stock Exchange in October uh, of 2020. Uh, 20. And so we've been, you know, almost a year now, coming up to our year anniversary, which gave us obviously a very solid balance sheet and the support of a, a great group of investors. From that flowed naturally talent acquisition, uh, technology investment and innovation, and of course, uh, you know, investment in strategy. And, uh, and product a bit ahead of the curve. And it's all coming together. Retail is still detail. So there's a lot of things that the team are doing very well indeed. Fantastic and congratulations. And you. those significant numbers are proving that your public listing was definitely worth the effort that goes into doing something like that. And your ticket code just for the audience, please, is that MYD? It is indeed, thank you. Yes. Beautiful. Well, you successfully launched your native iOS and Android mobile apps in May. Please discuss the prominent features of the app that make it unique in the online retail industry, please. Of course. Well, I think we all know we're living in a sort of a mobile first environment. I mean, who would have picked it? I've been in e-commerce for such a long time. And I remember sort of 15 years ago or you know, more talking, of, you know, talking about mobile optimised you know, was the way to go. Now it's mobile first, maybe one day mobile only, you know, who knows. But to your question around the features of the app, I would actually have to say that as always, the best apps are the simplest apps. They're easy to use. Uh, they've got all the features that the customer needs, but not too many. So uh, we finding the feedback from our uh, shoppers and from our adoption of the app is just showing that it's a very, very powerful simple way to shop my deal and uh, with everyone sort of having uh, you know a, a smartphone on them 
uh, it's just a fast, very fast growing customer acquisition and retention tool. Marvellous. And, and you've seen your customers um, increase significantly, your customer base has increased significantly this year as well. And it's probably because of the user-friendly technology that is related to your brand, um, amongst other things, of course. And Paul, you've seen the online retail industry reach new heights. And being a lover of online retail, please talk about the ultimate relationship between retail and technology. How are you able to bring these excellent deals to the retailers and the consumers? And how has it evolved over the years in the Australian market? place? That's a great question and, and it probably requires <clears throat> a fairly long answer but I think if I have to synthesize it all you know what my deal all, is all about is the scalability of a marketplace. We've got over a thousand very very strong and nimble and agile sellers who are bringing wonderful deals every day to our customers but that is all but the scalability of a marketplace has to be wrapped around the consistency of a customer experience. You know, all too often marketplaces just grow too big and uh, the customer experience can be somewhat, uh, I wouldn't say uh, patchy, but it can be very uh, erratic and very different. At my deal, the team focused very hard on ensuring, you know, a very consistent experience across the thousand sellers and really focusing on educating and ensuring best practice uh, for our shoppers. And I think that really has been the combination, the scalability of a marketplace with the consistency of a very solid customer experience. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your insights there. And you mentioned acquiring the best talent possible as well to keep the cogs and screws turning at my deal. So in your opinion, how does investment in technology and innovation benefit the retail owners in the present day scenario, please? Yeah, indeed. Well, customers are moving very quickly and, and you know, we've always said uh, in retail, the customer is king or queen. And I think that's really uh, more so than ever. And anything that sort of removes the friction for shoppers, but at the same time can help retailers grow their business is what I call retail tech. And it's a very fast growing uh, part of the retail ecosystem. Um, so, you know, we're all shoppers, you know, think of all those, those, those um, impediments uh, to our shopping journey and our path to purchase. It's just wonderful to see smart retail tech companies tackling that head on. And, you know, my deal is really at the core of it is a, is a retail tech company because we've got some of the very best marketplace technology, which is proprietary, which we built internally, uh, Sean Sinvert now, our founder and his wonderful team have built this proprietary marketplace technology, which really creates this cohesive ecosystem for retailers uh, to harness the power of many and our fast growing you know, business and our fast growing customer account. But in the broader retail ecosystem, there's a big focus on retail technology, um, which I think is fantastic. And you know, whether it's an in-store technology solution uh, that's helping um, the business grow and removing the uh, pain point of shopping, that's great whether it's the rise of buy now, pay later, which has really reinvented the lay-by system, which was very clunky, you know, whether it's refunds and return solutions, you know, the power of the end mile, collaborative consumption technology, and the sharing economy. There's so many things on the play at the moment, Sage, that it's, it's almost hard to keep up, but it's very exciting. It certainly is. And to think that you've pushed through all the economic downturns and supply chain delays that were associated with the last 12 to 18 months that we've just seen and really come through with some amazing figures. Um, it definitely shows that your strategy and planning has some clout behind it. But moving on, Paul, COVID-19 has accelerated the adoption of online shopping as we know. So how did the Australian retail industry, in your opinion, deal with the sudden change and how does the industry's future look to you? Yeah, well, that's, uh, I think that's a really good point. You know, the COVID-19 certainly has given a, an uplift to, to the online retailers like my deal. But I'd, I'm, I'm pleased to say that, you know, I wear another hat. I'm the founder of the National Online Retailers Association and the non-executive chairman, uh, that retailers across the board from our largest you know, an established, uh, you know, bricks and mortar retailers have also adopted and invested uh, very heavily in technology over this period. I think all the CEOs would uh, would argue that there's been a massive acceleration in the investment 
of technology to really harness this changing uh, face of retail. So I would say that we've got to give Australian retailers a very good report card, maybe as high as an 8 out of 10 uh, for the way they've managed the challenges over the last two years. And of course, I'm very bullish that when we come out the other side, which of course we will, that we'll be very well equipped as an industry to take the momentum on. What is clear, though, that online retailers would love things to return to to a normality. We uh, we recognise that we've benefited, if you like, uh, from uh, the COVID scenario because people have seen the benefit, the safety, the convenience, the value of home shopping. But you know, we really think that uh, we'd love a, a normal economy, and we'll continue to see this acceleration in uh, in online retail and digital retail. Yes, of course. I completely understand what you mean. And thank you for sharing the insider's perspective there. Yes, it could be somewhat of a pandemic digital bubble um, that we're experiencing. It must be hard to forecast with these figures for future projections. So we have to start winding up the discussion there, Paul. Um, but what is My Deal's outlook for building the brand further in financial year 2022? Would you like to share some insights on that? Yeah, thank you very, very much for the opportunity. Well, naturally, you know, we're excited. We've had a very solid year and, and that looks set to continue. Uh, and, the, you know, the, the investments in talent and technology are really starting to pay, uh, pay off. So I would say in summary, we're going to see the continued growth of my deal. You'll see a lot more uh, recognized brands coming on board because a lot of the tier one brand owners uh, see the benefits of getting onto a marketplace journey that's going really well. You'll see the growth of our Duke Living, um, you know, uh, house brand strategy or private label strategy. Duke Living will continue to grow. Um, and who knows, perhaps you'll see some natural adjacencies uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the retail journey. Um, we'll have to see, but I can tell you that Sean Senvertna and his team are working very hard and are very engaged in the opportunity. So uh, we're, we're feeling very good about things and feeling very privileged and blessed to be in this space. Absolutely. It's a very exciting time to talk to you right now. And thank you so much for joining us today, Paul. I'm sure your valuable insights have been enjoyed by the viewers. And hopefully the viewers will jump on my deal to find a tempting deal that might suit them as well. Um, and thank you, viewers, for watching. If you've just joined us, we had a very inspiring discussion with Mr. Paul Greenberg, the chairperson at My Deal. The full recorded interview will be available from Kalkine Media's YouTube channel, so please do check it out. And keep watching Kalkine TV for more live market commentaries and expert talks. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, 
Join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calkine TV. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. Holly Shields here reporting live from Calcon Studio in Sydney where it's lunchtime. And that means it's time for the Moon Market Pulse. In today's show we'll have a look at the overall Australian share market performance by the mid-session trade and then explore the biggest winners and losers of the day like ARB Corp, Hub24, WiseTech, Pendle, Elders, Platinum and others. Then we'll wrap it up by looking at the stocks including Rio, BHP, Pendle Group, Qantas, Macquarie and many more that have grabbed headlines today. So to kick off, the Australian shares continue to trade higher by the afternoon, albeit pairing half of the early gains. Led by gains in tech and mining stocks, the market witnessed broad-based buying following positive cues from Wall Street. The rebound in growth-driven tech stocks and a spurt in commodity prices supported the market gains. The benchmark index ASX 200 gained 0.34% by lunchtime. The index opened high today and rose as much as 0.84%, tracking overnight gains in Wall Street. Meanwhile, the U.S. stocks ended higher on Thursday amid a strong earnings report by the likes of Bank of America and United Health. Investors were cautiously optimistic after President Joe Biden signed into law a bill raising the U.S. debt limit until early December. The House approved the $480 billion increase in the country's borrowing ceiling on Tuesday after the Senate approved it for a party-line vote last week. Back on Wall Street, the Dow Jones rose 1.4 percent, the S&P 500 gained 1.6 percent and the Nasdaq Composite settled 1.65 percent higher. Back home on the sectoral front, 9 of 11 sectoral indices were trading higher as the IT sector emerged as the biggest gainer for the second day, rising 1.5 percent following overnight gains in its U.S. counterpart, Nasdaq. The tech sector was followed by materials, which traded 1.3 percent higher, just as mining stocks extended their rally for the second day owing to a rise in commodity prices. Among others, healthcare, consumer discretionary, energy, telecom, a REIT and industrials also traded higher with modest gains. Although bucking the bullish trend, consumer staples sector emerged as the worst performer with a 0.75% loss. Then the utility sector also traded lower with marginal losses. To the COVID-19 front now and the state of New South Wales has reported 399 new local cases and four deaths in the past 24 hours. In a major policy change, the state has decided to scrap quarantine for fully vaccinated international travellers from the 1st of November. Unvaccinated travellers, on the other hand, will still have to enter hotel quarantine. New South Wales is the first state to remove quarantine for international travellers. And since March of 2020, all states and territories have required all overseas passengers to quarantine in hotels at their own expense for 14 days. Meanwhile, Victoria continues to see a spike in locally acquired cases as it registered over 2,000 infections and six deaths on Friday. The death toll for the current Delta outbreak stands at 131, and there are now over 21,000 active cases of the virus in the state of Victoria. Despite the rise in cases, the state government remained on track to remove COVID-19 curbs next week as it will achieve its vaccination targets. Now for a look at the top gainers and losers by the mid-session trade. Well, the winner on the ASX pack today was automobile and components manufacturer ARV Corp, which rose a staggering 6.7%. Some of the other notable gainers include investment platform Hub24, software firm WiseTech Global, Minor Oz Minerals and gambling company Star Entertainment Group. On the flip side, though, diversified financial group Pendle emerged as the top laggard with a 10.9% loss. Some of the other worst performers were food, beverage and tobacco business Elders, asset management platform Platinum and Aussie winemaker Treasury Wine Estates, as well as retailer Harvey Norman. Well, with that said, it's time now for a short break, but stay tuned because I'll be right back on the other side with more trending market updates.
Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Hello and welcome back. Holly Shields here live from Sydney and you're watching the Moon Market Commentary. Let's check out the stocks that are creating a buzz on the ASX today. And the first on our radar is investment banking giant Macquarie Group. The share price of the company gained 2.5% to hit a fresh high of 187.4 by the mid-session after a brokerage firm hiked its price target. Morgan Stanley has raised its price target by 37% to $240, saying that the lender deserved a green premium. Macquarie shares gained 5.25% in the last one month and 18.7% over a six-month period. Well, next is a global investment business Pendle Group, which dropped nearly 9%. The share price dropped despite rises in the funds under management for the September quarter. FUM jumped by 30.5% to $139.2 billion from $106.7 billion in the June quarter. The Aussie business saw a record quarter of flows through the higher margin wholesale channel, with strong net inflows in the Australian large cap, sustainable multi-asset and fixed income funds. The company said that the acquisition of Thomson, Siegel and Wormsley helped it raise FUM. And meanwhile, shares of Qantas Airways climbed nearly 4% on a deal to sell its surplus land in South City's mascot for $802 million. Australia's largest airline by fleet size has inked a pact with the consortium led by Logos Property Group for a sale of 13.8 hectares of land in Mascot. The fund proceeds will be used to reduce debt and accelerate the airline's recovery. The company plans to reach net debt target by the end of 2022. All this as the transaction remains subject to some conditions, while settlement of most of lots is expected in the first half of this financial year. Shares of blue-chip miner Rio Tinto dropped over 1% after it lowered its full-year target for shipments of the steel-making raw material from Western Australia. The company said in an exchange filing that it now expects Pilbara shipments of iron ore to be 320 million tonnes to 325 million in the 12 months to December 31, which is actually lower than the previous target of up to 340 million tonnes. The drop-in shipment target was attributed to a delay in completion of the new greenfield mine at the Gadai, Dari and Robe Valley Brownfield Mine Replacement Project due to the tight labour market in Western Australia. And shares of BHP Group rose 2.5% after shareholders endorsed the company's climate transition strategy. The details from BHP's annual general meeting in London revealed that 83% of shareholders supported the climate change plan. Aussie shareholders will be voting on the climate plan at a meeting in Melbourne on the 11th of November. The company has previously set a target to cut direct operational emissions by 30% before the year's end, before the end of the decade, sorry, and hit a net zero emission by the year 2050. Well, with that said, that is a wrap for now on the Mid-Market Pulse, but keep watching Calcine TV for more trending market updates from Australia and around the world. Holly Shields signing off. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV.
Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Hello, I'm James Presson, and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks on Calkine TV. Today, we're shining a light on Savvy SME, an online platform empowering business owners to make smarter decisions, attract more customers, and find the right connections to succeed. To talk more about the company, Jeremy Britton, a Savvy SME influencer in consulting and strategy, now joins us. Jeremy, a very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, James. Thanks for having me on. Well, Jeremy, great to have you all the way from sunny Brisbane, looking beautiful in the background there as well. Now, I've had a little look about Savvy SME, and one of the things you talk about is flick your rich switch. Now, one, how do I find this switch and turn it on as I'm tired of not being a millionaire? And more to the point, how has this helped your clients achieve more health, wealth, and happiness? It's, it's an interesting psychological thing. Like, a lot of people will actually say to you, success is 80%. Uh, attitude and psychology and 20% strategy but most of the business books that you pick up are just teaching you more and more and more strategy so you know I think there was like a hundred million people who went out and bought the book the four-hour work week but how many people are actually working a four-hour work week <laughs> and it, it's one of those things where it's like what you believe is possible is possible if you don't believe it's possible then it doesn't matter, doesn't matter how many strategies you learn it's not going to work for you. I, I wrote an article a couple of years ago called The Amish Eye Open. And as we know, the Amish don't have access to TV and technology. If you went and asked these guys, what's the fastest speed you can go? They can say, I can run at three miles an hour. Or I can get in my horse and go 12 miles an hour. But once you take them to the city and show them they can go 60 miles an hour or 100 miles an hour, mm. they start to think, OK, this is, this is amazing. This is totally different. And the interesting thing is with, with my field with investing and things like that, you say to someone, what's the best investment return you, you can get? And they say, oh, you know, I get 3% income on my stocks or, you know, last year my, my cryptocurrency doubled. But then you go back to the Amish guy and you say, what's the best investment return you can get? And he says, well, I can plant one ear of corn and I can grow 2,000 ears of corn. So he, he's making 200,000%. It's, it's, it's all about perspective, and once you understand how the mind works and how you've been conditioned by your society, then you start to realise, you know, a lot of us went to school. A lot of us, you know, we were taught by employees. Most of our parents were employees and taught us the way to get successful, the way to make more money is to work more hours because you get paid by the hour. Hmm. But someone who's got an entrepreneurial mindset who was brought up by Richard Branson or, or the boys from Google knows that you don't have to work more hours. And this is the thing the Tim Ferriss book was about. You could work four hours a week and still make thousands and thousands of dollars, but you first you've got to believe that you can. And most of us have been conditioned so much by our society. We've been conditioned so much by our upbringing and our schooling system that we literally don't think it's possible. If you, if you don't think it's possible, you're not going to be looking for ways to do it. And whatever strategies you try are not going to work. So it's 80% it's mindset, but the, the trick is actually getting the mindset. And this is where I've had 13 of my own startups. I've, I've learned a lot of stuff. Um, I've been a business coach for many years. But the, the thing that really opened my eyes was actually doing courses in hypnosis and meditation. Um, after I was highly stressed as a financial planner and, and sold my business, I just wanted to take some time to relax. And hanging out with people who were Buddhist monks and psychologists and this sort of stuff. And you know, you, you know yourself, you can hypnotize someone, convince them they're a duck or a chimpanzee. And I wondered, what if I could hypnotize someone to think they were a millionaire? 
and then they would start reacting to the world differently. When they're walking down the street and they're seeing shops closed and going, oh, it's, it's really sad that business closed down. But when you're thinking like a millionaire, you go, there's an opportunity. Perhaps I could get this shop rental cheap. Perhaps I could start a new business in this area where a business just closed down. So I actually studied a diploma in hypnotherapy in addition to my diploma in financial planning. And I started to hypnotize some of my clients just as an experiment, like what could possibly go wrong? And some people increased their income by more than five times within the space of six months. Some people tripled their number of clients within the space of several weeks just by thinking differently on a subconscious level. It's really quite amazing. Well, Jeremy, I've always been really interested with what Peter Powers, for example, does in being able to hypnotize people on the spot and then go to sleep. So I actually think I would be volunteering to have you hypnotize me if it means I can get five times my worth. I'm all about that. I've seen Office Space as well. Very fun movie. It also, you know, changed the entire perspective of, of the people involved with it. But you're right. So much of it comes down to perspective. We've talked in the past, for example, about uh, the four-minute mile. The first time that was done, mm. it was seemingly impossible. And then once it was done, we had, I think, 12 people do it over the next 12 months. So it's all about, as you say, more. mindset, perspective, and then moving on from that point. So. As part of that, we have to move on as well to exactly what you're doing. I mean, you, you've mentioned it as well, uh, talking about being a business coach. So let's let's delve a little bit more into some of your coaching hints and tips. What are the telltale signs of a, a great business coach in the modern day? Does it have to, for example, involve things like uh, hypnotizing people or is it still built on fundamentals? Hypnotizing people is a very valuable skill and if you can find someone who actually balances their, their left brain analytical mind with their, with their right mind then that's fantastic if you can get someone who does that. There's not too many people out there with twin diplomas in, in different fields. Um, but there's a lot of people unfortunately who can go away and do a weekend course and you know in a weekend you can learn to become a real estate, estate agent, in a weekend you can learn how to become a business coach but there's not very many people who have actually got the runs on the board in mm. those. So I suggest to people, you know, when you're choosing a business coach, ask them the question, what other businesses have you owned apart from being a business coach? Because you need someone with experience in retail and service and different hospitality businesses and things like that, and has actually run their own business apart from just the business of being a coach. And one of the other things is, you know, I've found out myself, it's very easy to start a business. It's comparatively easy to keep the business running, but the really difficult thing is being able to sell a business. So if you can find a business coach who's managed to build a business up and then sell it mm. as it's still going, that's absolutely gold. Well, I mean, you've simplified it a lot more than I actually thought you would based on the <laughs> hypnotherapy sessions. <laughs> I can we were give you more before. if you like. But, but that's, that's very much straight down the line. It actually seems quite simple when you think about it that way. But um, if, we, if we also have a look at some of the tools that we see super wealthy people utilize. I mean, you mentioned there, one of the goals is to obviously build up a business and then get it to a point where it is saleable, which is a very important point because if no one's buying it, then you can't make the money. So what are some incredible tools that are used by super wealthy people worldwide, which you believe others can draw inspiration from? It's, it's definitely a mindset thing. And you know, a lot, a lot of people read the book, Think and Grow Rich and go, you know, I can just think about things and, and I'll grow rich. But you're thinking from your old perspective, which again is being an employee and being taught by employees how to become an employee. So the original title of the book was, I think, Meditate and Manifest. But back in 1937, the Catholic Church said, you know, we don't want to um, have an author talking about meditation because meditation at that time was, was a Hindu thing, was a pagan thing. Um, so he had to change the title. But if you read the book very closely, he's talking about, imagine you have a boardroom and Thomas Edison is sitting there and so-and-so is sitting there and, and visualize this. It's actually meditation techniques and, and hypnosis techniques. It's not just about thinking. So you, you're trying to tap into a higher consciousness of what would Richard Branson say to me? What would Thomas Edison say to me? That sort of stuff. So. It's, it's amazing. I had, a, I had a show, a radio show in New York for two years and every week I would interview amazing people who had achieved amazing things. And, and one of the first guests was the only Australian guy on The Secret. Everyone remembers the car park guy, a um, good friend of mine. Um, but I, I got to talk to millionaires and I got to talk to billionaires. I actually interviewed Arnold Schwarzenegger and a few other people. And because I was a meditator myself, I asked every single question who was on the show, I asked them how they built their wealth and what they did on a daily basis. Then I asked them, what type of meditation do you do? 
And a lot of people had never been asked that question before. Now, we know now that Oprah Winfrey meditates and she pays her staff to come to work early and meditate. We now know that Hugh Jackman meditates twice a day at sunrise and sunset. And when he's filming a movie, they have to stop production for 30 minutes so he can get his meditation in. I asked Arnold Schwarzenegger what type of meditation he does. And Arnold Schwarzenegger has been a transcendental meditation person since 1976, I believe. Wow. I got to interview Jer um, Jarek Robbins, Tony Robbins' son, and he does a different type of meditation. Every single person I interviewed, whether they were athletes, whether they were millionaires, billionaires, regardless of high achievers in life, every single one did meditation. They just had different techniques. And it's really fascinating for me as a meditator to find out these people who've been able to transcend what was possible financially, what was possible for them physically, by utilizing the power of the mind. It's really amazing. Well, I think it's a really good point because one thing that will happen if you don't take a bit of time to just pause and, and consider what's going on around you is you do get caught up in the rat race. And much like we can sort of hear in the background there with your dog, you'll end up chasing your tail as well. So uh, I think you really do need to you know, just take that little pause as you're talking about and, and find the gap and then ultimately pursue that and what opportunities that can come from it. So really interesting point there, Jeremy, especially mentioning all those incredibly successful people who have done so. Just before I let you go, we have now entered into the new financial year, but there are still quite a few businesses who are lagging on getting their taxes in order. What's the best way businesses should calculate their taxes and how should they know the amount of tax that they should, the amount of tax, I should say, that they should pay? Well, there's a couple of different answers to that response, James, and it depends if you want to be one of the average business people or if you want to be one of the one of the elite business people. Uh, I, I learned all this stuff going through financial planning education, but I learned a lot more from my clients than I actually learned when I was training for the position. Um, so for the, for the average person, I would suggest yeah, setting aside 20% of all income they receive. If you've got rental properties and things like that, have a separate sub, sub account. And every time the rent comes in, you take 20% of it, set it aside into a different sub account. Um, now that sub account will be used for repairs and maintenance and that sort of stuff expenses. Uh, if you don't have repairs and maintenance, obviously then you're going to be paying more tax. So then you've got the money set aside, 20% there is set aside for taxes. Um, obviously if you do spend money on recarpeting or reupholstering or whatever, then that money comes out of there and you'll be paying less tax. So 20% is a good rule of thumb for most people in most situations. Um, obviously for Australian businesses who have to pay GST and things like that, that'll have some some funds up your sleeve. But if you want to join the elite club of the multi-millionaires and the billionaires, most of these guys pay 1% tax. You know, Google, Apple, uh, Microsoft, PayPal, these kind of guys, they pay significantly less tax simply because they know how. So that's also an interesting thing that I've learned from my clients as well. Once, once you understand this, then you can legally pay you know, less than 2% tax. And then people start coming at me going, oh, how dare you? But Look what Google does for us. You know, Google pays almost no tax to the government, and that's fine, because they didn't support the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and that sort of stuff. But Google gives us Google Maps for free. We've got Google Search Engine for free. You know, we Google Translate for free. And they've been developing a lot of these technologies which they give away. And some of the people who don't pay significant amounts of tax are incredibly generous with what they do do, because they just don't trust the government to spend it in the right areas. I, I'm a pacifist, I'm a Buddhist, I don't, I don't support wars and things like that. So if I choose to deliberately, legally manipulate my tax down to, down to you know, subatomic levels, that gives me the freedom to go and sponsor children in Africa and, and do good work around the world. We've sponsored two, over 200,000 kids um, in the last 10 years to get an entrepreneurial education rather than a school-based education. So they can actually learn how to run businesses rather than learning how to work for someone else. Because that's really the, the future and the, and the freedom that we all want to have. Well, Jeremy, I think we'll have to have you back on to talk about that specific issue because that's really interesting how you can, as you mentioned there, break it down to a subatomic level of having to pay tax, which I, I don't think there's a single person in the world who wants to be paying more tax. We all want to do what Jimmy Carr did, but just not be caught. That's probably the key thing. But uh, just before I let legally, you go, Jeremy. Yeah, that's, that's the way. Obviously, the big corporations do it legally, and that's why they can manage to do it year after year after year. Yeah, absolutely. Now, any, any final thoughts you'd like to add? It's been a really interesting chat. Uh, I, I'd suggest, again, people you know, chat, chat up a business coach. Don't be afraid to, uh, to interview three or four of them. Find out what businesses they sell. Find out if they've got some sort of spiritual psychological practice behind them as well. 
uh, because that's going to be the one that makes a really, really big difference. Most people think, oh, if a business coach increased my business by 50%, that's great. But what if 500% was possible? Mm. Yeah, as you said before, like for, for thousands of years, we thought the four minute mile was impossible. Then the moment somebody did it, all of a sudden, 11 other people did it the next year. And now Olympians, you can't even get into the Olympics unless you can run under a four minute mile. So finding out what's possible and what's possible in your industry, because if there's someone who's making mega bucks in your industry, if it's possible for them, it's possible for you. And oftentimes they're not smarter than you, they've just got a different perspective. Mate, that's a great way to finish up. If it's not possible for them, it's not possible for you. I love that. Now, final thing, where can we find you? Where can we find what Savvy SME is doing as well? Uh, Savvy SME, you can find them. Just do a search for Savvy SME. Um, you can find me at 24hourwealthcoach.com. So that's number two, number four. I don't do a four-hour work week. I do a 24-hour work week. I've been doing it for about 16 <laughs> years. And I'm, I'm happy with that. So... Yeah, you can find me on, on all the search engines and Googles and social medias and Savvy SME as well. So happy, very happy to be a member of those guys and you know, learn a lot from them and hopefully I can give some back as well. Yeah, wonderful stuff. Well, Jeremy, so, thank you so much for joining us. It's been great to chat. Thank you, James. Well, that's Jeremy Britton, a Savvy SME influencer in consulting and strategy. And if you missed any part of our chat, or you'd like to browse our extensive catalogue of expert talks, simply head across to the YouTube channel, Kalkine Media. That's it for now, but remember, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic uptick and COVID safe travel measures. So if you wanna know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags, and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video, I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals in terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season one focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season two is set to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. 
The High Tension Drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Man of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action, and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty Amongst Others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway starring Tom Hanks will have you calling out, WILSON! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend, even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times, truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying serenity now. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Calcine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, calcinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calcine. Do you want to keep your digital currency safe and away from theft? Watch this video for information on how to do that. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones for Calkai Media. So when you accidentally lose your bitcoins or your wallet is hacked, the immediate recourse is getting the service of crypto hunters. Now they don't work by themselves, they coordinate with crypto holders and law enforcers to search and recover inaccessible, misplaced or stolen digital currencies. Now they are experts in breaking into crypto wallets and recovering relevant content. For instance, they may utilize supercomputers to crack private keys and even hypnotize wallet holders to retrieve any information. If you need the services of a crypto hunter one day, you can find one in many online resources. They would require you to provide basic details related to your private key and information that could help in tracking lost data. 
So how much is the service of a crypto hunter? Well, for most cases, crypto hunters charge a portion of the amount recovered, such as 10%, for example. But this can vary depending on the success rate of the retrieval. The recovery period may last for months. There are other options, as mentioned, such as crypto hypnotists and computer-based recovery service providers. Now, these individuals may charge a fixed cost and a percentage of the amount recovered. Like crypto hunters, the cost of service depends on how long it would take to recover the lost data or contents. Some companies specialize in recovering passwords and corrupted wallets. They use specific software to generate millions of potential private keys. When needed, the recovery service they provide may even use hacking systems that hackers use to steal cryptocurrencies. Other services may utilize data recovery services to track and access passwords stored in text files. While it is challenging, the services may charge a flat fee, but the success rate is high and may only take a few days. Another option for the recovery of lost or stolen cryptos is the service of crypto hypnotists. They are not tech savvy like crypto hunters, but they can do unusual things. Their specialty is mind management that enables the recovery of private keys through the subconscious mind of the individual. The technique used in the process is hypnotherapy and it attempts to help the crypto holder remember the details of the lost data. Now for thefts and scams, crypto hunters have a crucial responsibility. They coordinate with law enforcers to identify information about the transfer of stolen coins. Once the facts are determined, they can nullify the unlawful transactions and close the crypto wallets. Now, if you like this information, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon for notifications for our latest videos. This is Rachel signing off for Calkine Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Hello everyone, good morning and welcome to today's edition to Calkine TV's Executive Corner Expert Talks. I'm your host Sage and this morning we have with us Mr. Herbert Blank, the Senior Quantitative Analyst at Value Engine. Today's expert will share insights on how Value Engine runs complex models across 4,000 US and 1,000 Canadian stocks and 500 exchange traded funds or ETFs every single day. And as you know, we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. So today we are very lucky to share some space with Mr. Herb Blank, Senior Quantitative Analyst at Value Engine. Welcome, Herb. Thank you, Sage. I appreciate you having me today. It's like old home week looking at the Sydney Harbour Bridge. I got to make three visits to Australia on business from 94 to 2000 and I absolutely love Sydney. Well, it's a pleasure to e-meet you, and I'm glad you're enjoying the view. Well, with your experience, let's get started. I'm, I'm keen to share your insights with our viewers. And thank you for joining us again, Herb. 
We'd like to know your thoughts on whether building equally weighted portfolios will deliver superior performance or portfolios weighted by market capitalization would be better. Could you please help us understand that a bit better? I sure can. There's a lot of academic research which has said that smaller cap stocks in the United States and in other countries and, and uh, equally weighted rather than going against the cap weighted, going against the wisdom of the market will outperform over time. Uh, that was very much true before the market became more efficient in the 60s, 70s, uh, to less, uh, not as much in the 80s, somewhat in the early 90s, not as much in the later 90s, and then it, uh, it worked from 2001 to uh, 2007. It didn't work at all from 2008 to the present, basically, except for the last 12 months where value has come back with a bit of a vengeance. RSP, the equally weighted S&P 500 ETF, has outperformed SPY by about 800 basis points, although neither is anything to be ashamed of. The uh, RSP has gotten more than 40% over the last 12 months, but don't feel sorry for the people in SPY who made about 32% on, on the S&P 500 cap weight. Right, well thank you so much for sharing that insight and the data there. It's interesting to see how so much more interest has been put towards the stock market in the last 12 to 18 months. It seems that people could be using those stimulus checks to maybe invest and learn a bit more about the equities. Uh, and the COVID-19 pandemic shook industries. And would you give us a synopsis of exchange traded funds performance in the past 12 months, which has completely exploded? Basically, it, they, uh, most of them, particularly the S&P 500, went uh, before the last uh, 12 months, uh, to be exact, March 6th, uh, 18th through April 25th of, of uh, 2020, went down about 38%. But they recaptured all of that within the following four months, and the market has been uh, flush with money. And uh, Sage, that's very insightful what you said, the stimulus money is a large part of it. People uh, look at earnings, they get lost in a lot of different things. At the end of the day, what makes the stock's price rise and fall, supply and demand, it's about cash flows. And there was a lot of cash to put it. One of the major factors between the bullish markets in the US, a straight bull market pretty much with a couple of exceptions from 2009 uh, through, through the present, has been that there's been nowhere else sensible to put the money. Interest rates are very low. The U.S. Uh, economy continues to buzz along, and there really is nowhere else sensible to put the market. And even though the market makes two, uh, makes more highs every day, and there are analysts that say, "Okay, it's too high. Its price earnings is this is way too high. Its price book is way too high." Guess what? As long as there are cash flows that want to still go into the market and have nowhere better to go, the market's going to continue to go up. Exactly, and we're seeing a lot of those tech stocks um, in Australia and even America doing quite well with the digitization booming. Um, according to you, which sectors ETFs would be most beneficial in the coming months and why, if you could? Okay, there are investors and there are traders. In my opinion, investors in the US market um, who are going to go for any length of time can't do much better than buying an ETF exchange traded fund such as IVV, which has the whole S&P 500 or better yet VTI, which basically owns the entire US stock market, a Vanguard ETF, and you're paying 200 of 1% per annum. Basically, you're getting it for free management and you get the whole market. And over time, these the cash, it, mirrors the cash flows of, of investors and as much as much as some experts try to say the mark the market is stupid actually it's not stupid money it's institutional money it's the smart money that determines the uh, allocation of the of market assets to the market stocks so over time i can't emphasize how smart a play that is now there are traders and there are people who are trying to get extra return during that time and that's fine the sectors that we like very much at Value Engine right now include uh, transportation and airlines and, and include uh, oil and energy stocks. These value stocks that had been suppressed for very long are doing very well. 
But at the same time, we give four out of five, our second highest rating to QQQ, which as you know, Sage, is, you know, the, is emblematic of the tech bubble. The, the top seven stocks in it, uh, Microsoft, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon, uh, Tesla, and uh, I'm, I'm leaving one out, out uh, Netflix. But those those seven uh, stocks account for 44% of, of the QQQs, 100 stocks, and uh, drive the performance. And it's driven it higher over the last 12 years than the S&P or anything else. You'd be good to be in any of those things, but you'd have an average uh, return of, of uh, more than 15% per annum if you've been in QQQ all the time. Exactly. Thank you exactly. so much for, for sharing that. And the global biotech industry made some life-altering developments. Please, can you talk a little bit more about the significant implications you observed in the industry and also what you believe their impact will be in the coming years? Well, again, the, if you are able to select the biotech stocks typically take years to develop their technology, to develop their patents, to put things together, then they go through phase one trials, phase two trials, phase three trials over a period of years. And there are many different methodologies and many different firms, hundreds of them, sometimes thousands of them, trying to, to get the cures, trying to get the treatments, trying to get all these things at the same time. If you're very uh, smart, very lucky, yeah, you can research and try to find the right firm. But the trouble is, if you don't find the firm that gets there first, likely the firm that you selected will be worthless by the time your investment is through. That's why ETFs and biotech are such a good thing. You own all 150. You own all the candidates that are going to be worth money sometime. So XBI is the, is the iShare for the biotech industry, and it has done very well. It's my personal favorite. And the one I like is SBIO. Uh, which is from Alps, Alps that, that owns over 250 bi uh, biotech stocks in the nascent stage. And a lot of those are also uh, looked at to be t uh, by the uh, index methodology to be takeover candidates, and they're very strong. Now we're going to have uh, more active managers using the more efficient ETF structure to select bio and use a combination of the quantitative methods and their own judgment to... Uh, and risk control, and that's going to be very popular with a lot of people who know that the pop, the performance may have been better by all the au uh, automated funds over years, but they still would like to have an active manager on the tiller as well. Exactly. It's been interesting to exactly. see how the vaccine stock price has been changing with the recent updates and further rollouts in Australia as well. And the previous absolutely the vaccines and all these other treatments. Uh, breast cancer treatments, uh, brain cancer, there have been T cells, there have been so many developments in the last few years. It's just amazing what the biotech industry has done. It's all about technology. It's all about these new ways of sourcing DNA. I mean, think about these vaccines that have been able to do it with not a single trace of antibody. You have not been, had to inject any of, of the uh, coronavirus itself in order to develop these very effective vaccines. Yes, it's amazing what they're doing with the mRNA and the gene splicing. You're absolutely right. And the previous 20 months have been relentlessly difficult for value managers in terms of relative performance to growth management. Could you give us your expert opinion on how the value managers should stay cautious of such unforeseen circumstances so that growth management is not hindered? Well, the value... Ma Value managers don't hinder growth. It's just a matter of which can outperform and, and what's going on. I mean, as long as everyone's buying stocks, both will do just fine. Uh, it's just a matter of relative performance. Basically, again, what value is looking at most of the time, uh, price book ratio things, a lot of it relates to financial statements that have been around since the turn of the 19th century and relate to uh, the model is companies that have inventories, that have factories, that produce physical products that are out there. That pertains to about 35% of the market cap of the S&P today. There, that's what one of the reasons ESG and other reasons, ways of looking at intangibles like patents, intellectual property, 
uh, company reputation, things like that. These are the important assets of, of firms like Google and Facebook, and even firms that have physical products like Apple and Amazon. It's all. It's more about the elect, uh, the reputation, the intellectual property, the branding, uh, and the ability to be out in front of the technology more than other companies that make them as unique as they are. So valuation methods that just look at price relative to things like uh, uh, earnings per share going backwards or even projected earnings per, per share are missing some of the point here. Right. Thank you so much right. for those insights. That's it. That's it's it. Let me just finish up. Values done well, actually, actually did well for the 12 month period ending June uh, 30th, uh, 2021. Then the last two months, it hasn't done as well, but value managers are still doing fine. Growth managers are doing fine. If you're invested in the US market and haven't pulled out because you're afraid of an apocalypse, you've won the game. <laughs> exactly. You can't let your fear hold you back during these times, that's for sure. And we're seeing a little bit of the FUD creeping into the markets, but hopefully the inflation won't be too much of a deterrent. Do you have any last um, comments on inflation before we go? Do you think it's going to be an issue? Inflation will be an issue over the next five to 10 years to all the markets, not just the stock and not just US inflation necessarily. Yeah, I mean, right now, though, there are factors exacerbating US inflation. Right now, I think we're on a level of above 6% for the year, aren't we? Which is, you know, crazy compared to what we've had. But a lot of it is because of uh, 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 the backlog of demand that is suddenly being filled alongside the shortage of labor and a shortage of materials being caused by the pandemic. Uh, it's, it, it's a unique kind of period. Do I think that will continue at a 7% rate over the next five years? No, I don't see that happening. But there will be inflation. I don't think the 10-year the, uh, period that we've just had with inflation getting as low as a, uh, as a, a quarter of a percent. Thank you for joining us. This is Expert Talks by Calkine TV. And we just had a very interesting discussion with Mr. Herb Blank, the Senior Quantitative Analyst at Value Engine. And the full recorded interview will be available from the YouTube channel where you can gain his insights on some fabulous ETFs and his economic outlook. The YouTube channel is Calkine Media, but please stay watching for more Expert Talks and live market commentary. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video, I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals in terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season 2 is set to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. 
The High Tension Drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. <laughs> On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Man of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action, and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty amongst others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway starring Tom Hanks will have you calling out, WILSON! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying serenity now. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. In an ever-increasing digital world reliant on major search engines and data centers, we're all too aware that little changes at the likes of Google can have major ramifications worldwide. 
Google Chrome's 2.6 billion users now need to be on high alert as the company has confirmed multiple new high-level hacks. Recently, the tech major rolled out a security update urging Chrome users to update their browsers to the latest version to help stave off cybersecurity attacks. Google confirmed four high-level threats last weekend, coming just days after Chrome's 12th and 13th zero-day exploits of the year. These zero-day exploits impact macOS, Linux, and also Windows users. So what is the new threat? In its blog, Google confirmed that an exploit of CVE 20213793 exists in the wild. In layman's terms, that's a flaw that is more dangerous than regular security loopholes. Previously, Google warned users against a zero-day exploit called CVE 20213563, and now another dangerous threat has appeared. As a result, Google is currently restricting information about these hacks to purchase time for Chrome users to upgrade. Some of the issues include a heap buffer overflow in Blink, a heap buffer overflow in WebRTC, and inappropriate implementation in the sandbox. Essentially, it's all bad news. Many of the attacks are use after free or UAF exploits. Hackers have launched more than 10 UAF attacks in September and have already exploited a zero day UAF floor this month ahead of the latest discovery. So what are the lessons that we can learn from these hacks? In the wake of Google's warning last week, the company has provided some tips for users that can be taken as lessons. According to the manual, users can navigate to settings, click help, then about Google Chrome and check the Google Chrome version that they're operating with. Google versions of 94.0.4606.61 or more are considered safer. Users who don't have this version can wait or else they can turn off their machine. When the users have updated their browsers to the latest version, they need to perform the crucial final step and that is to restart Chrome. Tech experts have also provided a series of helpful hints to protect your data and privacy. Firstly, users are advised to use a stable channel update which is provided by Google to vulnerable systems immediately after appropriate testing. Secondly, you should also run all the software as a non-privileged user or one without administrative privileges to diminish the after effects of an attack. Thirdly, don't visit any untrusted websites while surfing on the internet, which is a pretty basic rule. Fourthly, users must not follow links which are provided by untrusted or unknown sources. The fifth tip is that users need to be very careful as there are some major possible threats attached to the hypertext links contained in the emails or attachments that they might receive. Sixth, one should apply the principle of least privilege to all the systems and services. Seventh, Users should update their browsers to the latest version. Eighth, it's very important for Chrome users to follow the latest necessary guidelines to avoid any potential risk. Ninth, proper security fixes should be ensured when it's recommended. And lastly, number 10, users should keep checking for their update until it's available on their browser, and they must follow the necessary security fix before installing the update and restarting Chrome. If you follow all of these tips, you're likely to remain safe and hack free. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkai. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkaimedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkai. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, all in all, 
Join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calkine TV. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Holly Shields here for Calkine TV, welcoming you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. The show where we bring to you industry leaders, successful business owners and market experts all under one roof to help you discover the latest economic insights. Today we're joined by Mr. Prashant Haldanka, the CISO and co-founder of Privasec. You may recognize Privasec as the independent security, governance, risk and compliance consulting firm we sat down with last week. Well, it's a pleasure to have them with us again. Welcome to the show, Prashant, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you on. Now, it seems that every second day we hear news of cyber attacks. So how does Privasec ensure efficient and effective security and compliance? Great question. Uh, so, privacy is a boutique cyber consulting firm. Um, we operate in Australia and Singapore. One of the uh, key uh, things that we see in the market is uh, twofold. One is being proactive, and the second is being reactive. So, if I approach that uh, one by one, proactive means we get into organizations, understand their cyber profile, their maturity towards uh, managing cyber risk and also understanding what regulations and compliances uh, they need to meet in the industry they are operating. So once we get a foothold of all these aspects, then we're able to better tailor our approach towards mitigating cyber, cyber security risk. I mean, risk is not going away at all. It, it can't be zero at any point, but it, it's the game is to be on top of this risk. So that's being proactive to understand what the organization is going through or what are the potential um, risk to this organization, uh, keeping those regulations and compliances in mind, as well as the industry they operate in. And the second is being reactive. Now, as you mentioned, cyber, cyber attacks are like happening every day. If we are not able to react with the customer, then um, we are not in the game. Um, it, it's that uh, it's that fast pace, right? This other cyber industry. So, being available for the customer, being flexible. Is, is the name of the game for us uh, in the industry. So combining these two aspects, um, what the approach has been um, applicable regulatory requirements, that is profile, overall profiling of organization's weakness. We are successfully able to uplift organization's sub-profile to meet the industry needs in an efficient manner, but also to make it survey effective for them uh, as part of their strategy. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Proactivity and reactivity is absolutely crucial when it comes to fighting cybercrime, which, as you mentioned, is never really going away. So in your opinion, how can we strengthen cooperation on a worldwide level to counter this kind of terrorism through cybersecurity? Yeah, great point. And it's quite a broad question, but if I, if I bring it down to the basics, uh, I see that as in an organization, there are business units. And those business units, if they talk to each other, collaborate, then we can achieve uh, greater things. So if I put that perspective into uh, worldwide and the countries or regions that we have across the world, if some of the critical nations come together and collaborate a bit more on various cybersecurity aspects, because cybersecurity is wide, there's a lot of things happening in cybersecurity. If you collaborate on certain certain aspects within those groups, uh, I think we can achieve uh, greater things. And by collaborating, I mean breaking it down into several uh, working groups. Um, so I've been following some news from the UN as well, where they have come up with cyber security and new technologies program. Within that program, they focus on uh, three aspects mainly. One is the critical infrastructure. Critical infrastructure for any organization is, um, is crucial. Like uh, It can be electrical grid, it can be a water plant. If there is a cyber attack on those type of uh, infrastructures, then it, it's a big, big impact for a nation. Uh, the second one is more on gathering information on social media and 
other network activities. So if from an open source point of view, if you're able to be ahead of the game from uh, from a terrorist aspects, I, I think we're winning the game because um, on one side, terrorists have a lot of time to spend to attack and you know plan things and all. But on the other side, um, there is a lot of uh, investment required for people to go and uh, come up with an approach to mitigate those risks. So I think we need to balance that. But on the other side, uh, if you follow the news that is coming up from Taliban, uh, there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of work carried out for using the unmanned aerial systems, uh, which is again uh, quite timely uh, because uh, the, there are further developments happening in the defense industry as well using unmanned aerial systems. So the, um, there are a lot of things, but if we can break it down into working groups and have subject matter experts from various uh, uh, countries operating into them, I think we uh, and collaborate together in a much better way. I think we have uh, we have gone far than uh, what we are doing now. Well, I couldn't agree more. That's absolutely fascinating. Some of the things that you mentioned, particularly with working with the UN as well. And obviously, cybercrime is an international threat. Um, it, uh, it, it goes across countries, and many countries have been affected as well as their businesses. So uh, collaboration is obviously key when it comes to fighting that issue. Now, we know that with the COVID-19 pandemic continuing to present unique challenges, the cyber risk landscape will continue to change. So I think it's fair to say that business owners and leaders need to stay on top of these risks within their organizations and implement appropriate strategies sorry, to mitigate them. So in your opinion, what should these strategies be? Yeah, it's an interesting time. I mean, since, uh, since COVID started and now, I think Organizations have come a long way, but still you hear some companies saying, oh, we are coming back to the office now, but then there is an incident with COVID and then they're back to uh, going going home and working remotely. But this has been the new normal, and uh, I think people are fed up of hearing this word new normal, but I'll stay away from that. Uh, the cyber safe uh, environment and working from home is it's actually it's actually something that has been adopted by organizations quite widely. But I think if you if you have to pinpoint on various things, I'll, I'll come down to the basic on uh, what staff security strategies should be looked at. Um, when employees started working from home, organizations were not prepared for that. So I think if you look at the basic aspects, uh, there are things like uh, the endpoints or the home laptops where antivirus should be installed. Uh, there should be more cyber security awareness uh, within the community as well as the employees to say what could go wrong and it, it's it's basic not making them experts in cyber security but talking about the basic aspects phishing is uh, one of the key where uh, a lot of perpetrators are acting as uh, trusted parties and uh, luring uh, employees and uh, users to uh, click on wrong things which can um, eventually into ransomware attacks and things like that. So I think, again, phishing awareness is the key there. Uh, the home network security, obviously, everyone is using their home networks and uh, what could go wrong, what could be fixed is something that uh, employees should be aware of and uh, try and get that fixed uh, to the end degree as possible. Uh, there are technologies such as virtual private networking, which is basically creating a secure channel between your home and the office network to make sure that uh, it's it's not uh, it's not impacted by any unauthorized access. So I think it's again a basic uh, uh, aspect to think about, and that should be also considered. But if you if you just take it to the next level, if you talk about the advanced aspects, there are some technology matters where uh, you could uh, you could implement new technologies, uh, implement uh, intelligence uh, gathering. Uh, processes. There are some risk management activities as well, which people can think of. And uh, there is a new term in the market, which is not so new anymore, where we talk about zero trust, where people don't get access if they're not able to authorize themselves uh, to various resources. Uh, it's, it's a different model where access is granted by default. So it's, it's taking the worst case scenario where you, you don't trust anyone, but they have to prove themselves to uh, make sure that they are uh, eligible to access that resource and only then they get access. So 
uh, it, it's a new term, but I think it, it's going to become like a default solution moving forward. Right, and those are some very excellent strategies, the ones you just mentioned. And obviously a new technology is emerging sorry, to, um, to combat these issues that are arising. As the whole landscape is changing, people are working from home, and not everyone obviously is an expert in cybersecurity. A lot of employees lack that basic knowledge. Now, demand for cybersecurity is on the rise in Australia. So how does PrivateSec plan to leverage from this opportunity in the near term? Yeah, so uh, again, there are two things. Uh, us being a cyber consulting firm, um, and uh, as I mentioned, cyber security has various aspects. There are only, uh, there are only certain things we can address on an immediate need, but um, from from other aspects that are also important from cyber security point of view, like technology implementation and things like that, I think for us, collaboration is the key. Um, there are there are organizations that specialize in certain things and we specialize in certain things so for us if if you work with uh, other cyber security organizations and come together as a single force a single unit to ad address organization cyber security uh, risk i think that's a win-win situation for everyone what that also means is uh, cyber security for an organization or for a community or even for a country is strengthening if if we have this uh, joint force operating together the other crucial factor is uh, cyber security skills there is always a shortage of skills in cyber security space um, and you're always on a hunt to uh, find the diamond in the rough if you like uh, to identify that person grow their skills and mentor them so to, to address that particular opportunity um, we have launched a accelerator program which talks about how we can mentor some of the um, uh, unique and um, talented people in the uh, in the industry to bring them to the level where they are able to you know handle cyber security risk and help organizations improve their posture as well but again it's not only organizations but it's also looking at the uh, region and country level as well Definitely. And it's great to see PrivateSec rising to meet those challenges, as you mentioned, in this constantly evolving landscape. So we look forward to see, seeing some new things from the company as well. On that note, it's just about time to wrap up, but I've got to say thanks so much for joining us today. It's been great to hear insights. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure, Pleasure. to have you on. Viewers, if you've just joined us, we just had a very interesting discussion with Mr. Prashant Haldanka of PrivateSec. If you missed the interview, you can catch it on our YouTube channel within the next couple of days. Although that is just about all from my end at the moment, so thanks for your time as well, viewers. Stay tuned for more live updates. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Game On, exclusive to Kalkine TV. I'm James Fresson, and in this episode, rugby league legend Michael Buettner joins the show to dissect the latest in the NRL, including a new team set to join the competition. Brett Phillips previews Indian Wells, and Adam Santorossa takes us through the beautiful game. But let's begin with sports news. The war between the states has spilled beyond politics and into the world of sports. Queensland's tough border restrictions have paved the path for Sydney to host the highly anticipated Tim Zhu and Takeshia Inno blockbuster fight next month. On Tuesday, it was revealed fight promoters No Limit Boxing had been forced to move the event from the Gold Coast Convention Centre as a result of the Sunshine State Government's COVID-19 rules. 
Sydney's Kudos Bank Arena was quickly announced as the new venue for the November 17 bout. A 75% crowd capacity has been confirmed, which will allow for 10,000 tickets to be sold. No Limit Boxing CEO George Rowe said, We are delighted to be able to return to Sydney for not only one of the most anticipated sporting events of the year, but one of the most significant. In the world of cricket, Aussie wonder kid Will Pukowski is in doubt for the Ashes series after suffering yet another concussion. Pukowski was struck in the head by a ball during a Nets training session. There are now concerns about the long-term impact of the most recent injury as it now marks the 10th concussion for Pukowski, who is just 23 years of age, but he is reportedly in good spirits and confident that he will be cleared by the medical team to partake in the Ashes series, which begins on December 8th. And just before we go to a short break, it's very important to take a look at the Australian Olympic Committee's spineless approach to next year's Winter Olympics in Beijing. Australia has committed to appearing at the Winter Olympics in China next year, with AOC President John Coates stating, the IOC's remit is to ensure that there is no human rights abuses in respect of the conduct of the Games within the National Olympic Committee, or within the Olympic movement. We have no ability to go into a country and tell them what to do. We are not a world government. We have to respect the sovereignty of the countries who are hosting the Games. Let that sink in. We have to respect the sovereignty of the countries who are hosting the Games. Sovereignty is actually a pretty good word here. An individual sovereignty is the concept of property in one's own person, expressed as the moral or natural right of a person to have bodily integrity and be the exclusive controller of one's own body and life. Now, do you believe the people in China have individual sovereignty? Would you say that living in a surveillance state that operates on a social credit system provides for sovereignty? Let's take the example of journalist Liu Hu, who is writing about censorship and government corruption. Now, because of his work, Liu has been arrested and fined and blacklisted in accordance with the social credit system. Liu has now been named on a list of dishonest persons subject to enforcement by the Supreme People's Court as not qualified to buy a plane ticket to purchase property, to take out a loan, or even to travel on certain train lines. Now that's just Chinese citizens. For others, conditions are actually even worse. Take Uyghur Muslims in China, for example. A vast swath of human rights groups believe China has detained more than one million Uyghur Muslims against their will over the past few years in a large network of what the state calls re-education camps. I'm not kidding. Hundreds of thousands more have been sent straight to prison. There's also evidence that Uyghurs are being used for forced labour, that they're subject to horrific violence, torture and sexual abuse. But what's that that John Coates says? Ah yes, we have to respect the sovereignty of the countries who are hosting the Games. Yeah. How about the sovereignty then of North Korea? After all, China is the country that continues to fund through weapons and other supplies Kim Jong-un's dictatorship that has people starving in the streets, killed if they dissent against their leader and has an agreement to turn back deserters knowing full well their fate is death. China is also the same country that has unleashed coronavirus into the world. Increasingly, there's now evidence the virus came from a lab. But regardless of your thoughts on its origins and the intentions surrounding the virus itself, China did indeed engage in a campaign of covering up information in the early stages, actively allowing its people to travel to other countries knowing there was an issue, and then of course conspired with the World Health Organization to downplay the seriousness of the virus in the early stages which has now, oh, what's that, killed millions of people, destroyed lives, and has forced people like you and I to endure two years of utter crap. Not to mention their increasing aggression in the Pacific, the slaughter of protesters in Hong Kong, and their ongoing war against Taiwan. Let's be very clear. This is a hostile nation, and one that we should have zero respect for. But to John Coates, it's, quote, a badge of honour that only Australia and Greece have attended every game since 1896. So he intends to continue that streak, regardless of the moral cost or the precedent that it sets. It's not a badge of honour to support a nation that engages in the acts that China does. Countries and their athletes have stood up in the past, and Australia should do so here. The 1976 Montreal Games featured more than two dozen African nations participating in a boycott after the IOC refused to ban New Zealand whose rugby team had ignored an international sporting embargo to tour the apartheid state of South Africa. Four years later, 
the US led a boycott of the Moscow Olympics to protest the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Which, coincidentally, brings me to Afghanistan. Over the past month, the IOC helped around 100 members of the Olympic community in Afghanistan to flee the country on humanitarian visas after the Taliban took over. Now, John Coates has stated that the work the IOC is doing in that scenario is within our remit. The situations that you have referred to, the humanitarian ones in China, is not within our remit. Mr. Coates. No one is suggesting that you lead our team of 41 athletes over to China, pick up arms and free those that are persecuted. What is within your remit, though, is taking a stand for the greater good. For our athletes, it is a shocking waste of their hard work over the past four years to not be rewarded with competition. But many of the game's biggest victories, for athletes as well, are not measured in metres or in seconds. They're measured by moments. Moments that matter more in the history of sport that help ingrain the fabric of fair play, good sportsmanship and honour the legacy of competition. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well don't worry, Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calkine TV. Welcome back to Game On, your one-stop shop for all things sports. Let's now take a look at every ace and double fault in the world of tennis with Brett Phillips. Well, Brett, thanks so much for joining Game On. Let's start with our homegrown Aussie favourite, Ash Barty. She's decided to withdraw from the Billie Jean King tournament. Is that going to spell an end to her season, do you think? I would think so. There's still the, the WTA finals and hasn't made a final call on that. Uh, has uh, her and her coach, or particularly her coach, Craig Tizer, James, a few weeks ago, was uh, pretty outspoken about the fact that the WTA finals, normally in Shenzhen, they've got a 10-year deal there in China, but there's no tennis in China, uh, is uh, going to Mexico. High altitude, another long trip. Um, Ash deciding to come home now. She's done the two weeks uh, quarantine in Brisbane. I can't see her doing another two weeks of quarantine, but who knows? I mean, look, it's not the money that will drive her. Uh, Six million dollars. She won the WTA finals uh, two years ago in the last instalment. It's just the credibility of that tournament. I imagine there'd be some pressure on Ash as the world number one to actually front up to the tournament that is all designed around the best eight players in the world and you don't have your top draw card. So mm. I'd love to be fly on the wall in that discussion, but Ash has been away for a long, long time. So like a few of the Aussies, has decided to get home. And if she went away and played the WTA finals, had to come back and do two more two more weeks of quarantine, then prepare for an Australian summer, I can't see all that adding up. So I would strongly suggest it probably is the end of her season, but we'll, uh, we'll await the, the final call on that from the Barty camp. Yeah, look, hopefully she can make the right call there, whether it means a bit of rest and relaxation or going for some more silverware. But let's turn our attention now to another Aussie in the form of John Millman. He was involved in a pretty fiery spat at Indian Wells. What happened between him and Jack Sock? Well, <laughs> I mean, John's, you know, he's a bit frustrated at the moment. He's a, he's a great, great guy to interview, great character. Where's his heart on his sleeve? Very honest, uh, gives you a lot of depth. He's been away from Brisbane since January of this year. So he's been living out of a suitcase. Who knows when he's going to get home. He spoke to our show the first serve a few weeks ago. And yeah, he wants to play in the Davis Cup team, which is not till uh, late November. Uh, then he's got to try and get home. So, you know, he's probably a little bit more crankier than normal, but there is a little bit of history with Sock um, going back to a, a Davis Cup tie when Australia played the USA in Brisbane, which was about two or three years ago now. And, it's just a bit of feeling with Jack. There's a bit of argy bargy there. Uh, Jack's very, uh, very thick, thick as these with Nick Kyrgios. Uh, so, you know, Jack's had a, a real breakout period. Then he's had a real uh, lull the last two years where his ranking has slipped and injuries and so forth. 
I think mm. there might have been some, a little bit of misinterpretation, but uh, John didn't take too kindly just to the exchange at the net. Uh, John is one of the great sportsmen. Tennis players don't always grace themselves, James, with their great sportsmanship at the net, uh, particularly the women. I, I hate to signal them out, but there are some of the worst exchanges. So if you go on YouTube, there's actually a, a clip of all the worst handshakes in tennis. And John thought he deserved um, a little bit better. So he had a few words to say about it. Most people would let it go, but John was in that mood where he, he wanted to let Jack know that that's not acceptable. <laughs> They certainly laying down the letter of the law, that's for sure. Now, in terms of Indian Wells as well, probably the biggest surprise that's come out of that tournament so far is Daniel Medvedev dropping out reasonably early in the piece. Well, he looked in really good nick. And it was two years ago, sorry, it was last year when the event was cancelled, uh, a day before the event. He was hitting it beautifully, he said. He felt last year he was uh, in a great uh, vein to win that tournament. I mean, it is the fifth major. So it's one you want on your resume and one that often is a launching pad to go on and have some major success. But uh, Grigor Dimitrov, who's uh, won again against Hila uh, Hukash, so he's through to the semis, uh, Grigor, he's playing great tennis. Um, it took him down and yeah, Medvedev, uh, when he sort of loses his way, which is not often because he was in control of that match and defensively so hard to penetrate from the back of the court. But when he does, sort of lose his way, the rut sort of sets in and he can't dig himself out. It doesn't happen that often because of uh, the great results that he's compiled over the last uh, few years. But yeah, he just, uh, he couldn't get things back on track. So that is men's tennis. There's lots of challenges. Uh, you know, Stefano Tsitsipas, Zverev still alive in the tournament. Uh, they've got to be uh, strong contenders from here. But uh, Hilbert uh, Herkash uh, was one I thought might have gone on to win the Sunshine Double this year, even though they're not back to back, but Miami Indian Wells are the two biggest outside the majors. But yeah, Gregor's taken him down, and he's a beautiful player to watch. Uh, Dimitrov, who's been to world number three and um, had a pretty good career. Now, on the women's side of the draw, what is that shaping up as? I mean, Emma Radanaku, she's she's gone, so it, it's oh. quite open at the moment. Well, it is. I really like the tennis of uh, Angelique Kerber, the three-time uh, major champion. Uh, she is playing some really good tennis. So up against uh, Bardosa, that's coming up in a uh, in a quarterfinal. So, yeah, I think she, since probably just prior to Wimbledon, then she went on to make that Wimbledon uh, final against, uh, well, the semi-final against Ash Barty. Uh, her form hadn't been that great, but she's back uh, playing Grand Slam tennis that she uh, was mm. playing probably three or four years ago. So I think she's right in it. And uh, On Jabur is the other one, uh, the first ever Tunisian woman to be inside the top 10 of women's tennis. She looks like she might be on her way deep in the tournament across uh, this weekend. It's a great story. She's flying the flag for her country because the next next best ranked is so far off the Richter scale that we don't <laughs> even sort of keep an eye on them. Uh, so Ons, who's actually got a an Australian connection, uh, Shane Leonage, who's based here in Melbourne, is her data analyst and uh, he's done a ton of great work with her. So yeah, women's tennis, eh? So he's going to throw up a new winner potentially. Yeah, look, it doesn't seem to matter how many data analysts you have. We still can't exactly pick what's going to unfold. That's for sure when it comes to women's tennis. But uh, just as we wrap up, Brett, last week we were talking about uh, Daniel Andrews potentially putting the stamp down and having no unvaccinated players competing in the Australian Open. This week we've seen Andy Murray come out and lend his support to that concept. Uh, to me, it's a bit of a strange one because obviously last year we competed when there was still surging cases globally and of course tennis being a global sport we had people coming in doing the quarantine period whether it be in brisbane or, or down in victoria before competing in the games we've mentioned novak djokovic quite outspoken about it stefano Tsitsipas, also quite outspoken i mean these are two of your top sort of five players in the world how much of this is andy murray looking for a way to angle himself into potentially an easier path to the title and how much do you think is a genuine concern if we still have the option of quarantining no, I think Andy's pretty. Uh, he's pretty, pretty genuine. Yeah, I mean, he, him and Novak go back a long way. Played each other in the juniors, uh, so they, they've got a. I don't know if it's a close friendship, but they've certainly got a, a healthy respect and rapport uh, for each other. Uh, so I think that is uh, that is fairly genuine. I've just actually been on a little exchange. Pardon me for looking down at my phone, but I've been on a little text exchange just in the last little while that apparently um, New South Wales has announced that from November 1, anyone coming into Australia who is fully vaxxed won't have to undergo hotel 
or home quarantine. So this is going to be interesting to see what the Victorian government does and whether they follow suit. Which through this pandemic, James, as we know, the Victorian government and the New South Wales government have done it totally opposite. And it's almost like they'd like to do it differently, just to be uh, to be different. So uh, as to how this affects the Australian Open, all this to play out. Um, I mean, obviously, it means that players can obviously fly into New South Wales, but still quarantine if they then, you know, travel straight to Victoria. Um, will Victoria follow New South Wales' lead? Uh, there's a few boxes still to be ticked as to how this summer is going to play out and how that will affect a guy like Djokovic if he's not going to be vaccinated. It's all quite bizarre. I mean, both states are suggesting that it's, you know, our gold standard. No, it's our gold standard. Neither of them have done particularly well at certain points in time. For me, the strangest one about that November 1 ruling, though, Brett, is if you are double vaccinated but present with COVID-19, based on what's being put forward at the moment, you still won't have to quarantine. So for me, mm. I can't quite get my head around the fact of if you, for example, take a COVID test in the case of Djokovic and you decide, you know what, I don't have COVID because I've done the test. I've already done my period. You, Based on, on that logic, you still would not be able to compete even if you're playing someone who is double vaccinated Positive with COVID. Correct. It's layered, isn't it? It's a lot. <laughs> who would be a sports administrator and who uh, would be in government? <laughs> Look, Brett, we can talk about it all day, but I think we'll, uh, we'll leave that one to the masses to make their own minds because certainly it just seems to be changing by the hour, by the minute, probably by the second next time we chat. But once again, thank you so much for your time on Game On. Pleasure, as always. A very interesting few months moving forward for the country and of course the world of tennis. Let's now move from the court to the pitch though and talk football with Adam Santarossa. Adam Santarossa, thanks once again for joining Game On. Yeah, good to be here. Now let's start with FIFA setting down some sanctions for both Hungary and Albania. What exactly is happening in that situation? Yeah, this is a result of just some fan unrest in recent World Cup qualifiers, so some crowd trouble that uh, has plagued a number of nations um, over the last few months with World Cup qualifiers. They're also looking into England as well uh, from some of that fallout of the, the Euro final uh, where we saw that crowd unrest. So again, it's a pretty strong stance from FIFA and, and UEFA have also been equally strong uh, in their sanctions. And look, it's, it's potentially damaging to these nations because mm. you know they could lose points. Um, the, the general uh, penalty is just you know a closed doors game in future for a World Cup qualifier, so no fans would be allowed in, which is obviously a negative um, anyway, but it generally, the, I guess the most serious punishment can be points penalties, which would really affect their World Cup qualification. So yeah, I think I'm supportive of the stance. I think, you know, crowd misbehaviour is a real issue uh, at the moment, you know, particularly in Europe, and um, we need to stamp it out pretty strongly. Absolutely. Now we've had a little break, but the EPL is back this week. What do you reckon the best games to look at are? Yeah, the first one I circled was uh, Leicester City and Manchester United uh, on Saturday evening here in Australia. And for mine, uh, this is a massive game for Logan Solskjaer. He's been a, a little bit under pressure uh, given results in, in recent times and that international break uh, sort of silenced them a little. I mean, um, they are fourth on the table, but you look at the investment they've made, uh, particularly this season with Varane and, and Ronaldo coming in. Mm. Uh, not getting a result against Leicester could really push them further down the table. There's quite a log jam there between sort of fourth and seventh. So uh, there's already a few sounding out, uh, you know, the Oli outcries have, have sort of re-emerged again. Uh, and it's, yeah, more fuel will be poured on if they don't get that result against Leicester. Um, that's the game to watch this weekend because, yeah, it could, could turn pretty quickly. Almost seems like an annual event, the uh, out with Oli brigade coming around every now and then. Uh, you also mentioned Ronaldo there along with the international break. Now, a couple of things around him, obviously uh, very good performance throughout that international period, collecting yet another hat-trick. It's an incredible tally, just continues to defy age. He also picked up the EPL player of the month. Now, I want to get your take on both. Is he one of the all-time greatest international players, international specifically? And in terms of that EPL award for player of the month, should he have won it? Uh, yeah, well, to answer the first question, 100%, he's, he's one of the greats, if not the best we've seen internationally. I mean, uh, he's probably not, you know, the World Cup triumphs is something that probably removes him from that top, top echelon where, you know, Pelé and Maradona and, and Co mm. probably exist. But, um, you know, he's the leading goal scorer in, in the history of international football. So 
um, the record goal scorer. He passed Ali Dae um, a few weeks back. So, um, you know, that, that, that answers the question in itself. But uh, in terms of, you know, what he's done for Portugal, a side that doesn't have the superstars of a Germany or an Argentina or a Brazil, um, you know, that, that run he, he took them to when they won the Euro, I mean, that was, that was simply phenomenal. But uh, in terms of the Premier League Player of the Month, there's been a bit of outcry. Um, he got the award. He's been good, really good since coming into Manchester United. I mean, there was such expectation that, you know, he would be the difference. Um, and he's come up with goals. And I, I know the form hasn't been great um, in recent weeks for Man United, but I don't think you can fault Ronaldo for any of that. Uh, but Mo Salah has been in, in tremendous form. And, and I think, I think... There was a lot of critics about Ronaldo getting the award, and I, I sort of agree. I think the romanticism of Ronaldo being back may have mm. sort of played into that. And I think uh, I think Mo Salah was a little bit unlucky because he's been he's been phenomenal the the start of the year. Both he and Sane are in the form that delivered Liverpool the title a couple of seasons ago. Yeah, absolutely. He's been looking brilliant. Of course, Liverpool currently in negotiations surrounding a new contract, and they're just sort of weighing it up at the moment. He's he's already hit the thirty mark. By the time they add that extension, he's looking at mid 30s. So I suppose it is a case of output at the moment, output into the future, and then also the dollar value because that contract is expected to rise quite a bit. But speaking of the EPL, speaking of money, we know there's a lot coming the way of Newcastle United at the moment. New consortium, it's been approved, but there's been a lot of backlash about it, mainly surrounding human rights. Exactly what is happening here, Adam? Yeah, there's been a backlash, um, obviously, around the Saudi Arabian government being involved in this ownership team uh, to take over Newcastle United. And, and the Premier League does have a process they go through when uh, someone wants to be involved with a club. But they, they'll go into their background and essentially do a background check to see that they're fit and well to run a club and, you know, they're, they're, they're not politically exposed and whatnot. But um, and, and it's hard to see how they've passed, to be honest, um, given the, some of the allegations that's been passed uh, against the Saudi Arabian group and uh, and that's sort of what the fans are starting to realise. They're quite savvy now to how that money in the game and where it comes from and, and we've seen Qatar's involvement, obviously the last World Cup and um, the outfall uh, around FIFA but also too, you know, there's some of the biggest clubs in the world, their sponsors, um, you know, mm -hmm. come out of these countries in the UAE, Saudi Arabia and, and Qatar and I think football fans are starting to realise uh, just where that comes from. In the Newcastle United example, uh, you know, the Premier League have, have said they've looked into it and they've made a judgment that they're fit and well to be associated with uh, Newcastle United. So that's really all we can go on. But um, the Premier League are not alone in, in dealings with Saudi Arabia. Uh, the WWE signed a massive deal, a uh, multi-million dollar deal to go there for, for the last 10 years. There's an F1 race coming up later this year, which will be the debut in Saudi Arabia. So look, multi multi-million dollar deals across a lot of sports uh with this ownership group and it, it seems to be continuing no one uh seems to want to look too deep into things when when there's that much money on the table no i think you're 100 right i've been watching a squid game recently and it's amazing to see what people will do for money let alone sporting organizations that have the chance to have further glory further success and then obviously the uh, the ability to recruit players that are otherwise outside of their capability of usually attracting Let's just finish on a final point on the home front. The Socceroos sadly going down to Japan, ending pretty much a world record streak, I believe. Yeah, it was a disappointing night in, in Saitama for the Socceroos going down 2-1 to Japan and just an off performance, I thought, from Australia. They just were never really in the game. They did struggle defensively and, and two real defensive lapses uh, has cost them in the end. Uh, we thought we were going to take a point home. Uh, Ajahn Hustic, his free kick made it 1-1 and it looked like um, against the run of play, we were going to steal the point, which I think if you offered that up pre-game, uh, I would have taken it well and truly. And it really would have uh, kept that gap between uh, Japan and, and Australia at the top of the table. So, um, yeah, disappointing to throw it away late in, in conceding that goal, but the, the Socceroos are still in a positive position. They sit second in the group at the moment. Saudi Arabia are four from four, uh, 12 points on top. We are on nine points. And then Oman and Japan both on six below us. Uh, massive game next up. The first time we'll be playing at home on Australian soil uh, in the World Cup qualifiers against Saudi Arabia. So a big, big three points in the context that, as I said, still positive, still in a good position and the right result against Saudi Arabia. We're, we're back flying potentially towards Qatar. Yeah, we'll keep our fingers crossed to make sure we can get all three points. And as always, Adam, you're across everything in the world of football. Thanks so much for joining Game On. Anytime. <laughs> Thank you.
Yes, and the Socceroos next match will of course occur on November 11. And there's also plenty of big news this week in the world of rugby league. So there's no one better to chat to than NRL legend Michael Butner. Well, Butes, thanks once again for joining Game On. We're officially in the off-season, but the new cycle in rugby league circles has just gone into overdrive. We've now got a 17th team for the NRL. That's been confirmed. Redcliffe Dolphins, they've secured the licence. Do you reckon the NRL got this one right? Uh, look, I, I'm actually surprised that we're going with 17 teams. I thought, you know, ordinarily you'd probably look to add two teams. Uh, look, in terms of where the uh, location, I, I've got no problem with it. I, I think I've said previously, I thought it was either going to be uh, WA, Queensland or uh, New Zealand. Uh, and I think obviously uh, the Red Cliff Dolphins have proven that they uh, have the right structures in place to ensure that they can compete at that level. We obviously saw games throughout the year up there as well. So, you know, they've got the facilities there. It's great for Brisbane to have uh, another side to support outside of the Broncos. And we've seen the success of those um, local derbies, you know, the Gold Coast versus yeah. the Broncos, the Broncos versus um, North Queensland. The, you know, how uh, much robbery there is amongst those two or three clubs. So. I don't see it any, uh, being any different with Redcliffe being involved in the competition now. Um, I, look, I think it's a real plus. I just hope that the calibre of player uh, mm. is well and truly, uh, there's enough there. Uh, and the fact that they, I don't know whether they've actually officially announced it, but um, Wayne Bennett appears to be the red hot favourite for the coaching position. I think he's got a, a three year deal. So um, that can only be a real positive for a club uh, who are looking to, to start their, I guess, their NRL um, performance uh, as best as they can. And no better to have Wayne Bennett, uh, who is the, the master coach, to be there and uh, to guide them. Yeah, well, all reports are confirming that he has indeed signed on for three seasons from 2023. Obviously, we know he's had a lot of success pretty much wherever he's gone, being in the grand final this year with South Sydney. Uh, a lot of players that are wanting to play for him, they come from different clubs, whether it be your Jaden Sewers or Darius Boyd, of course, we think back a few years ago, was following him all over the place. One player that is now having the same sort of relationship with him is Cody Walker. His future is a little bit still up in the air. Do you think he would follow Bennett up to Queensland? And what do you think Wayne Bennett will bring to the table? Oh, look, I think, you know, what Wayne Bennett, what Wayne Bennett brings to the table is his experience and his credibility. And I think that is a real big plus. He, he also brings that appeal that you talked about, that players want to play under him. Mm. So he will attract players to that club. And, and I don't think they could have got a better coach, maybe Craig Bellamy, might have been your only other alternative uh, if you're looking to start a club and to attract players based on the type of coach that you've got. So, you know, a big tick there for Redcliffe. I think they probably do need a, a couple of marquee players. And I would dare say, you know, those marquee players, probably they would aim to have them as Queenslanders, mm. uh, uh, which would give them again, you know, a, a sense of that hometown uh, favouritism, etc. Uh, and, and, you know, look favourably by the fans in relation to who they've got there. But, um, you know, Cody Walker, you know, he's proven uh, over the last probably four or five seasons what a player he is, uh, especially this year uh, with the number of try assists that he had. He seemed to have taken his game to another level. I think he would be a great addition to the, the uh, well, a great signing for the uh, Redcliffe side. Uh, and, you know, obviously it's pretty apparent that uh, he loves uh, Wayne Bennett and uh, he seems to perform well under him. Um, that uh, would be a great signing for them. Uh, where they go to from here in terms of other players, availability of players, uh, that's going to be the big question. But uh, if you're going to have any any coach there leading the, uh, leading the way for you, uh, Wayne Bennett's the way to go. Look, there's also a homecoming for Tim Sheens, another super coach. He's returning to the West Tigers, officially signing off on a three-year, $1 million deal as director of football. Now, Butes, you've previously played underneath him. What does he bring to a club? Can he set the Tigers back on the right path? Oh, look, I, again, Tim Sheens has been around the game for a long period of time. 
So that experience is invaluable. His credibility cannot be questioned, similar to Wayne Bennett. So I think from that perspective, and, and you know, he's going into this role not with thoughts of being the head coach anymore. He's actually there to oversee the program and ensure that from the club's perspective, that their recruitment uh, and the way that they're managing the club um, is heading in the right direction. It's probably been a little bit rudderless over the last couple of years, you know, which has made it extremely hard for uh, Michael Maguire. But I just feel that um, with Tim Sheens back at the helm, again, he brings that credibility. When it comes to recruiting players, he's going to do his research. He's going to be very thorough. And I found that when I was uh, coached by him in, the, in the, my last couple of seasons, how thorough he was in his approach. He never left any stone unturned. And, uh, you know, that was evident with the results that he got 2005 with that very young uh, West Tigers side. Mm. So, uh, look, it's a, a great signing for the West Tigers. Uh, you know, uh, nice to see him come back home where he had so much success. Uh, and hopefully he can bring that back uh, to a club that's probably been struggling uh, since that 2005 glory days. Uh, they certainly need to get themselves back on track. Mitch, just to finish up, some really sad news this week. Norm Proven passing away at the age of 88. Yeah, look, that's a real um, shock. I, I wasn't aware of that, but um, really sad. Obviously, his record is basically second to none when you consider what he has done in the claim, uh, done in the game. Uh, the 13th Immortal, uh, captain coach of the Dragons. I think he won something along the lines of nine or ten premierships, which is just absolutely phenomenal. And, uh, I'm glad to see that he was instated as an immortal uh, before his passing because he certainly uh, deserves that uh, title. I have no doubt about that. Uh, and he will always be uh, synonymous with our game with that, uh, that uh, the NRL trophy uh, mm. with the Arthur Summons, Norm Proven, uh, uh, I guess, statue there that was sort of recognises what our game is all about. And you know what, he, an absolute gentleman. I was fortunate enough to meet him on a couple of occasions and an absolute gentleman and an ornament to the game. Uh, and it will be a sad loss to not only uh, his family, but uh, the rugby league community. So my condolences do, out, do go out to the family. It's beautiful words. We'll finish on that note. Once again, thank you so much for joining Game On. Good on you, James. Thanks, buddy. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry. Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calkine TV. Welcome back to Kalkine TV, I'm James Preston and this is Game On, your home for sports news and opinion and it's time now to turn our attentions to the finances off the field with Sports Business. Crypto's love affair with the world of sports is in overdrive this week. Lazio has become the latest professional sports club to partner up with a crypto platform. The Serie A football club has partnered with cryptocurrency exchange Binance. A 30 million euro sponsorship deal has been reached that will see Binance become the main jersey sponsor of the club in a three-year deal. Additionally, the deal will mark the debut of Binance's own fan token platform, which enables supporters to buy digital coins of their side and participate in polls hosted by the club or receive rewards and promotions. This follows the trend of other major clubs such as Paris Saint-Germain and AC Milan. And Binance isn't the only crypto platform getting in on the sporting action. FTX Trading Limited is one of the world's leading global crypto exchanges and on October 13 it announced a global partnership with the International Cricket Council or the ICC for FTX to become the official crypto partner of the governing body of cricket. FTX will be partnering ICC events beginning with the ICC Men's T20 World Cup 
hosted by India, staged in the United Arab Emirates and Oman in October, to the ICC Men's Cricket World Cup, also hosted by India in 2023. The partnership covers all ICC properties, including the Men's and Women's Cricket World Cups, Men's and Women's T20 World Cups, Men's Under-19 Cricket World Cup and the Men's Cricket World Cup Qualifier. And on the back of Canada legalising single event sports betting in June, Curling Canada and wagering outlet PointsBet Canada announced a new partnership on October 13. As official sports betting partner of Curling Canada, PointsBet will act as title sponsor of the season of champions events starting in the 2022-23 season. The long-term partnership comes into effect immediately and PointsBet, which is originally an Australian-based company, hopes that its Canada division will enter Ontario's single event wagering market in the first quarter of 2022. The addition of Curling Canada as one of PointsBet's official supporting partners is supported by their existing relationships in the US with the likes of the NHL, NBA, WNBA, NFL, MLB and also the PGA Tour. So it's fair to say it's a deal that's ready to sweep sports punters off their feet. Well, that's all for this edition of Game On. Hope you enjoyed the show. I'll catch you next Friday. Until then, get out there and go and kick something, preferably a ball. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Kalkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Kalkine. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or to a guide to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic uptick and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV.
Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge-watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no-buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it? how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Welcome to the Executive Corner, Expert Talks by Calcane TV, I'm Sage, and today's guest is Mr. Jake Nicholson, Managing Director at SME Ventures. And have you heard of a search fund? If not, you're not alone. Making its first appearance in the USA during the 1980s, it's a niche asset class that if more people knew about, they might prosper from. Also known as entrepreneurship through acquisition or ETA. And today's guest will share insights into this type of private equity vehicle, which involves searching for, buying and operating existing businesses instead of starting one from scratch. You might have heard of flipping property. Well, this is similar. <laughs> it's simply put, flipping businesses. And we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And bringing you live today, we have Mr. Jake Nicholson, Managing Director of SME Ventures. Welcome to the show, Jake. Thanks, Sage. Great to be here. Well, Jake, with your experience working for Search Fund Accelerator in the US, the world's first accelerator fund, and now as a managing director at SME Ventures in Australia, we're keen to share your insights. So I just mentioned flipping businesses there. Um, I've probably got it all wrong, so we're keen to have your insights to set it straight for our viewers. Sounds like there's two sides to the coin here. Business owners who want to sell and the searchers who are looking to acquire the established businesses. How does your innovative company offer services to both, please? That's absolutely right, Sage. So you have this whole generation of baby boomer business owners, and 85% of them in Australia are lacking a succession plan. And that's one side of the equation. On the other side of the equation, you have a pool of very talented mid-career entrepreneurs who would love to step into that CEO seat of a small business and create a lot of value in that business. So what we do at SME Ventures is we partner with that aspiring CEO throughout the process of initially raising a bit of seed capital to fund the process of looking for a business to buy, to actually sourcing that acquisition opportunity, to completing the acquisition, and then to operate our business. And in doing that, we follow a model called a search fund that, as you mentioned, was developed at, by, at Stanford and Harvard back in the 80s uh, and has since created over $8 billion US dollars of uh, shareholder value. And that model is just now landing in Australia. We just completed Australia's very first uh, acquisition via a search fund um, uh, with our entrepreneur, Rob Gaunt, who acquired ACE training uh, a couple months ago. Wow, that sounds very exciting and so great to be connecting with your company at this time as well. You've just completed a recent acquisition of ACE Training, is that correct? Do you have insights to share on the process so far? Yeah, Sage, I think the biggest insight from that experience is that the opportunity is very clear now in, in Australia. We, we came to the market with a hypothesis, um, but that hypothesis had a few big question marks attached to it. And as we learn more, those question marks are getting smaller and smaller, and the, the thesis is clearly playing out. Uh, many, the, the market has many businesses in, in the size range, in, in like the 5 to $50 million turnover range um, that have been around for 15, 20 years and are being run by retirement age founder owners who, again, don't have a succession plan. And most of them um, uh, would be interested, many of them would be interested in a uh, hungry younger entrepreneur coming in, filling their shoes and carry on the, carrying on the legacy uh, of that business. Um, when we came into the market, we had some questions around sources of capital, availability of debt financing, um, ability to source these opportunities, and the willingness of these business owners to actually sell to the next generation. 
Um, but as this recent acquisition shows, and as our, our process of sourcing opportunities um, has shown, uh, those, those are m much smaller question marks, and, and we are able to find the appropriate sources of capital and, uh, and, and the deal flow. And those two parts of the equation are, um, are, are getting answered pretty quickly for the short term. Great, thank you for the clarity there, because I have noticed that mergers and acquisitions are quite common, especially in the tech world, and with many startups being usurped by tech giants on a regular basis. Um, the search fund community is undoubtedly growing, and a couple of questions for you. Do you think that the COVID-19 downturn has impacted that growth? And just for further clarity, how is SME Ventures different to a digital aggregator or a tech unicorn, so to speak? Sure. Um, so yes, I, I, the COVID situation has created many distressed businesses. And so you might think that um, those distressed businesses would feed into the, the search fund model, of, you know, people who want to buy these businesses. Um, in fact, search fund entrepreneurs are usually looking for, um, are, not, are not prioritizing distressed opportunities. They're looking more for stable, resilient companies um, but perhaps COVID has uh, affected valuations a bit, and that's made the, the prospect a bit more uh, attractive to aspiring acquirers and, and CEOs. Um, but I think what's driving growth of search funds more than anything is really just awareness. Uh, for a long time, the idea of a search fund, the idea of entrepreneurship through acquisition um, as, as a legitimate path for the aspiring entrepreneur has sat within a fairly small community of people in the know in, in the United States. But especially over the past five to 20, 10 years, that awareness has, has really um, grown exponentially, especially in, in Canada, Western Europe, Latin America. Um, and now it's starting to land in, in Australia and Asia Pacific. Um, the, the businesses we buy are, the, the big difference between entrepreneurship acquisition and search funds on one hand and the startup world on the other is that the entrepreneur is not starting from scratch in a search fund. Um, they are buying an established business with proven uh, product market fit, with cash flow, uh, with a, a management team in place and willing to stay. Uh, middle management team typically, um, and uh, and and you know stable systems, and then they're taking that and creating value from there. Often there's a lot of low hanging fruit and opportunity for professionalization and value creation in these businesses. So for the entrepreneur who doesn't want to start from scratch, this can be a very good solution. Mm, yes, it definitely sounds like it. So SME Ventures chooses to focus on acquiring and operating single, small to medium enterprise, and you mentioned earlier, with the revenues of between 5 to 50 million. Could you share with us why you've selected this target group in particular? Yeah, Sage, so this is where we see a ton of opportunity uh, in Australia. Um, other institutional buyers aren't typically interested in, in businesses of this size. They want to see more 5 million EBITDA plus, uh, or at least you know, 40 to 50 million in turnover. Um, but for our model, this size range is, is perfect. It's a great size for a, a mid-career operator who's typically a first-time CEO. It's a steady business that we can buy well. Um, and there's a ton of opportunity for value creation with some fairly basic ingredients uh, like professionalization of systems, and, um, and that often includes some tech enablement, which these, these mid-career people are, are often fairly well equipped to, to execute on. Um, and then some sophisticated elbow grease applied to, to top-line growth. And often these businesses have served as really uh, great lifestyle businesses for the outgoing business owner, the seller, generating a few million of cash flow for that, for that owner um, on an annual basis. And so they're, they're steady and reliable and predictable. Um, but they're often underperforming uh, relative to their potential. So when you replace that, um, that outgoing owner with a hungry entrepreneur who is, is excited to and incentivized to um, create value, not just reliable cash, um, then you can do some really interesting things. Well, it sounds like this is a fantastic mission because you're probably helping out a lot of those near retirement phase uh, business founder owners who might be stuck with who they're going to, you know, who their success is going to be. And perhaps their own children aren't as inclined that way or have the business acumen. So, yeah, sounds like a, a brilliant um, exercise there. So we're finishing up our discussion on, now. Yeah. What are your near-term goals for SME Ventures and how can searchers get involved with the rollout of this concept in Australia? 
Yeah, so Sage, we've, we've, uh, we've, without being presumptuous, we've sort of figured out the, the, the capital side of things and the deal flow side of things. What we're looking for now is the next generation of high-performing CEOs to partner with us on, on an exciting project like this. People who would do an amazing job running a small business and, and delivering value, um, who are gritty and smart and humble and excellent leaders who should be running a business today um, but don't have a business to run. And um, if, they, if, if, if your viewers are, are interested in, in learning more, um, they can get in touch with us at hello at smeventures.com uh, or visit our website. There's a whole bunch of free resources for people who want to, to learn about this space, including a reading list that will point them to other blogs and books and podcasts. Um, and I'm happy to be a resource for anyone researching this this career path, which can be very exciting, but um, does carry some risk and should elicit a lot of a lot of questions uh, from from that entrepreneur. And my my team and I are happy to answer those questions and hopefully um, find our future partner CEOs. That sounds fantastic. So just before you go, does SME Ventures act as a mediator in the process, or does the search uh, become an employee of SME Ventures to then take on the CEO CEO role in the new? company yeah so we're, we're functionally and structurally a partner to that entrepreneur um, from the beginning of the process through to the end we create an entity with with that entrepreneur we raise capital together uh, into that entity we execute the search for an acquisition opportunity together using our team of analysts and our tech stack um, and then uh, and then we execute the, the acquisition together and then post acquisition that entrepreneur will step in as the CEO uh, of uh, of the acquired company, and we sit on the board, um, and we're uh, along with a couple of the other investors, uh, and we're we're very actively um, engaged in the in the ongoing operations of, of that company post acquisition. Sounds like a great service and very unique. Uh, a very exciting time to connect with you, and thank you for bringing this opportunity to our shores. Um, Jake, was there any final thoughts you'd like to share with the viewers before we wind up today's discussion? Sure, it's just that startups are not the only way to pursue entrepreneurship. Um, you don't have to uh, survive in your garage on, on instant noodles uh, without a salary for years. You can actually, um, for, for an opportunity that, that, uh, that you have a 90% chance of failure, and um, you can actually mitigate a lot of your risks Take a, take a salary from the beginning and start with something that already has a product market fit uh, and then make that yours uh, and, and mold that into your vision, into your company and, 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 and execute the value creation strategy um, from there. And for some people that can be a very, uh, a much more attractive version of entrepreneurship than, um, than starting a high risk uh, tech company from scratch. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you so much, Jake. It's a very inspiring opportunity and best of luck with your uh, rollout here in Australia. Thank you, Sage. And thank you for joining us today, uh, viewers. We just had a very informative discussion with Mr. Jake Nicholson, Managing Director at SME Ventures. And the full recorded interview is available from YouTube at Calkine Media. Until the next time, keep watching Calkine TV for more of the expert talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals 
In terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With Season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, Season 2 is set to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high-tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Men of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty Amongst Others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway, starring Tom Hanks, will have you calling out, Wilson! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell, and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times, truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. Surprise. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying, Serenity now! If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine.
Thanks for joining us on yet again another edition of Crypto Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm your host Sage and while the investment community is drawn towards digital assets, we have sourced some of the brightest investors in the field to share their insights and observations and having experience in leading a digital investment and fintech firm leveraging blockchain technology for asset digitization and management, we're lucky to share some space with Ms. Gemma Zhu today, an avid private investor at Fork Ventures. So welcome to the show Gemma. Nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Sage. Thank you so much for making time for the show. Kalkine Media is excited to have you with us and we're keen to hear your insights. So let's get started. Um, you're an avid investor with experience running a blockchain-based company. What was your motivation, please, behind being immersed in this field? Well, I actually, my background is in financial services and I, um, it was almost by accident in early 2017 that on a trip uh, back to, to Australia. Um, at the time, I was living overseas. Um, I was introduced to uh, a new technology at the time called Ethereum, and this was early 2017. Um, and, and then I've been ever hooked um, ever since. And that's largely due to, um, you know, as a non-technical person, what really got me uh, hooked and, and continue to really spend all my time in, in this space is the, the incentive models, uh, the various type of economic uh, models that I'm seeing uh, in this space. And I can totally feel your passion for these type of mod models that are developing through smart contracts and, and other um, technicalities that this mm -hmm. provides. Could you please give us some background on the asset digitization industry? From your experience, um, your insider opinions will be so valuable because as these marketplaces are expanding around us like the NFT markets of OpenSea and Rarible, they're leaving some people behind so it'd be great to gain some insight from you today. So these marketplaces have gained the spotlight. Do you know how value is placed on these non-fungible tokens and why is this space pulsing now please? So, so NFTs, non-fungible tokens, really um, were first I guess came to spotlight in probably late 2017, early 2018, um, by CryptoKitties, which was probably the first, um, I guess, um, uh, NFT digital collectibles that really uh, sort of started the hype. Now, everything uh, during the bear market in 2018, 2019, everything sort of went down um, and, and people left, 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 essentially a lot of people left crypto markets as well as NFTs died down. Now, I think the recent craze or the recent hype in NFTs um, is largely due to, you know, what preceded it was, was the DeFi summer in 2020. Um, so finance uh, saw, saw um, became completely uh, disrupted, um, not, I guess not completely, but many of the traditional financial services could be replicated in a decentralized world. So that's the, you know, the, the economy, right? And then, so often what happens after that is people start to look at, you know, what, what else can they invest in beyond finance? And culture is, is the sort of the, the next obvious thing, and that is what essentially um, characterizes NFTs and digital collectibles. Now, so how is that valued? Well, I think that is really um, up to up to the, the buyer and the seller, right? Often the value is in the eye of the beholder, and that you know is unlike traditional finance, where you can do cash flow analysis, where you can do uh, lots of numbers and 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 fundamental analysis. NFTs and digital collectibles is really um, you know buying and selling art or buying and selling um, a form of um, uh, uh, a collection that. It's quite subjective in value. Um, it could be worth a dollar, it could be worth a million dollars. So, so there is um, no real fundamental valuation method that can be applied to NFTs. Okay, thank you. Thank you for shedding a bit of light on, on that uh, scenario for us. So I think in the past, in the 20th century, for example, non-fungible tokens would have been things like rare coins or stamps, other collector's items like that. Would that mm -hmm. be correct to say? Yes, so often you find um, in the current, I guess, environment, um, there are different types of NFTs that's taken off. So there are, you know, they call it digital rocks or pictures of, um, uh, uh, you know, NBA top shots, right? Mm -hmm. So so these are NBA stars. So often these NFTs take off um, partially because of, of the perceived scarcity of these NFTs. Often they're what, what we call sort of one of one or, or one of two, right? So there's only ever two versions that's the same. So there is this form of scarcity, 
but you know, is that scarcity enough to drive value? Um, you know, to to sort of in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions? I don't know. Right, and I suppose a blockchain would help to maintain the ownership and and the origination and the genuineness of the digital of NFTs. Would of that course. be correct to say? Yeah. Of course, and and, in, and that is also partly why um, you know NFTs has been quite easy to adopt for many, um, I guess, crypto native investors, traders, those who've been in, in the industry for a while, as well as you know creators, those who actually create the artwork. You know, in the traditional world, it's very hard for a you know a regular person to um, try and verify whether this piece of artwork is is it, is, it, is really by the, the, the painter or the artist. Um, how many copies have been made? Um, whereas in on the blockchain, it's fairly straightforward, right? It's the creator put essentially put their their stamp um, in, in, on the blockchain, puts their data on the blockchain, and and that tracking that data is always there. So every transaction that follows from that uh, is is can be verified on the blockchain. Right. Right, thanks for clarifying that for us. Now, with famous, famous names like Twitter's Jack Dorsey selling his first tweet as an NFT and even Tim Berners-Lee's source code for the internet selling as an NFT this year, some of the NFTs in the marketplace are claiming astronomical prices. And you touched on this a little bit about the value of NFTs. How can lay people and retail investors get involved or are they exclusively just for the wealthy? Um, it's you know there are very many open uh, platforms like OpenSea, Rarible, um, various you know different types of NFT marketplace, and OpenSea is probably the the most popular one. Um, that you know that has NFTs ranging from you know a very small amount of say 0 0.01 ETH um, to you know to a thousand ETH Ethereum, right? So it's anything from say you know twenty dollars to you know to millions of dollars. So, so really, it is available for for the regular retail um, investor to to the, the high net worth uh, to invest in, and and the way and the transaction time and the the process of closing a transaction, completing a transaction is fairly straightforward. So, it's definitely not just for um, not just for the wealthy, but the you know, the ones that do make um, the news are those that is selling at a very high price. Right. Thank you for shedding some light on that very elusive space. Now, cryptocurrency, blockchain and central bank digital currency seem to be sharing some technical aspects in operation and development. What are the major trends that you have noticed over the last three to four years and how have they impacted cryptocurrency and the evolution of blockchain? Um, so, you know, when I entered the space in early 2017, um, everything was very primitive. Um, you know, Bitcoin at the time had been around for, uh, you know, for s seven years. Um, what the, at the time, the sort of the, the narrative was around these infrastructure, you know, layer one protocols, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, other competitive um, or other competitor um uh, uh, infrastructure place, and over time, as that, as the, the industry has matured and as the infrastructure the, itself has matured, then we start to move what we call move up, um, higher up in the stack, in the tech stack, that um, uh, uh, moving more into I guess in the last sort of twenty four months, moving more into the decentralized finance applications, um, the digital collectible side. Um, there are other, you know, even content creation side. So that's more sort of, and the application layer, and that is a sign of the market maturing, um, you know, in the last three to four years. Right. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing that insight. And it's interesting how with the Ethereum smart contracts, uh, people can loan out. And there's a lending facility through that mm -hmm. modality, which would be interesting to see how that develops further and, and creates um, more money and liquidity in the economy. So we'll have to wind up the discussion now, Gemma. It would be great to talk to you for longer. I can see you've got a lot of insight yeah. and observations to share with us. But um, while the world seems to be heading towards a completely tokenized world, can you point to any regulatory risks as this technology proliferates and how can stable coins have the ability to disrupt the financial markets as we know them too, please. 
Well, stable coins is a very important uh, medium of, of, of transaction um, that's popularly used um, in the crypto markets. In fact, you know, often when people first enter the market, they, you know, they convert fiat dollars into into the equivalent of stable coins and then transact with that in the ecosystem. Now, stable coins at the moment, I think, is probably the, the, the total supply of market capitalization is around $100 billion. So it's getting to a stage where, of course, the regulators are getting concerned, uh, you know, looking at it. Um, now, I think, you know, some of the, the large stable coin uh, stable coins out there like USD, USDT and USDC, they regularly now um, uh, share audits of whether they are in, indeed backed by the equivalent um, uh, cash and cash equivalents uh, in, 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 the, in the fiat world. Um, so I think, you know, through these sort of regular audits and more transparency in sharing um, what is in fact backing these stable coins, that will provide markets and the regulators with more confidence um, that this important, I guess, mechanism, important pillar in the crypto space, um, you know, is, is not is not um, uh, uh, providing any systemic risk. Yes, and interesting to note with stablecoins as well that um, out of the many that have failed, they seem to be the ones that are backed by gold that seems to not be able to sustain. Um, so interesting to investigate into that further, I suppose, if we have time. But Gemma, just finally, can we talk about the security aspects of dealing in digital aspects? assets, sorry. When it comes mm -hmm. to technology, especially in finance space, cyber attacks are a big concern. And although some say that Bitcoin or the blockchain can't be hacked itself, what do you feel can be offered as a feasible solution to ensure due diligence on digital securities to make it a safer option for investors to look at? Sure. Now, from a, you know, a cyber security hacking perspective, um, often, you know, the, the, to be really uh, secure is definitely to keep your decrypto assets in your own wallet. So by that, by that you mean keeping in your own in your uh, digital wallet, where you know as an investor or as a holder you have access. You are the only person with access to, to the private keys because they they are sort of the you know in a way quote unquote the passwords to to your um, to your digital wallet. And if you lose that, then you can it's, it's very hard to it's almost impossible to recover these assets. Um, you know, in terms of, um, and, and that is much actually from a security perspective, it's safer to keep it there than to put on an exchange because in exchange, um, in theory, the exchange has has the, the, the private keys, right? And if the exchange gets hacked, um, the, the, the crypto assets, your crypto assets may be at risk. Now, in terms of digital securities, um, that, you know, has two, I guess, implications. One could be meaning the actual cyber security we discussed, or another meaning could be a um, sort of the actually regulated assets on the blockchain. Now that is where the regulators will come in um, and, and to provide the right amount of guidance for the investors when they choose to invest in digital securities. Okay, thank you so much for sharing your insights and making time for the show again. That's all we have time for today. We'll have to start winding up there. Was there any final comments you'd like to share before we close up the discussion? Um, no, it's been it's been great to, to come on here and, and, and share you know share my thoughts on, on the on the industry and you know as a as an active investor and, and observer of, of the, the sector um, you know I'm very very uh, optimistic about what the future can bring at, uh, in the crypto in the crypto space. Yes, thanks again for making time for us, Ms. Gemma Zhu, an avid investor and who has had experience in leading companies in blockchain and digital assets and you can if you've just joined us you can catch the full discussion via our youtube channel calkine media and please stay watching for more expert talks and live market commentaries and as we say stay apprised and invest wise
you're up for an adventure, there's hardly a better destination for it than right here in Australia and nearby New Zealand. Although interstate travel is still up in the air, as restrictions ease, no doubt you want to hit the road and explore the great outdoors. So here's our top adventure activities to stretch those post-lockdown muscles. First up, scuba diving, Ningalu Reef and the Great Barrier Reef. Fancy a swim with the whale sharks? Each year between April and July, you can witness a migration of whale sharks to Ningalu Reef. Don't worry though, because these sharks are docile and harmless and they only eat plankton, they're not aggressive. A more obvious underwater hotspot, the Great Barrier Reef is another thing scuba diving enthusiasts don't want to miss. It's the largest reef around the world. Over 2,300 kilometers hide the incredibly vivid creatures. Think dugongs, seals, mesmerizing tropical fish, dozens of different corals, sponges and starfish, even dolphins and whales. There are daily trips organized from Port Douglas and Cairns so the experts can show you the best spots. And if you want a real adrenaline rush, make sure to head to South Australia and hop in a cage to dive with the great white sharks. It's in Port Lincoln, which is one of the best places to visit in the state. Next up, golfing, beachfront in Sydney. Going on an active holiday is becoming more and more popular as people love devoting their vacation days to learning a new skill while having fun. You can sign up for golf courses in Sydney and enjoy the most breathtaking place to make a hole in one. The beachfront in Sydney is specifically designed as a giant golf court with a club and a cafe you can unwind in. And while you're in the city, don't miss out on climbing the Sydney Harbour Bridge for an amazing panoramic view and photo opportunities. A similar hard pumping experience can be found at Gold Coast Skypoint Climb, where you get the climb, highest 270 metres external building in the country. Next, bungee jumping, Queenstown in New Zealand. Queenstown is the perfect place for adrenaline junkies and it's a natural place to stop for those New Zealand road trips. There are several spots for a bungee jump, but Kawaru Bridge may be the best one. It's actually a place where bungee jumping was born. The surreal turquoise river beneath, amazing surrounding nature and scenery will make your 43 meter high jump worthwhile. Another great option to try is the world's biggest swing just above the Nevis River, where you'll experience a height of 300 meters. Enjoy a guided hike, jet boating or parasailing and consider visiting the Queenstown Adventure Group to explore other often activities. Cycling. Soak in Australia on two wheels. If you have the mindset of an independent traveller and you want to explore off the grid paths, cycling is the best way to do it. Australia has an awesome outback just waiting for you. And if you're wondering what area to explore, well it might be best to consider the weather conditions first. The northern area has a high humidity, both wet and dry seasons. The central part isn't suitable for cycling because it's the heart of the desert basically. But a moderate climate is typical for the southern part. Which is why Tasmania is a truly great place and it became a renowned area for cycling from Cradle Mountain to Bruni Island. There's a lot to see. Don't miss out on Freysenet National Park either, where you may get the opportunity to pat a few kangaroos. Explore other trails as well. There are many beautiful spots you can find on two wheels. And lastly, surfing. They don't call the Gold Coast a surfer's paradise for nothing. Exquisite beaches with the urban side back offer you a chance to enjoy amazing waves. Whether you choose to ride some waves at the Snapper Rocks Surfer Bank or Palm Beach, Nobby Beach or Broad Beach, you can have the opportunity to soak up the sun and raise your adrenaline levels. If you prefer a more natural surrounding, choose Noosa. You can also attend surfing lessons. The Gold Coast is packed with surfing schools and academies. Coaches usually work with a group of up to six people, but there's also an option for private lessons. Other great surfing spots include Victoria, New South Wales and Western Australia. So keep this in mind when you choose adventure hotspots for the coming season. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV.
Hello and welcome to The Hot Performers. I'm James Preston and today we're going to throw a light on three ASX listed growth stocks that look extremely promising for 2022. So let's start by breaking down what a growth stock is. A growth stock is a stock of a company that is known to deliver a substantial and sustainable positive cash flow moving forward. Revenues and earnings are expected to increase at a faster rate than the average company within the same industry. Growth stocks generally pay smaller dividends. The retained earnings are reinvested by the firm's earnings in capital projects. There are a few companies listed on the ASX that can offer good bets to investors looking for growth, especially with the backdrop of the pandemic. And one of those is Temple & Webster Group. The stock of online furniture and homewares retailer Temple & Webster Group has given a year-to-date return of nearly 16%. The company sees significant growth potential in the sector for itself in the next decade and it has been investing heavily in its offline and online businesses. This e-commerce player may have a lot of potential and it could be worth considering for the long term. COVID-19 has really dialed things up for the online retail sector and Temple & Webster is trying to take advantage of the increase in demand. In the full year results for the 12 months ending on the 30th of June, the company reported a record 85% rise in revenue. A bid of the company also surged by 141% and Temple & Webster Group reported a record 165% rise in net profit after tax. Another stock with great potential is Elmo Software. It's a business that offers cloud-based services for small businesses and mid-market organisations to manage people, processes, pay and expenses. It operates a software as a service model across Australia, New Zealand and also in the UK. The company has reported strong growth in the past few years, including the COVID-19 pandemic period. Elmo Software intermittently launches new modules for businesses to utilise on top of their existing services which in turn can increase the value to the customer and increase the revenue from that customer. It recently launched COVID Secure, which enables businesses to record, monitor and report on their employees' COVID vaccination and test status. Despite the growth and progress that Elmo Software is making, the ASX tech share has seen its share price fall by 32% since the start of the year. In the 2021 financial year, the annualised recurring revenue jumped by 52%, the stock has given a negative year-to-date return of nearly 29%, but going forward, the stock can be considered looking at its growth prospects moving forward. And lastly, PointsBet's holdings is another stock to take a look at. A corporate bookmaker, PointsBet has its headquarters located here in Australia, but operates globally, including in the US. Their Canadian division has recently entered into an agreement to become the exclusive sports betting partner of Curling Canada. PointsBet Canada is a 100% owned subsidiary of PointsBet Holdings. However, this is a non-price sensitive piece of news, unlikely to have a material impact on the PointsBet share price. More than 13 million viewers tune into Curling Canada's events every single season, and that ranks it among the highest rated sports programming in the country. The agreement includes complete category exclusivity covering the company's sports book and online casino for all Curling Canada event broadcasts. And taking a look at its financials, it ended the 2021 financial year on a high note. For the 12 months ending on the 30th of June, it reported a 228% increase in full-year turnover. The company expects to continue with the same momentum into 2022 due to the rising popularity of mobile sports betting, innovative products and its continued US expansion. Though the stock has given a negative year-to-date return of over 11%, it looks promising in 2022, with the sports world likely to be unimpacted and punters becoming more engaged as a result. Alright, well that's all for the Hot Performers. Hope you enjoyed this special edition on ASX growth stocks for 2022. Keep watching Kalkine TV for the latest live market updates. I'm James Preston, signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches 
to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge-watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no-buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. DeFi cryptos have made fortunes for investors this year and why. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcrane Media. Here are the top 10 most profitable DeFi cryptos of 2021. First up is Terra or Luna. The world of cryptocurrencies is notorious for extreme volatility and Terra's blockchain could be the answer. Here, stable coins, which are paid to an asset like the US dollar, drive payment systems. Terra's aim is to use the best of both worlds, FIID currencies and crypto tokens to deliver a quick remittance system. Number two is Uniswap. Uniswap provides decentralized trading services to crypto enthusiasts. DeFi tokens can be traded on its automated platform. The platform also helps in maintaining liquidity within the crypto market. Coming in at number three is Avalanche or AVAX, a competitor to Ethereum's dominance in the smart contract space. Avalanche boasts three blockchains to deliver distinct functions. Many projects were hitherto on Ethereum's blockchain have integrated with the blockchains of Avalanche. Next up is Tezos. Heard of hard forks? They are basically used to upgrade the infrastructure of some of the blockchains. In Tezos, it's claimed that upgrades can be carried out without a hard fork. Tezos blockchain requires users to stake their holding before they can undertake any governance. Number five is Phantom. Forget about proof of work or proof of stake consensus protocols used by most of the blockchains. In the world of Phantom's decentralized finance, a unique bespoke consensus underpins all transactions. Phantom claims to have reached the transaction speed of less than two seconds. Next up is Maker. Maker is a unique blockchain. It facilitates issuance of a separate stablecoin, 
die. MKR is the native token of Maker Protocol, which empowers holders to make changes to the platform's infrastructure. Built on Ethereum, Maker was one of the early entrants into the world of DeFi. Number seven is ThorChain. ThorChain allows crypto exchange on its blockchain-powered DeFi platform without users having to lose full custody. The DeFi platform is strange in the sense that it has no info about its founders. Number eight is Serum. Serum claims to be a decentralized exchange with a fully on-chain order book. This, it says, can help to improve the efficiency of crypto trading activities. Next is PancakeSwap. PancakeSwap uses Binance Smart Chain to provide crypto exchange services to its users. It allows these users to swap BEP20 tokens. The native token Cake is used to reward users of the platform. And last but not least, coming in at number 10 is Chainlink, which claims to facilitate off-chain data integration. Blockchains can use Chainlink's network to join forces with off-chain events and feeds. Smart contracts form the basis of the network. So to sum up, DeFi applications provide exchange services to crypto token holders. While doing this, they also create liquidity in the crypto market. DeFi platforms were the top news grabbers of the crypto space in 2021. And in the last quarter of the year, a few of those I mentioned may present good investment opportunities. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to boost your financial IQ. And if you like this info, please give us a like, share and a comment, and why not sub to our channel while you're at it. This has been Holland Shields for Kalkai Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Hey there, I'm James Preston and in this segment I'll take you through the concept of depreciation. But first, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest from Calkine. In accounting, depreciation refers to the cost allocation of both tangible and intangible assets in the accounting statements to periods in which the assets are used. In general, depreciation also refers to reducing the monetary value of assets over time due to their usage, wear and tear, or because they have become obsolete. Depreciation gives us a fair idea of how much of an asset's value has been used up. Moreover, depreciating assets enables companies to generate revenue from an asset while expensing a share of its cost every year when the asset is in use. If these assets are not taken into consideration, they can affect a company's profits. Usually, businesses depreciate long-term assets for accounting purposes and tax benefits. For instance, companies can get tax benefits for the expense of an asset. However, the Internal Revenue Service, or the IRS, has formulated rules regarding when the companies can take a tax deduction. The carrying value of an asset is the difference between its historical cost and the accumulated depreciation. The carrying value of an asset is maintained in a company's balance sheet. Do companies have different thresholds to determine when to depreciate an asset? In accounting, depreciation usually permits a firm to write off an asset's value over the useful life of an asset. Assets, for example, machinery and equipment, are costly. 
Rather than recognizing the total cost of the asset in a year, depreciation helps the company distribute that cost and earn revenue from it. Depreciation considers the decline in the carrying value of an asset over time. For tangible assets like inventory, equipment and machinery, carrying cost is original cost minus the accumulated depreciation. On the other hand, for intangible assets such as patents or intellectual property, carrying cost is the difference between the historical cost and the amortization expense. Thus the formula is original cost minus amortization expense. Nevertheless, an asset's salvage value is the carrying value of an asset after all depreciation is completed. Companies can have their threshold amount determining when to start depreciating tangible assets, also known as fixed assets. For instance, a medium-sized company can set a $900 threshold, exceeding which depreciates an asset. Whereas a larger company can set, for example, a $12,000 threshold, below which all purchases are expensed quickly. Why is depreciation considered a non-cash expense? Depreciation schedules are prepared by the IRS at regular intervals, enlisting details such as the number of years an asset can be depreciated depending on the class of assets. When an asset is purchased, companies can pay the entire cash outlay initially. However, the expense is spread out and is recorded gradually for financial reporting. This is because assets prove to be beneficial for a company for an extended period. For this reason, depreciation is regarded as a non-cash charge because it does not depict actual cash outflow. Depreciation helps a company in tax deduction because depreciation charge decreases a company's earnings. What is the depreciation rate? The depreciation rate is depicted as a percentage of the total amount that is depreciated every year. For instance, if a firm had $100,000 as total depreciation over the asset's useful life, the depreciation for the year was $16,000. The rate would be 16% each year. How do companies record depreciation? When a company buys an asset, it records it as a debit to increase an asset account, which later appears on the balance sheet, and a credit to reduce cash or increase accounts payable. These entries are reflected in a company's balance sheet. Again though, the entries do not affect the income statement of the company. Both revenues and expenses are mentioned on a company's income statement. After an accounting cycle, an accountant will record depreciation for all capitalised assets that are not entirely depreciated. The register entry for this depreciation comprises of a debit to depreciation expense and credit to accumulated depreciation. Thus, debit to depreciation expense flows via the income statement whereas credit to accumulated depreciation is mentioned on the balance sheet. So to sum it up, an asset's carrying value is the difference between its initial cost and the accumulated depreciation. In contrast, the salvage value is the carrying value that remains after all depreciation is complete. It depends on a company as to what it anticipates receiving in replacement for the asset whose life has ended. Thus, an asset's estimated salvage value is an essential component for calculating depreciation. Well, I hope you found this video informative and extremely insightful. And if you did, please consider subscribing to the channel. I'll catch you soon on CalKai. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, Join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calkine TV.
please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. You'll be notified of Calkine's latest videos. Today's trending topic covers is Safe Moon's game over and are the investors wary of alleged Ponzi schemes? Sage here for Calkine Media. And started in March this year, one cryptocurrency was pitched to the investors as a way of getting rich within no time. However, it seems that the cryptocurrency is failing to attract investors and it is only getting the attention of crypto enthusiasts on the internet. So, what exactly are we talking about here? We're talking about SafeMoon, a cryptocurrency whose name surfaced in the early trends in Canada, but its price was down by 5% at the time of writing. And as the name suggests, safe moon means a safe way to get to the moon. In terms of investment, it is believed that the cryptocurrency claims to make investors sky-high profits with little investments. And after an initial surge, the cryptocurrency failed to continue its upward momentum and faced a lot of criticism for not having a real use case and people dubbed it as a Ponzi scheme. What do you think? Is SafeMoon safe? For starters, SafeMoon is a relatively new cryptocurrency and it remains highly volatile. A blockchain based virtual currency, SafeMoon, is a decentralized finance or DeFi token and an alternative cryptocurrency or altcoin to Bitcoin. To understand the volatility of this digital currency, the all time high of SafeMoon is probably the best example. On April 20th, the cryptocurrency clocked an all-time high of US $0.0000139 per token, representing an increase of 20,000% from the launching price. And the next question that arises is, why SafeMoon is allegedly a Ponzi scheme? Critics of the SafeMoon project seem to be wary of it, as it is believed that this cryptocurrency was started to generate hype. And the SafeMoon crypto reportedly does not have any real use cases, and it is criticized for rewarding hodlers and punishing sellers. It is alleged that SafeMoon's policy of punishing the sellers discourages people from selling, and that way, it is avoiding day trading and fixed price volatility. SafeMoon charges a 10% fee on each sale and says that it will reward the long-term hodlers by distributing half of the fees charged from sellers among existing coin hodlers. And in addition, SafeMoon has a very high token supply of one quadrillion tokens. And before the launch, the developers had reportedly burnt 223 trillion tokens and they can indulge in manual burns. This means that developers can regularly burn tokens and reduce the supply, which could cause the price of the token to go up. The cryptocurrency market is highly volatile and it is important to study a particular virtual currency before investing your money. Thanks for joining us on the report. If you do like the information, please like, share, comment on the video below. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Have you invested in SafeMoon? How did it go? Please let us know. Also, subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, and we have a website. So for more information and regular updates, please check it out. It's calkinemedia.com. And I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, Join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calkine TV.
Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. This is Sage and welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Calkine TV. Today's guest is Ms. Melissa Hume, the founder of Career Guidance Now. And with the economic downturn caused by COVID-19, we've seen many people working in hospitality, arts and tourism even, having to retrain and find jobs that can be sustained during these trying times. In today's show, we'll learn more about Career Guidance Now, an online learning platform offering modules on CV structure, tips on how to succeed in job interviews, career building and more. And today's guest we bring you Miss Melissa Hume, founder of Career Guidance Now. Welcome to the show, Melissa. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. With your experience as an HR executive and author of Your HR Ally, Kickstart Your Human Resources Career book, we are keen to share your insights today. So, a hearty congratulations on winning the HR Excellence Awards of 2021, by the way. So, how has the human resources industry evolved in the past year? Even in the last 18 months since the pandemic uh, came about, it's been, there's been significant change for uh, HR professionals uh, in Australia. We've really had to become uh, wellbeing champions and really become creative around how we support employee wellbeing, uh, coming up with different programs which we may not have considered in the past. So it has been really uh, challenging and we've really had to focus on how to retain our, our key and, and our top uh, performers in an organization to make sure that you know they we are setting up businesses to rebound after the, pe the pandemic so it's been a real challenge absolutely I can imagine and the job seekers rate has decreased significantly since 18 months ago thank goodness I think the July data had it close to about 4.6 percent so you must be doing some incredible work then my next question to you is about the key elements that are driving the hiring industry in the present day. Um, I, I just suspect that some things are different. Um, your insights would be valuable about this sector. Which factors would you consider to be catalysts in your current industry? Yeah, look, it's, it's been, um, even the candidate uh, behavior has been very different since the pandemic. So people are a lot more reluctant to change uh, employers you know, um, before the pandemic, people would be seeking uh, promotion opportunities, even if that meant longer hours and more stress. Now people really um, valuing their mental health and being really hesitant to change employers. And, and they are looking for employers who are very, um, very explicit and um, explicit in the way that they support employees' mental health. Uh, and they're really valuing that before they're taking the leap of faith and considering uh, tendering their resignation and, and joining another uh, employer. And I think the introduction of uh, job seeker and the different government payments have really changed the way that uh, candidates are behaving. Um, you know, there's been positive impacts with that, but it's also been really challenging from say an employer's perspective, because for an employee to just maintain those regular payments last year, um, all they had to do was demonstrate that they were making job seeking efforts uh, to gain employment. So what we're seeing on the flip side is that people are organising face-to-face interviews and not necessarily showing up for those interviews just to guarantee those payments. So overall, there's been a lot of different um, different behaviours and different ways that um, people have been interacting in the job market. And it's also been very, uh, people have really had to start thinking about how they can make themselves stand out if they are looking for a job and it is a genuine job search. Exactly right. And I think it was an interesting question in the recent census survey that we had to answer if we were actively seeking jobs in the last week or if we had applied as well. So they really want to know what's going on out there. And the yeah, pandemic absolutely. surely took away employment from millions of people worldwide. And we're still struggling to get out of this noose, as you told us before, people are just reluctant to leave their jobs, get promotion because they're not sure what the government stimulus is going to put into effect. And like JobKeeper had to see you in 12 months in a position before you were eligible and things like that. So I'm sure that has um, a great impact on job seekers um, decisions at the moment in such circumstances how do you guide people to get into the job market again 
Well, it's all about thinking and even um, using similar techniques before the pandemic um, occurred was thinking about your marketing materials. And, and when I say marketing materials, I'm talking about your CV, uh, your cover letters, and how you go about uh, branding yourself professionally. Because the, the reality is, I mean, recruitment consultants and uh, hiring managers uh, have uh, limited time to screen and look through candidates, CVs. I think the average is uh, recruiters spend an average of six seconds looking at a CV. So you have six seconds to make a really great impression. So you need to think about how uh, your CV would land, um, making sure that it's um, it looks very professional and it's marketable. Uh, and then going another step is with the uh, change in the job market and the way things are going with um, industries being significantly impacted. Um, thinking about how you can go about upskilling yourself and making sure that you're not um, technically falling behind in the soft skills and the techni technical skills you would need in order to secure employment in the future. And then I guess the third option is to completely pivot, so to consider maybe a, a career change, um, particularly if your industry or the role that you're performing was deemed non-essential um, or the, the job market is quite tough for the profession that you're um, skilled at, so you might want to consider um, a different career or a different type of job job in the future. Sounds great. And there has been some government backing in regards to apprenticeships and encouraging people to take on apprentices, so that's good to see. Um, and in regards to your book, am I saying it correctly, HR Ally? Yes, your yes. HR Ally. Fantastic. So it's a recent book. It talks about the fundamentals of launching an HR career. And would you mind giving us the full title and your inspiration behind devising this book? Yes. Yeah, so Your HR Ally Kickstart Your Human Resources Career. I was really motivated to write this book because even when I was trying to start my career, there wasn't an Australian resource. Uh, available for people looking to get into the profession. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions around what HR people actually do. Uh, we don't just hire and fire people, there's a lot more to it. So I wanted to make sure that that information is available for um, HR students, HR graduates, or even um, people looking to pivot and change careers. So that's the reason I wrote the book. And I wanted to, it to be uh, very different to a uh, a textbook. I want it to be very practical and have real life examples around uh, what HR professionals do out there. Excellent. Now, you mentioned being a well being champion before for people to help them just guide this whole um, downturn that's going on, help them to work out what's going on within themselves and where they should be going in regards to their career journey. Now, that is a big role to play in someone's life. Um, how, how do you find people are reacting by buying your book or seeing your online modules? Do you think it's actually having the impact or your desired impact? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, and I've had this interaction even before my online modules became available. Um, people that utilize my books or the online material, um, it really helps them quite practical. The advice is uh, practical. Uh, feedback has been positive. Um, it really teaches them how to make sure that their online footprint is, is professional. They're building not just a uh, a personal brand, but also trying to network and build a um, a reputation which they can safeguard, but also launch so that they can not just set themselves up for the next role, but also make sure that the choices they're making um, are long term and would lead them to success. Exactly. So, I mean, there's so many tricks of the trade and, and things you can only learn from trying stuff out. Like, not all the best jobs are advertised. So, I guess being proactive is, is really important. So, um, Melissa, before we finish up, um, you also do some one on one coaching and mentoring, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about, about that and how people can get involved if they want to? Yeah, absolutely. So um, if people would like a one-on-one -on -one coaching session with myself, um, all they'd have to do is uh, look at my website, uh, www.melissahume.com. Um, and what I really do is sit down, work out what your career ambitions are and try and build a long-term trajectory for your career and how I can 
uh, best set you on that pathway for success, whether it's looking at um, getting you job ready, uh, practicing interview techniques, uh, redoing or revamping your CV, whatever it may be. Um, I provide that um, that face-to-face -face service to make sure it's tailored to you uh, and I can help you uh, be successful. Wonderful. Thank you so much for making time for Calkine TV today, Melissa. We do really appreciate your insights on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Excellent. Enjoy your day. And if you've just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion with Ms. Melissa Hume, the founder of Career Guidance Now. And the full recorded interview will be available on the YouTube channel, Calkine Media. So please keep watching Calkine TV for more of the latest market updates and expert talks. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. If you're up for an adventure, there's hardly a better destination for it than right here in Australia and nearby New Zealand. Although interstate travel is still up in the air, as restrictions ease, no doubt you want to hit the road and explore the great outdoors. So here's our top adventure activities to stretch those post-lockdown muscles. First up, scuba diving. Mingalu Reef and the Great Barrier Reef. Fancy a swim with the whale sharks? Each year between April and July, you can witness a migration of whale sharks to Ningalu Reef. Don't worry though, because these sharks are docile and harmless and they only eat plankton, they're not aggressive. A more obvious underwater hotspot, the Great Barrier Reef is another thing scuba diving enthusiasts don't want to miss. It's the largest reef around the world. Over 2,300 kilometers hide the incredibly vivid creatures. Think dugons, seals, mesmerizing tropical fish, dozens of different corals, sponges and starfish, even dolphins and whales. There are daily trips organized from Port Douglas and Cairns so the experts can show you the best spots. And if you want a real adrenaline rush, make sure to head to South Australia and hop in a cage to dive with the great white sharks. It's in Port Lincoln, which is one of the best places to visit in the state. Next up, golfing, beachfront in Sydney. Going on an active holiday is becoming more and more popular as people love devoting their vacation days to learning a new skill while having fun. You can sign up for golf courses in Sydney and enjoy the most breathtaking place to make a hole in one. The beachfront in Sydney is specifically designed as a giant golf court with a club and a cafe you can unwind in. And while you're in the city, don't miss out on climbing the Sydney Harbour Bridge for an amazing panoramic view and photo opportunities. A similar hard pumping experience can be found at Gold Coast Skypoint Climb, where you get the climb, highest 270 metres external building in the country. Next, bungee jumping, Queenstown in New Zealand. Queenstown is the perfect place for adrenaline junkies and it's a natural place to stop for those New Zealand road trips. There are several spots for a bungee jump, but Kawaru Bridge may be the best one. It's actually a place where bungee jumping was born. The surreal turquoise river beneath, amazing surrounding nature and scenery will make your 43 meter high jump worthwhile. Another great option to try is the world's biggest swing just above the Nevis River, where you'll experience a height of 300 meters. Enjoy a guided hike, jet boating or parasailing and consider visiting the Queenstown Adventure Group to explore other offered activities. Cycling. Soak in Australia on two wheels. If you have the mindset of an independent traveller and you want to explore off-the-grid paths, cycling is the best way to do it. Australia has an awesome outback just waiting for you. And if you're wondering what area to explore, well, it might be best to consider the weather conditions first. The northern area has a high humidity, both wet and dry seasons. The central part isn't suitable for cycling because it's the heart of the desert, basically. But a moderate climate is typical for the southern part. Which is why Tasmania is a truly great place and it became a renowned area for cycling from Cradle Mountain to Bruni Island. There's a lot to see. Don't miss out on Freysonet National Park either, where you may get the opportunity to pat a few kangaroos. Explore other trails as well. There are many beautiful spots you can find on two wheels. And lastly, surfing. They don't call the Gold Coast a surfer's paradise for nothing. 
exquisite beaches with the urban side back offer you a chance to enjoy amazing waves. Whether you choose to ride some waves at the Snapper Rocks, Serpa Bank or Palm Beach, Nobby Beach or Broad Beach, you can have the opportunity to soak up the sun and raise your adrenaline levels. If you prefer a more natural surrounding, choose Noosa. You can also attend surfing lessons. The Gold Coast is packed with surfing schools and academies. Coaches usually work with a group of up to six people, but there's also an option for private lessons. Other great surfing spots include Victoria, New South Wales and Western Australia. So keep this in mind when you choose adventure hotspots for the coming season. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. In an ever-increasing digital world reliant on major search engines and data centers, we're all too aware that little changes at the likes of Google can have major ramifications worldwide. Google Chrome's 2.6 billion users now need to be on high alert as the company has confirmed multiple new high-level hacks. Recently, the tech major rolled out a security update urging Chrome users to update their browsers to the latest version to help stave off cybersecurity attacks. Google confirmed four high-level threats last weekend, coming just days after Chrome's 12th and 13th zero-day exploits of the year. These zero-day exploits impact macOS, Linux, and also Windows users. So what is the new threat? In its blog, Google confirmed that an exploit of CVE 20213793 exists in the wild. In layman's terms, that's a flaw that is more dangerous than regular security loopholes. Previously, Google warned users against a zero-day exploit called CVE 20213563, and now another dangerous threat has appeared. As a result, Google is currently restricting information about these hacks to purchase time for Chrome users to upgrade. Some of the issues include a heap buffer overflow in Blink, a heap buffer overflow in WebRTC, and inappropriate implementation in the sandbox. Essentially, it's all bad news. Many of the attacks are use after free or UAF exploits. Hackers have launched more than 10 UAF attacks in September and have already exploited a zero day UAF floor this month ahead of the latest discovery. So what are the lessons that we can learn from these hacks? In the wake of Google's warning last week, the company has provided some tips for users that can be taken as lessons. According to the manual, users can navigate to settings, click help, then about Google Chrome and check the Google Chrome version that they're operating with. Google versions of 94.0.4606.61 or more are considered safer. Users who don't have this version can wait or else they can turn off their machine. When the users have updated their browsers to the latest version, they need to perform the crucial final step and that is to restart Chrome. Tech experts have also provided a series of helpful hints to protect your data and privacy. Firstly, users are advised to use a stable channel update which is provided by Google to vulnerable systems immediately after appropriate testing. Secondly, you should also run all the software as a non-privileged user or one without administrative privileges to diminish the after effects of an attack. Thirdly, don't visit any untrusted websites while surfing on the internet, which is a pretty basic rule. Fourthly, 
users must not follow links which are provided by untrusted or unknown sources. The fifth tip is that users need to be very careful as there are some major possible threats attached to the hypertext links contained in the emails or attachments that they might receive. Sixth, one should apply the principle of least privilege to all the systems and services. Seventh, users should update their browsers to the latest version. Eighth, it's very important for Chrome users to follow the latest necessary guidelines to avoid any potential risk. Ninth, proper security fixes should be ensured when it's recommended. And lastly, number 10, users should keep checking for their update until it's available on their browser and they must follow the necessary security fix before installing the update and restarting Chrome. If you follow all of these tips, you're likely to remain safe and hack free. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkai. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkaimedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkai. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Steve Promnitz, Managing Director of Lake Resources. Now Lake Resources is a clean lithium developer utilizing direct extraction technology for the development of sustainable high purity lithium from its flagship Carchi project as well as three other lithium brine projects in Argentina. Here at Calkine we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Welcome to you, Steve. It's great to be here. Thank you, Rachel. Good to speak with you today. Now, recently, Lake secured the interest of a leading export credit agency to provide financial support for Karchi. How does export credit agency financing operate? And how does it propel your clean energy project? Uh, th thank you, Rachel. So Lake Resources, as you said, is about producing lithium from a brine, but doing that in a more environmentally friendly way and producing a high purity product. So to develop our project, and we're aiming to be having a financial close this time next year and in production in 2024, to do that, we naturally need project finance. Unfortunately, with lithium, because it's not actively traded on the uh, London Metal Exchange, it's not that easy to actually get the sort of debt finance we're after. So we went down the path of doing a uh, talking to export credit agencies. How they operate is that they will export uh, equipment, uh, supplies, technologies from a particular jurisdiction, and as part of that, they will then provide low-cost loans, uh, a little more than government debt, but uh, at low cost and long term, so that they can be involved in the project. Export credit agencies around the world want to be involved now in this whole energy transition. We were really fortunate that they have provided uh, a, an indicative offer up to 70% of the total finance we need at a long tenor, we're talking eight and a half years, at uh, substantially lower cost than traditional finance. So it basically drives the whole project forward. It shows to investors this is happening. And what we're doing with these ESG outcomes is meaningful, tangible, and the sorts of things that the market is looking for. That sounds fantastic. Now, you mentioned there that this will bring lower cost loans or lower cost of capital. What does that look like? And why do you think they were attracted to your project? Okay, so a, a, a traditional uh, developer in, uh, in natural resources, energy, would be looking at perhaps uh, getting interest at, say, 15%, plus plus, uh, and that might only be for three or five years. This sort of loans could be 3%, maybe up to 5% or blended, uh, but over eight to 10 years, and so that's pretty compelling. And the reason they want to do it, as I said, they want to be involved in this energy transition. We're able to do that, like other lithium developers, but we're able to do it with a consistent high quality product that gets a big margin, and at the same time, doing that in a more environmentally friendly way. Low carbon footprint, low water usage, low land impact, and a much better social outcome 
for the communities in these areas. So it's a, it's a great vote of confidence on both the quality of the project and the fact where we're going. Absolutely. And how soon do you plan to execute the production and the expansion of Karchi? Uh, so we're currently working on what's known as a definitive feasibility study and an environmental social impact assessment. That should be ready uh, end of first quarter next year. Uh, and then we'll finalise uh, the financing and uh, be ready for financial close around middle of next year, move into construction, aiming for production uh, first half of 2024. That's at 25,000 tonnes per annum. However, the demand is so strong, there's a squeeze going on the market, there's more electric vehicles announced every week, there's more uh, battery plants, there hasn't been that much new uh, lithium production announced. So we're going to be part of that, moving to 25,000 tonnes per annum, but the demand has been strong, the project finance is there, so we're moving to an expansion case of 50,000 tonnes per annum. Now 50,000 tonnes per annum of a high purity product with an ESG benefit, that'll be quite unique in the world and will become one of the top four producers. Pretty, pretty uh, impressive. That's extremely impressive, Steve. Now, could you shed some light on the technical and commercial attractiveness of the Karchi project and some of the results from the studies? Uh, so the, the pre-feasibility study, which we refreshed at the start of this year, shows 25,000 tonnes per annum. That's about 8% of the current market. And that would deliver a 260 million US annually EBITDA line or operating cash flow. With that debt financing, we're probably looking at free cash flow somewhere getting close to 200 million a year after the first 12 months. Now that's pretty remarkable for what is basically an industrial product. And remember, we don't do any mining here. All we do is just process water, uh, take the lithium out and return that water back to its source, which is why it has this ESG benefit. Um, and so our operating cash flow is about half of our total capex, uh, quite remarkable. Then if we look at an expanded case, um, we haven't released those numbers yet, but um, if I could just simply say that they're pretty compelling, our operating costs would come down even further. They're down in the bottom quartile at the moment, they could get even lower. Um, and it's that financial robustness together with those ESG outcomes that make this project uh, quite, uh, quite compelling, both from a financial perspective and also from an electric vehicle maker and a partnering perspective. They want to see those ESG benefits. And we touched on it earlier, but how is Kochi contributing to the UN Sustainable Development Goals? And do you see any competitive advantage through its environmental, social and governance practices? So from a, from a pricing perspective on the product, what we're doing, uh, so far that's not flowing through. But we do sort of get picked out in a beauty parade um, because these UN SDG goals, um, they're our targets and we're going to, to meet those and probably go further. We're certainly going to meet uh, the equator principles for this project, but we look to go even further because what we can bring to this whole lithium supply versus other lithium brine producers is order of magnitude uh, improvements in reduced water, um, lower CO2 footprint, reduced land in, in impact. And uh, we'll look at then uh, greenhouse gases where, where uh, because we're going to be using a solar PV farm, we've then got predominantly renewable energy. Um, we'll have more to say about that over the, the coming six months because we're finalising a sustainability study as well as details so that we can provide both for the project finances as part of their due diligence and then ESG investors that uh, no, we're not a mining company. Yes, we are in the battery material supply chain, but this is um, a truly uh, a, a genuine ESG project. It's not just some greenwashing. Great, and Karshi has a large indicated and inferred resource. Can you shed some more light on the work that is underway at present and what you expect from that? Uh, so in 2018, we defined a large resource. Um, to give you an idea of that large resource, we only used 20% uh, out of 25 years of production. With this expansion case, we have drill rigs back on site just to um, upgrade some of that so that we can put it into the reserve category and, uh, and we'll probably expand it at the same time. Um, but one of the great things about lithium, uh, direct lithium extraction is because you're being more efficient, because you're taking all the lithium out virtually, uh, you actually don't even need a large resource. 
the great thing is this resource we can expand it laterally uh, at depth we basically own the entire uh, basin under under leases so uh, that's also pretty unique and with the lithium supply shortfall anticipated from 2022 and the electric vehicle revolution picking up speed, um, how do you see Lake making a mark in the industry in the future and what plans do you have for expansion? Well, you'd almost have to be living under a rock not to see every week uh, more uh, electric vehicles from various different automakers, uh, more battery plants being announced. Um, we saw this calendar year with the Biden administration a very strong driver to, uh, to see more electric vehicles and that energy transition in the US. We've seen that now last year with the European Union as they put incentives towards it. What we deliver is basically a better quality product that's, uh, that, that is very high quality. Battery makers need that to avoid performance issues. We can scale up and not many new producers actually have that flexibility to actually scale up and be quite meaningful both now and in the future and then last of all having low carbon footprint low water footprint uh, low land footprint uh, better social outcomes these are the sorts of things that consumers of electric vehicle makers and therefore electric vehicle makers want to be able to deliver we're not going to just repeat what happened with fossil fuels we're going to do it better this time around that's why our share price has improved a lot. And that's why all of the companies that are involved in direct lithium extraction have improved substantially. So watch this space. There's a lot of news over the next 12 months. We've got a lot to do. Um, thankfully, we've got a great team on the ground. And uh, uh, I think the market will be impressed uh, with all the various parties that we're working with. Uh, UK export uh, finance was, uh, was an example of the sort of quality partnerships that we're developing. Thank you. That's fabulous. It's an absolute, very fast moving space to be in and very an, in, an interesting one to keep our eyes on. Thank you so much for your time today, Steve. No, thank you, Rachel. It's always a pleasure. Cheers for now. Thank you very much. And with that, I will sign off for today, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Good late afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Holly and you're watching Calkine TV live from Sydney. This is the last show of the day at the last trade and there's no better way to wind down the day than with today's market close commentary. Aussie shares closed the week on a positive note thanks to strong buying in tech, mining and travel stocks. The market sentiment was boosted by firm global queues as well as an ease in travel restrictions for international travellers. Shares of travel stocks rallied after New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet announced this morning that the state will open its international borders to Aussies and overseas citizens from the 1st of November with certain conditions. In the travel space, the biggest gainers were Flight Centre, Webjet and Qantas. And meanwhile, the benchmark index ASX 200 settled 50.30 points or 0.69 percent higher. Early today, the index opened in green and gained as much as 0.84% as it finished the week with a 0.6% gain led by a sustained rally in mining, tech, realty, consumer staples and healthcare stocks. 
On the sectoral front, all of the indices barring utilities ended in the positive terrain. The material sector emerged as the best performer with a 1.37 percent gain owing to a rise in iron ore prices. The material sector was followed by tech, which surged 1.35 percent, tracking overnight gains in its U.S. counterpart, Nasdaq. Among others, consumer discretionary, financials and industrials settled with modest gains, while a reads energy, telecom and healthcare ended marginally lower. Bucking the trend, though, utility sector witnessed a surge in selling and ended 0.74 percent lower. Let's have a look now at the top gainers and losers. While the best performer on the ASX pack was automobile and components manufacturer ARB Corp, which ended 5.7 percent higher. Some of the other notable gainers include investment platform Hub24, Minor Oz Minerals, and gambling company Star Entertainment, plus the infection prevention company Nanosonics. On the flip side, though, the diversified financial group Pendle emerged as the worst performer with a shocking 11.25% slide. Some of the other notable losers include food and beverage and tobacco business Elders, asset management business Plat Platinum, sorry, and Aussie winemaker Treasury Wine Estates and realtor retailer sorry, Harvey Norman Holdings. Let's shift our lens now to the stocks that grabbed investor attention. And shares of Australia's largest iron ore miner, Rio Tinto, declined as much as 1.4% during the day's trade. The stock slipped into red after its cut full year target for shipments of the steel making raw materials from WA. The company said in an exchange filing that it now expects Pilbara shipments of iron ore to be in the range of 230 to 230. 25 million tons in the 12 months to December 31. That is lower than the previous target of up to 340 million tons. The drop in shipment target was attributed to a delay in the completion of the new greenfield mine at the Good Eye Diary and the Robe Valley Brownfield Mine replacement project due to tight labour markets in Western Australia. Meanwhile, shares of BHP soared as much as 2.6% after its shareholders endorsed the company's climate transition strategy. Details from BHP's annual general meeting in London revealed that 83 percent of shareholders supported the climate change plan. Aussie shareholders, meanwhile, are slated to vote on the same topic coming November 11th. All this is the company plans to reduce operational greenhouse gas emissions by 30 percent by the year 2030 and touch net zero emissions by 2050. Now it's time for a short break, but stay tuned because I'll be right back with more trending market updates. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Welcome back to the Market Close Commentary. Let's have a look now at some more stocks that grabbed investor attention today. Well, shares of Qantas Airways have climbed 4.3% during the session. The stock price surged after the carrier announced a plan to sell surplus land in South City's mascot for $802 million. Australia's largest airline by fleet size has inked a pack with the consortium led by Logos Property Group for the sale of 13.8 hectares of land in mascot. The fund proceeds will be used to reduce debts and accelerate the airline's recovery. The company aims to reach net debt target range by the end of financial year 22 as the transaction remains subject to some conditions, while the settlement of the vast majority of the lots is expected in the first half of this financial year. And shares of investment banking giant Macquarie Group gained over 3% to hit a 52-week high after a brokerage hiked its price target. The share price of the company rose as much as 3.4% to 189.22 Australian. 
The global brokerage firm Morgan Stanley has raised its price target of Macquarie Group by 37 percent to $240, saying that the, leader, that the lender deserved a green premium. The company's shares have gained 5.25 percent in the last one month and 18.7 percent over a six-month period. And meanwhile, shares of global investment business Pendle Group declined as much as 12 percent in an otherwise positive broader market. Shares of the company fell after they reported a spurt in funds under management during the September quarter. Pendle's FUM jumped 30.5 percent to 139.2 billion and from 106.7 in the June quarter. The Aussie business saw a record quarter of flows throughout the higher margin wholesale channel, with strong net inflows in the Australian large cap, sustainable multi-asset and fixed income funds. The company said that the acquisition of Thomson, Siegel and Worsley helped it to raise its FUM. And shares of biotech firm Demirix climbed over 3% after it signed a pack with NHMRC Clinical Trial Center at the University of Sydney. The deal has been signed to expand Clarity 2.0 clinical study sites in Australia, testing of the Demirix developed drug candidate DMX200 in the COVID-19 patients with respiratory complications. Once regulatory and ethics approval is received, an initial six sites will begin recruitment for the Phase 3 study across New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. The share price of beverage company Digital Wine Ventures tumbled over 6% as the company has signed a binding term sheet to acquire 100% of the Caddy Australia Limited, one of the country's leading B2B beverage marketplaces. Shares of the Australian conglomerate West Farmers traded a tad higher after it announced to issue its first euro sustainably linked bond. The company stated that it'll issue the euro dominated sustainability linked bond in the European debt capital markets with its interest rate payable on the bond linked to the progress against specific renewable electricity and emissions performance targets. Now for a look east towards the Asian market performance, and shares in the Asian Pacific region traded mostly higher today following overnight gains in Wall Street. The market sentiment was dented by robust corporate earnings, overlook of overseas firms as well. However, persistent concerns about the Chinese economy growth caps market gains. And India's BSC Sensex closed on account of Desera Festival celebrations. Plus, Japan's Nikkei, Japan's Nikkei traded at 1.5% higher today and it stated to post its first weekly gains after three straight weeks of losses. Meanwhile, Taiwan's weighted index was the best performer in the region with a 2.3% gain. South Korea's KOSPI rose 0.9% and Hong Kong's Hang Seng traded 0.8% higher. Among the other Asian markets, the Straits Times in Singapore rose 0.35%, while Thailand's SET Composite gained 0.25%. China's Shanghai Composite also traded 0.3% higher at the time of reporting. Bucking the trend, though, Indonesia's Jakarta Composite was down 0.6%, and Taiwan's weighted index traded marginally lower. Meanwhile, Wall Street closed higher on Thursday as investors cheered strong earnings report by the likes of Bank of America and United Health. The market sentiment was also lifted by President Joe Biden, who signed into law a bill raising the U.S.'s debt limit until early December. All this as the Dow Jones gained 1.4 percent, the S&P 500 surged 1.6 percent, and the Nasdaq Composite settled a similar 1.65 percent higher. Now, just before we wrap up, let's have a quick look at the crypto market performance. And the major cryptocurrencies traded cautiously higher during the Asian trading hour today. The crypto total market cap was up nearly 2% at 2.43 trillion US dollars. The market showed signs of exhaustion after a recent rally as investors remained worried about rising inflation. The minutes from the Fed Reserve's September meeting revealed that policymakers are worried that inflation pressure may prompt the central bank to roll back economic stimulus sooner than expected. 
The price of Bitcoin, the world's largest crypto by market cap, was up over 2%. The most popular crypto had gained over 10% in the last seven days. And next to Ether, the world's second largest crypto, which was trading higher by over 5%. The coin linked to Ethereum blockchain has surged 7% in the past one week. And meanwhile, the price of Cardano, the third largest crypto by market cap, rose marginally by 0.2%. And Dogecoin price fell over 1%. Other virtual currencies like Binance Coin, Litecoin, Tether, Shiba Inu, XRP, Stellar Salon and Uniswap were all trading on a mixed note. And that is a wrap today, but I hope you have a great weekend. And we'll be back on Monday live from Sydney at 9.30 a.m. in the morning with our first report on the pre-market scene. Take care and stay safe. Hi there, James Preston for Cowkind TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Now, do you want to buy Australian stock exchange listed exchange traded funds with big dividend yields? Well, here's our top three to buy. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and you're watching Calkine Media. ETFs or exchange traded funds include a basket of securities that trade on exchange. Its features are similar to mutual funds. ETFs listed on the ASX offer exposure to various markets and assets. These include overseas share markets, fixed income, foreign currencies and commodities. Let's take a look at three ETFs offering high dividend yields. iShares S&P 500 Australian Dollar Hedged ETF aims to provide investors with the market performance before fees and expenses. The fund invests in companies listed in the US and Canada. Around 75% of the securities in this fund are from these regions. The fund has a net asset of $597 million. 99.53% of the securities within the fund are stocks and the remaining 0.79% are in cash. The fund includes 513 companies and has geographic exposure in regions such as China, Singapore, Switzerland, the United Kingdom and the US. In financial year 2021, the fund provided a final dividend of $91.98 per unit on the 13th of July. It has an annual dividend yield of 21.3%. And on the 12th of October, IHVV units were trading at $425.49. That's down 4% on the previous close. Vanguard MSCI Index International Shares ETF tracks the MSCI World X Australia return with net dividends reinvested hedged into Australian dollars index before considering fees, expenses and tax. The fund has a net asset of $1.76 billion. This ETF has exposure to several global businesses listed on the exchange of major developed economies. These include Canada, Denmark, France, Germany, Japan, the Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland, Britain and the US. It offers low cost access to a widely diversified range of securities that let investors participate in the growth potential of international firms listed outside of Australia. The fund is hedged to Australian dollars so that the returns of the ETFs stay unaffected in case of currency fluctuations. In financial year 2021, the ETF has provided a final dividend of $6.50 per unit on the 16th of July. 
It has an annual dividend yield of 11.03%. And on the 12th of October, the units were trading at $85.82. That's down 0.72% from the previous close. Now, Vanguard International Fixed Interest Index Hedged ETF monitors the return of the Bloomberg Global Treasury Scaled Index hedged into Australian dollars prior to considering account fees, expenses and tax. It provides low-cost exposure to premium income generating securities issued by governments worldwide. The fund invests in fixed income securities with credit rating between BBB- to AAA. These ratings are decided by S&P or some equivalent agency. Its geographic exposure comprises of countries like Belgium, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, South Korea, Spain, the UK and the US. The fund has a net asset of $516 million and includes 1,099 companies. The fund has an annual dividend yield of 9.41% and on the 12th of October their units were trading at $43.93, trading flat as compared to the previous close. So there are some ASX listed exchange traded funds with big dividend yields. If you like this video, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon for notifications for our latest videos. This is Rachel signing off for Kalkai Media.